Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all doing well. Today, it is time for a uh, King of the Hill. So winner stays on, and the individual who is able to get the most King of the Hill victories at the end of the stream is crowned the winner, uh, which is fun casual practice. And of course, we are going to be doing the random spin the wheel. So for every single player playing today, we're going to be spinning ye old wheel and seeing which faction they get. So should be fun. I know Ogres were kind of the meme last season, but they're actually doing a little bit better. You know, I played in a tournament yesterday on Super Ties, and I got to the top four. And on my way to the top four, uh, I played two Ogre Kingdoms opponents, and the games are very close. With their new capture weight, they definitely do a lot better. So anybody is welcome to join. It's just first come, first serve. And we are using the Total Tavern Tournament Map Pack. So if you want to play, you're going to need to have that installed. And that's the only mod you'll want to have installed is the Total Tavern Tournament Map Pack. And then you could just join the lobby. You should be good to go from there. What is that? Stream Elements? Well, I don't remember. I have Stream Elements set up, but hey, look at that. All right, guys. One second here. And there we go. Perfect. All set. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Turin was hoping you'd be playing in this so I could hop in and get a rematch after last night. No, no worries. We'll, we'll play again soon. We always we always tend to run into each other in these uh, in these tournaments. So I'm resting the hand today, taking it a little bit easy. So, so yeah, should be good. What's up, everyone? How you doing? So we got one person in here. We have the dreaded fly pepper. I don't know who that is. It's it it would appear to be a a, a pepper, like a, like a container of pepper with fly wings on it, which is quite a creative uh, name for sure. I really feel like uh, you guys can see the screen, right? You guys, you guys can see everything's visible, no drama. This it was giving me a little bit of grief before the stream started, being like, "Hey, man." So let me know. Let me know if that worked out. Yeah, I see Raphael. Maybe you just got to refresh your uh, your stream, bud. Could be uh, could be the problem here. All right, sounds good. I'm glad we could see it. Yeah, great. Glad to hear it looks good. All right, so just waiting for one more person to join, and then we'll decide on the uh, factions we want to roll. There's. I don't think there's a code. I think it's just one, two. It, it might just be one. Did I put a password on this lobby? If so, it's one, two, three. But I don't think there is There is a code. Yeah, so you need to have the Total Tavern Tournament Map Pack installed. If you don't have that installed, then you're not going to be able to join. Um, I can also just get the code and put it in Discord. So um, let me just do this. You can see just fine. Great. Okay. Yeah, there's no password. There's no password. So I just uh, code for anyone who wants to join. All right, so I just put the code in Discord, so if you're in there, um, it's in the community section where I announce the stream. Should be able to get it there, and then you can join up. Time to do a kitchen remodel. Oh, man, that sounds pretty serious. Is it like heavy-duty stuff? You doing like all the grout and, you know, doing tile work, or is it kind of just like a low-key, a little bit of carpentry, doing some of the cabinets? Let me know. Uh, so to get the map pack, you just go to Steam. You go to the Steam Workshop, and you, uh, you fire it up there. You go, to, you go to launch the game, and then there's like a little tab called the Workshop, and then you could just search Total Tavern, and it'll come up. You'll see it. It has my uh, channel logo in the center of it, and um, you can download it from there. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. we got a lot of fun new maps to play, so this will be a cool opportunity to play some maps that we maybe haven't gotten a chance to see. Do you think the High Elves are competitive? Yeah, they're pretty good. Hey, we got Medley in here versus the dreaded Fly Pepper. Okay. So this is going to be our first match of the day. So we are now going to switch on over and do the random faction generation for these mighty champions. So this is going to be for fly, and I've I've removed the bugged factions and just like the straight up broken factions like Slanesh and Warriors because we want people to have fun today. Um, not not get like Slanesh versus like some low tier faction. That's just going to feel bad. All right. So here we go. Let's have some fun. So we're going to be rolling it, seeing what they get. This is going to be for the Fly Pepper. I don't know if they're in Discord or anything like that, but we'll find out. And it will be Kislev versus, and this is going to be for Medley. Unleashed Greasis, that would be a lot of fun. So we got Kislev versus someone here. We'll have to see what we roll up here next. And ye old Wheel of Fortune. Oh, okay, Kislev versus Greenskins is actually a fun matchup. I'm down, to, I'm down for that one. That one seems reasonably fair as well. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. All right. One sec here. Let's find it out. And I don't know if Fly Pepper is here. Fly Pepper. Hopefully, hopefully this is someone who's like following the stream. Okay, perfect. So Medley, you have a, uh, you have uh, you have the second faction we rolled. So you have the green skins. <laughs> it's a good way to like learn. Let's do the let's do the crucible for this one. We're gonna do the old Cornate Royal Rumble. 
Yeah, it's open to anyone. Anyone can join. All you have to do is download the Total Tavern Tournament Map Pack, and then you can uh, you can join the lobby. All right, outstanding. Looks fun, and let's see what's going to be going down. Fly Pepper is on the stream, at a boy. And we got Kiss Liver Screen Skids. Very fun matchup. We're going to be doing it on the Crucible. Recommend faction for a brand new player who's never played Total War. Corn is pretty straightforward because a lot of your units just trade effectively, especially the Warriors. And uh, you can just back them up with Flesh Hounds and, uh, you know, a pretty powerful Combat Lord. Don't have to worry about magic too much. It depends. Yeah, Corn is good. Really simplistic. Norska is very simplistic too. You just basically get Marauders or Marauder Champions, Berserk or basic Marauders, like any combination of infantry based on what you're fighting. And then you just bring like a Veil Fiend caster and one of their two lore choices. Very simple to play. Norska is just is very, very caveman style. Uh, and once you get a little bit more advanced, you can throw some Marauder Horsemen in there and really start to abuse those because they're really good even after the nerfs. Really, really good. So players will pick their armies. Expect to see some wild shit today. This is like, you know, obviously this isn't a tournament, so there's not like high stakes. It's more of a practice stream where we get to see weird matchups you normally wouldn't see. And maybe we see some of the new ROR's. Um, did I see Pepper's question above? All right, let's see here. I'm scrolling up. Do I have to use? Do I also have to use the Lord? It says no, no, you don't, Pepper. You don't. Oh, hey, you're in chat. No, no, no. You can use any Lord you want. Don't worry about the Lord. It selects. Yeah. Don't worry about it at all. My friend told me this game is. Uh... Yeah, no, dude. This game is is nowhere near near dead. Total War Warhammer has a massive player base and. Uh, Multiplayer community, even though it's a little bit smaller, is still very active, and we have like constant events and people playing and everything. You've been in chat the whole time, yeah. But your name and here is Fly Pepper, and then in chat your Pepper. My my potato brain didn't put those two things together right away, but but now I know, brother. Now I know. So you don't know any Lord you want. You don't have to play the Lord. It tells you just the faction. Bring the glory, dude. Uh, I I really hope. Hang on a sec. I'm gonna take a peek. Okay, okay, interesting, interesting. I'm digging the build so far. Remember, this map has some... Um, so Pepper and Medley, uh, I'm sure Medley knows this map, but Pepper, I don't know if you've played on the Crucible, but it's a map that um, has some weird like hills and line of sight. It, it is small, and you know, but keep in mind that like direct fire artillery might be problematic here. I mean, it might work, but it depends on how you position it. May says, I just recently got into Total War in your videos as well, and your streams are amazing. Hey, I'm glad to hear it. Your commentary is entertaining. Hey, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yeah, average this month is 30,000 players, top 30 game on Steam. Yeah, no, that sounds about right. It's the 28th most played game on Steam at the moment. Uh, and that's pretty serious, considering it's like an, a kind of a niche genre. And it has that those kind of numbers is, is really, really serious. Yeah. Played one and two, been craving an RTS, downloading it right now. Yeah, get in there. And, you know, um, here's, here's what you want to do. If you want to get involved in multiplayer, you can obviously just queue up and play. But if you want to kind of take it to the next level and get some, you know, training partners or uh, play in events, uh, you can go to uh, TotalTavern.com, which is the Total War Warhammer multiplayer website. You can see the leaderboard of all the top players in the world and all whatnot. Um, but up at the top, there's a Discord link. It'll take you to my Discord and you can get involved in events there and you'll get notifications for everything. You just need to give yourself the Total War role once you get to the Discord. And uh, yeah, you can join upcoming events like uh, tomorrow or in two days. We have uh, Loremaster of Sotek has a tournament. On um, Sunday, Platypus is hosting. Let's see what day that is. So, no, actually on the same day. So on Saturday, um, Platypus is hosting a beginner tournament. So if you're like new and you want to get some competitive games in versus good opponents who are going to be friendly and recipro reciprocal and like sharing knowledge and all that, um, there's going to be a beginner tournament hosted by Platypus. So you just go here. You log in with your Discord on the website. Pretty straightforward. And then you can sign up for the tournament. That's it. And uh, yeah, then it puts you in and you just need to be there an hour before to check in. You click check in and... It'll give you an opponent and, you know, just read everything about where it's going to be hosted, like who you need to talk to and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a great way to get in there. It's a great way. All right. So I'm going to ready up here as the players uh, finalize their builds. Guy says, hey, Turin, sorry, I know this has already been asked. Uh, where do I download the map pack? Sir, sure. Let me, let me show you real quick. So let me get this, uh, go to that and outstanding here. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So, um, basically all you need to do, let me just pull this up here. All right, is uh, let me share my screen real quick. So to get the map pack, you just hit, um, let me let me make sure I ready up the game for the players so they don't sit there waiting for me. Okay, they're going, great. 
Yeah, I'll show you after this game because um, this one's already loading in. So we're gonna we're gonna focus on this one. But you basically just go to Steam and you go to Total War Warhammer Three, and then there's like a little navigation bar like underneath the play button, and there's Workshop there. You go to Workshop and you find the map pack by searching Total Tavern, and uh, you just click subscribe. And then, then when you launch your game, use the mod manager to do that. Oh, guys, he's bringing the ROR Elemental Bear. Oh, baby. Yeah, Fal, host an event tomorrow. Yeah, if you got time, would love it. The joys of substitute teaching. Everything's always in flux. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I had a couple of friends from high school who became teachers and substitutes. And yeah, it's going to be great. And even if you are new, you can tune, you can play in higher level tournaments. And, the, you know, the odds are you'll, you won't play a Terminator round one. It can happen, but, um, you know. Yeah, get in there. Lose some games. It's 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 all part it's all part of the fun. All right, so this match is going to be uh, Pepper versus Medley. Let's get this up. Medley and I had uh, one of the closest tournament games I think I've ever had last night when I played in Subitize tournament. It was in the round of eight, and um, Medley was playing Cathay. Medley is a very very good Cathay player. And I was playing Bretonia, and it was just like the most nail-biting game ever. It was such a ferocious one. Yeah, it's going to be fun, though. Thank you guys for tuning in. should be fun. Why should you bring Azag and not Wurzag? So, Wurzag is really good for buffing your whole army. Um, but Azag also brings something else to the table. And just because something is meta doesn't mean it's always the best. You know, the cool thing about Total War is many of the factions have very diverse tactics. Like, you can try different things. They have really diff You know, you can bring all sorts of weird unit compositions. So there's going to be unit compositions where Azag would be better than Wurzag, right? Wurzag is going to be good for buffing a very wide army, whereas if you want to snipe characters and goon things and like have a scalpel that's going to dig something that really essential out of your opponent's army, well, then a character like Azag is going to be exponentially better because he's a good fighter, he's flying, there's a great charge bonus, he has Lore of Death, so you can uh, Spirit Leech, you can cast Buna on really high-value targets, so in Total War Warhammer, yes, there are very meta lords, but you can make other ones work too by changing your army and kind of building around them and and uh, and do that kind of thing, right? So let's check it out. Let's have some fun. We have Azag the Slaughter, and just like that point we were just discussing, is very much a scalpel character. Uh, Buna is going to be relatively useful at kind of going after elite troops. So if Kislev does bring out like Zargard or something, you can hit them with Fate of Buna. Spirit Leech very good at killing individual units. So on top of that, it's going to be Orc Boys backed up by Devrustiers. Oh yeah. Medley coming in with the Black Orcs. Check that out. So we got the big boys coming. And this is the Crucible, one of our uh, map pack maps. Doom Diver catapults on the map. I have a feeling Doom Divers are kind of designed to maybe go after um, maybe like the, the Kissel of Chariots or things like that. So who knows? Now, taking a look here at the Pepper, we have the Frozen Heart of Winter, the Elemental uh, Bear ROR, which has a Bound Heart of Winter. We have Boris Ursus, who's not like amazing against green skins, but he's really cool. And he does have a little bit of AoE damage via the Shard Blade. And if he does catch Azag, he'll kick his butt for sure. And a Frostbane device with double Heart of Winter and Icebane's Kiss. So there are two Heart of Winters on this particular build. And now it's to see what uh, where the Spirit Leech is going to be going. Um, which factions can play really diverse tactics? I would say Empire can for sure. Empire's got a pretty wild roster. Um, granted, I mean, they have their meta style that's very strong. But yeah, I don't know. I'd have to think about that question. I mean, there's a lot. Greenskins for sure are one of them. Greenskins have a super massive roster. Skaven as well. Skaven have like three or four different playstyles they can work with. Typically, there's one way that's much stronger, but you guys get the picture. So Doomdiver Catapults are being shot at the Elemental Bear. It looks like he's getting pumped. We do see an Ice Maiden's Kiss going down in the front line as the Armored Kossars prepare to engage against the Orc Boys. Those Doom Divers are doing some good damage against the uh, the Frozen Heart of Winter as the Kossars do unload with their pistols into the Orc Boys. I, they should eat, just straight up beat Orc Boys in combat considering how armored they are. And on the back side of the map, we do see an overextension as some of the Kossify Dervishes do get caught by Spider Riders and Azag. So, see, Azag can get there and cause that difference in that fight, right? And, and definitely give some problems. Meanwhile, Fly Pepper is going to be sneaking by with some Dervishes. He, he does manage to maneuver around Medley's defenses on the Spider Riders. And in the backfield, this could be very precarious. It looks like there's going to be some Night Goblins summoned out. So, yeah, just a little bit of desperation here as the Night Goblins are coming in. Because if Fly Pepper can maneuver up and around, like go like that and just shut down the Doom Divers, he probably doesn't see the Goblins yet. Yeah, the Goblins have stealth, so you don't quite see them. And it looks like the Doom Diver will be partially shut down, but the Goblins guarding it might be able to do the trick. Now, check it out. The Frozen Heart of Winter here it looks like, uh, has it dropped its heart yet? Yeah, there it is. So now it has used that Heart of Winter, and it's hitting the Black Orcs, which is doing reasonable damage. 
And now this is where Azag really comes in and shines. Azag's a good at sniping characters. So he's been spirit leeching the Ice Maiden, hunting her down on his, uh, his Wyvern here. Definitely pretty scary. Alas, the giant bear is paying the troll toll a little bit, being shot by the Rusty Errors as well as the Doomdiver catapults up on the high ground. So you can see currently the bear not having a great time. Um, only gotten about 500 value. It's a 2,000 gold unit. The Heart of Winter was pretty cool though. Definitely didn't do badly, but um, again, getting only like 600 value on such a unit is very grim. Now, as far as the backfield dive goes, it looks like one of the Doom Diver catapults may have been shut down, but the Wah comes down the valley, ladies and gentlemen, and the Greenskin army is getting pumped. They're hearing them jams, and Medley is very far ahead in value, really, really out trading the Kislevite army. You know, the big centerpiece is very, very pricey, and if this thing's going to be getting gooned down, you're going to be paying the troll toll. Medley did have the Doom Diver catapults, which were a very, very nice tech piece because they're not line of sighted by the hills on this map, so they're able to kind of get up and over and shoot pretty well. And the Frost Maiden device, getting Spirit Leech hunted. This could be one of the few opportunities Kistel maybe has if they can somehow kill Azag and get that value back, but that is not going to be easy. At this point, if I were Fly Pepper, I'd probably turn around and fight with the Ice Maiden and go after Azag. Yeah, there you go. So now Azag's getting smashed a little bit by Boris, getting shot, and the value 1,700 to 4,700. We got more Spider Riders piling into the Armored Kossars and the Kossar Spears in the back of battling Spider Riders. Now we start to see more uh, Skirmish Calf come out, as well as the Light War Sleds of Kislev. So the Light War Sleds uh, should be able to kill these Orc Boys, and the Tsar Guard might be able to wrestle this objective. Interestingly enough, nobody's grabbed the side objective or the middle. It's basically just been contested between these two players the entire time, which is pretty hilarious. But Armored Kossars, they got their pistols out, shooting up into your boy Azag. Very, very nice. That's uh, one of the ways Kislev needs to get back in this game. Zargard here going to be very vulnerable against uh, your boy. He's probably going to spear uh, Buna them, I would wager. Buna would be very cost-effective. Azag, of course, a good fighter, and you guys are, you know, getting to see the uh, the potential of this guy. Azag is certainly a very good lord. Greenskins have a bunch of good lords. Grom is good, Azag is good, Wurzag is good, Grimgor is situational. Uh, Skarsnik's probably a little bit more niche, like, if at all. Like, he's not a very common pick. He's, yeah, he's okay. He does have a rampaging effect with fermented fungi, which can certainly win you games, but gotta be careful. Now, over here, Kossars do grab the side point. Medley, though, still maintaining a pretty substantial value lead. The Elemental Bear has fallen. And Boris Ursus, no idea what's going on with him. It looks like he's in the backfield trying to shut down Rusty Errors, which probably doesn't feel great. Looks like he's routing, and Medley could just grab the Broken Tusk Mob and go in there and smash that guy. So that could be a little bit of a problem. Now, up in the sky, Azag is wavering. And remember, if your Lord dies in Total War Warhammer, it applies a penalty to your entire army. Now, in Domination Mode, if your Lord is not in combat, you can unsummon them and retreat them off the battlefield if they're very low health. So that's a pretty common tactic. And it looks like it's mostly going to be Dervish Spam, while the Black Orcs continue to just tear things apart. Up here, Boris Ursus going to be getting hit with the Spirit Leech. He does force the unsummon of all the artillery, which I think was a little bit preemptive. I don't think you need to unsummon right there. Boris isn't going to kill like a bunch of artillery models super quickly. But um, yeah, he's in trouble. He's getting Spirit Leech. Azag waiting at 600 HP here. And of course, the Tsar Guard are going to be able to cut through these Orc Boys. They'll push their way up to the high ground here on the Crucible. And they will uh, most likely have a good time in doing it. So those Orc Boys getting pushed back. And Azag actually broke in 335 HP. Kislev has uh, kind of closed in the value gap a little bit, but I, I don't think it's going to be enough. I think Medley has probably a little bit too much control over the game. Granted, Boris still is alive, and I've seen Greenskins uh, throw games for sure with leadership issues. So 165, 124. Remember, all that artillery that was unsummoned is kind of taking value off the battlefield for the Greenskins as well, which is not reflected here. So the Fly Pepper is still scrapping very, very valiantly, but... Looking around, there's just too much wall on the battlefield. We do see the Frost Maiden in the distance getting chased down by the Moon Howlers, so the Haggard Wolf Riders. I mean, yeah, obviously they would normally probably not be able to defeat an Ice Maiden, but considering she has like 600 HP, and they get the big, fat, juicy wall. 53 melee attack. Going to be buttering up this uh, this uh, this bear here, so that bear is gone. Boris is broken, and it looks like Medley is going to be claiming victory here in the first game with the dreaded Greenskins. The Wah is upon us. And this is actually a matchup that I feel is, is relatively even. I actually feel like Greenskins and Kislev usually have pretty good duels with one another. Um, but again, just having the Elemental Bear give your opponent 2,000 value and that battlefield momentum early on, I think was the big deciding factor here in this battle. The Bear was, of course, a little bit disappointing. So I think you can get away with bringing the Elemental Bear against factions that don't have like like efficient shooting. Greenskins, even though you wouldn't think they have efficient shooting, they do. They have really cheap skirmish cavalry that are pretty good at shooting, and they have rusty errors and, uh, you know, plenty of tools to bring down, like, an elemental bear. So Fly Pepper is going to be trying to resecure this high ground objective. Value is 5.3 to 9, almost doubled in value, and the value lead is only growing. Boris Ursus is going to get broken and killed here, and that means that it's going to be the end of the road for Kislev. You know, leadership is very good for them, but they're still not going to like that. The Chad Zargard fighting to the bitter end, and uh, they've been one of the good performers here, I guess, but only 500 value. Mainly just kind of beating up uh, Orc Boys, for sure. 
So Kossars dropping both shots into Night Goblins. Going to be a terrible trade for the Kossars. There are 160 Goblins here, and they got their Shanks out. They have Shields, and uh, yeah, Kossars are going to get wrecked. Kossars with Spears, terrible melee attack. Not going to be able to punch through those numbers. You need something with a little bit more GPS to actually get through the Gobbos. So there they go. You can see they're uh, really cutting through these guys. And around the battlefield, we see some Kissel of Cavalry coming in from Fly Pepper. Going to be trying to attack these guys, but uh, that's it. That's got to be GG, so I would imagine Fly Pepper will probably tap out here soon. There's no way. And Medley, even as a point lead, you know, it's, what, 500 to 230? So that is going to be the pain. Yes, anyone can join. Uh, and as soon as this game's over, when we get back in, one of the lobby spots is going to be opening up. And Medley will stay, being the, uh, the king of the hill there, and then we'll uh, advance from there. Yeah, it was kind of cool, though. We got to see the bear in action. And, you know, again, for anybody who's like a newer player, it kind of illustrates the risk of taking such things. Now, obviously, I think if you want to go bear into a missile matchup, you need to bring ways of healing it. So bring some patriarchs. Like a double patriarch bear build could be something really funky that you could outheal the green skin shooting, right? And then you could potentially have this like huge terror causing monster that can, you know, it is good against green skins if you can survive the shooting for sure. But. Yeah, it was a fun build. I'm, I'm glad he brought it. We got to see got to see its heart of winter in action. And hey, it still got 700 value. It wasn't like worthless, but cool black work build. Doom Diver catapults were super money at killing that bear. And uh, yeah, broken test mob. Very, very good here. Anti-large cavalry. And yeah, it's a very cool map. I love that map. So GG Fly Pepper, if you don't mind jumping out of the lobby, that'd be greatly appreciated. And uh, we'll get the next folks in here. So the next one we're going to do is going to be the Isle of the Forgotten Kings. Yes. It is upon us. So we're going to be doing a Tomb Kings map here. Should be pretty fun. GG to you, Pepper. The bear was a mistake. I, I will never do a meme build again. No, don't say that. Don't don't let your spirits get crushed. Come on, man. You can Pepper. You can and you can you can rejoin in the next stream as well. Don't worry. Come on, don't let that crush your spirits, brother. Don't let it do it. All right, spot is open. And we will see who we're going to get in here. And we have the nice Admiral. Ooh, looking like a Star Wars picture there. And we're going to head on over. And we will do the faction selection. So let's do this. And this is going to be for player one. So this is for the nice Admiral on the stream here. Okay. And what are we going to get? The Dawe. Okay, we got Grand Cafe for the nice Admiral. Medley's probably like, damn it. <laughs> I want a Grand Cafe. Yeah. Don't worry. Hey, Pepper, you played good. Just the bear. The bear was ri very risky against Greenskins for sure. Ooh, Cathay versus Corn, a classic. This is actually a fun matchup now. All right. So uh, Medley has to betray uh, her own people. So it's going to be Nice Admiral on Grand Cathay, and Medley is going to be on Corn. Blood for the Blood God, skulls for the Skull Throne. It's called Turin. Uh, Turin King of the Hill is what it's called. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, this is a good way to practice too. Like, if you're a little bit apprehensive about playing in tournaments, just jump onto a King of the Hill stream and you know get some reps in there. If, yeah, it's fun. Turn King of the Hill. Yes, Red Olgor time. Yeah, baby, let's go. Red Olgor against Grand Cathay wouldn't be terrible. Yeah, it's got armor piercing, fast. I I still probably would go for Valkia. Ah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, help. I mean, they have like uh, anyone. Probably just not a big demon, like a big, foot, like like exalted demon. I think Corn can go with a herald in this matchup too. My favorite thing to do against Cathay is probably double Corn cultist. And Bloodletters do massacre Cathay infantry pretty badly. Um, but you got to watch out for the shooting. Grand Cathay shooting and really, really tear you to shreds. Do you think Greenskins need some buffs? I don't think so yet. I think we need to see how the meta shakes out this season because we really have no idea what it's going to look like. So. So yeah, we need to we need to do that. Yeah, the green sentinel against corn probably not. Mm, ah, you know what? It might not be terrible because corn could bring in throwing axes to try and kill it, and then you're just like cackling and just like they can't. But I don't know. I don't know. The the, the sentinel against corn it doesn't doesn't seem to be a great idea. Corn doesn't have like a ton of shooting. Yeah, it seems kind of pointless against corn for sure. Yeah, but we'll see. So let's update the scorecards. Uh, so this is going to be medley with one. And Pepper to be determined. All right, so uh, we're just going to put the King of the Hill score under the player. There we go. Let's make that a little bigger. That's what she said. All right, here we go. Now, like, God, I'm so bad at doing graphics. I feel like my it's my 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 heel Achilles heel here. 
All right, so Medley currently has one win on the King of the Hill. Pepper, of course, is the challenger, so we will see. The new Corn ROR, yeah, he kind of sucks. He's cool for campaign. You know, in campaign, you just like, if you're in a pinch and you need something big and powerful, you just recruit him. But, you know, that's what ROR's are for. In campaign, you basically, what I like to do is keep all of my ROR's like in the back pocket. And then if there's like an annoying AI stack coming for one of my settlements, then I, I could just recruit a Lord and like recruit like six ROR's and then defend it, right? Like, uh, that, that's really what that thing's place is. And multiplayer, it's not very good. I. Of all the new ROR's, let's see. So probably the Terracotta Sentinel one would be one of the better ones because it actually can be very devastating in multiplayer. Um, Uncle for Uncle could be good. I don't know yet. The the Nurgle Great Unclean one might be okay. The Corn guy kind of sucks. The Zinch guy, in my opinion, is mediocre. Um, like Zinch already has its very defined meta style, so I don't think they're going to mix him in. Lower Metal isn't that crazy either. Uh, let's see what else. Then we have Kislev has the bear, which I think is mediocre. It's okay. It's kind of on the lower end. And Ogre's got what? The the Stonehorn? I haven't seen him in action yet, so I don't really want to draw any conclusions on that one. This map looks like a, a rotated smiling face. <laughs> yeah. This map's really cool. Yeah, Bloodthirsters, the, the the basic Bloodthirsters aren't that good. The Exalted ones are decent. They, they definitely got packs and punch and can really take things out. The big corn ROI just does the same thing as normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Blood Brute. Just take the Blood Brute Behemoth. That thing heals. It's like super... It's already a proven strong unit. You know, I don't see the I don't see the point. Minotaurs are good now too. Minotaurs got a cost reduction. I don't know about Grand Cafe though. They have a bunch of archers. So Medley is a pretty competitive Grand Cafe main. So I would imagine she'll have an idea about how to, uh, how to potentially counter Grand Cafe, you know. That's the thing, when I play against the Empire, for example, in tournaments, like people pick them against me, I have so much experience playing them that I know what they don't like. Like, you know, so that's actually pretty valuable to have that type of knowledge. Oh, Jacob, yeah, yeah, I saw it, it was fun. I don't know how much you could speed it up to, Cade. I'm not sure. Zinch Bird could be a good alternative to a caster in a secondary army in campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's The spells are bad. He can only cast those spells once, though. I don't think he's like an actual caster. Because the the basic uh, the demon like like demon characters the big demons yeah they can't you can't go too crazy on that okay check it out so corn's coming in with a, a mass shielded warrior we have the chaos lord of corn from the cinematic trailer the badass one who yells at Azazel uh, we well my only concern is not a lot of armor piercing but going for shields for so going more for staying power which I I respect that I, th I think that's a viable tactic like if you're playing against a missile faction you just try and like use your durable infantry to kind of pin them back and then play the objectives right. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, the, like, it's easy to be... There's a difference, Galahad, between being hyped about something and, like, actually using it. Like, I see Anticity being... Yeah, you say he's hyped about it, but I don't think he'll ever actually use it. You know? Until, like, you actually see, like, a real competitive Sweatmaster, like, using these units, I would, I would hold, your, hold, such, hold the conclusions, yeah. I, I don't think it'll be very... Maybe when Kislev gets like a DLC that and like some units that can supplement it, maybe. I think like the best way to use the elemental bear would probably would be a, like a patriarch supporting it. Um, so it's getting constant heals. It gets the Salax lullaby. So you could use a patriarch Rasputin and a caster and have two layers of healing for it. So you have the double Salax and then you have the Brazier, um, which is the uh, constant healing effect that the patriarchs have. Yeah, this is a, this is a lovely map. So, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. We have the forces of the Nice Admiral going to be coming in with double fire rain rocket, which is a very good choice. Uh, a little bit vulnerable to Fury, so you got to protect them well. But they can they can shoot and you know cover these three objectives, these two objectives here, and you know kind of play the field. On top of that, it's going to be peasant long spears, iron hills, and self explanatory. These things absolutely pound if they're able to kind of get shots off. Peasant archers and up in the sky, it is going to be a longma of Yang. Oh, what is this? Might of heaven and earth. As well as Dragon's Breath. Interesting choice against Corn. Uh, Corn typically is very armor focused, but Dragon's Breath is good at killing Marauders. And Might of Heaven and Earth imbues magic damage, which I suppose helps against some demons. So quite curious to see the applications of this caster from the Nice Admiral. Very cool. On the other side, we got Medley. Medley's going to be coming in with uh, Marauders of Corn, so just shielded fighty boys, just sit on objectives and just kind of grind and do all that sort of good stuff. That is going to be it. And we do also have the old Chaos Lord of Corn hiding in the bushes atop his mighty bulldog. I think this is one of the coolest looking characters in the game. This guy is just such an alpha. Look at him. He's got his uh, Axe of Corn. Uh, he's got the Paragon of Carnage. I mean, come on. What's not to love about that guy? And a couple basic Chaos Warriors. Cathay's not going to want to contest the high ground here. 
um, you know, they'll move up here and grab this. And then, you know, Cathay is just going to play probably the two low ground objectives. So I think that's going to be the jam. The building blocks line of sight from this way. So if you're trying to shoot like downwards, it blocks it. But if you're shooting down this way, it does not. So it's like partial line of sight blocking. Like, so if Cathay, let's say, has some like Iron Hills, like, or, you know, crossbows sitting here, the crossbows could actually shoot up and over. But um, like direct fire guns, I don't think would be able to. So forgot to change the name of the banner. Ah, oh, thank you. We will take care of that. So we will put Admiral. Thank you so much for the uh, for the update there. Should get that. And thank you, thank you. Who's my favorite faction? The Empire, yeah. That's my that's the problem. Everybody knows that the only factions I'm really competitive at are Empire and Dwarves. So when I play in tournaments, if they just ban those with global bans, I, I tend to get karate chops a little bit. I'll bridge, I'm actually a pretty good competitive Bretonian player too. Been able to win some matches with them. But um, yeah, this map is a beauty. This map is a beauty for sure. Such a cool map. I know, shout out to our map makers. They've made the game like so much better. Understandably, you know, Creative Assembly is focused on campaign stuff primarily and uh, probably are, I would imagine, understaffed in any regards. But um, it's kind of the way the world is now. So, you know, the map makers have stepped up and they've uh, they've given the community the maps and now it's kind of part of the mainstream multiplayer scene to have these in tournaments, which is great. So uh, we just kind of keep that going forward and we do it. That's it. So for corn, what you probably want to do, obviously grab the high ground objective. Nice Admiral or Medley is going to want to move up here with the corn warriors. Uh, this one, this is the scariest one. Down here is probably a good place to fight. Cathay is going to have some line of sight issues fighting this little house right here. So I think that's going to be the plan. We'll have to see. Very conservative play. The nice admiral is going to be moving up. Just kind of slowly screening, waiting for the fire rain rockets to generate value. And the low ground objective, Cathay could also tank this very well. I mean, jade warriors are nasty. If you just put like two jades right here and then put like something behind them to give them harmony, like one of these haggard like peasant archers, then suddenly like those things are just unholy raid bosses and they're going to, they're going to be, uh, they're going to be in some danger for sure. So fire rain rockets sitting on the objectives. Corn is waiting in the bushes, and Medley is going to go for the dreaded uh, Big Fury Summon. So basically what you do is you just save up. And this is a cool tactic in Domination if you're newer. What a lot of people do is that as they get the resources to buy things, they just buy it, right? It's like an impulse buy. But sometimes it's prudent to save up and save up like, you know, let's say 2,500 gold and buy four Furies at once. So your opponent doesn't necessarily have the time to, um, to you know, get the proper countermeasures on the battlefield. It's a very common tactic with vampire counts and fell bats and all that sort of stuff. Total Tavern map, it's called Total Tavern Tournament Map Pack, but you can just search Total Tavern on the uh, workshop and it'll come up. So it has the it has my channel logo on it and it'll say it's out of date, but it doesn't matter. It still works just fine. What would a holy raid boss look like? Uh, hmm, that's a good question. Probably like King Lewin. <laughs> well, he's not even that much of a raid boss. I mean, he's good, but you guys get the picture. Medley going to be sneaking around. There's some very, very cheeky Chaos Warhounds looking to maybe try and get past here. Going to be scary. Marauder Horseman coming out for Corn. I like this. Just get up and grab the objective and kind of take some free points off Cathay. And it looks like it has been captured by Corn, but Cathay and Nice Admiral should be moving up. And we do see the Righteous Lance's Evasion coming out for Admiral, which I think is a good choice against Corn. High ground objective, firmly in control of Corn. Here, you just want to leave one Chaos Warrior. Just leave one guy up here, maybe even none. Cathay is pretty terrible at stealing objectives. So I might even just pull both these Chaos Warriors and, and try and collapse here. The rest of the Marauders and the Lord of Corn are hiding in the bushes for now, and this is fine. You know, wait for Cathay to overextend itself, because Cathay is a formation or a faction that fights very, very well in like a tight formation, right? They want to keep their forces close, keep that harmony going. It's a lot of free staps. You can get your uh, you can get you can get the uh, picture there. Now in the backfield, we do have Yield Chaos Furies coming in, but Medley splitting up the Furies very well. This is a strong tactic. You have one here, one here, and one here. And, you know, this one Righteous Lance of Wei Jin can't be everywhere at once. So Medley's probably going to be able to outmaneuver here. So what you want to do if you're Nice Admiral is you want to just park cavalry between your two artillery pieces. And wherever the Furies land, you just charge them. And then you have your Righteous Lances guard, the one that your cavalry are not addressing. So Corn is going to be coming out of the brush now. And Peasant Archers are not quite in range to shoot. So Nice Admiral certainly needs to get that shooting online here as the Furies are going to get dove. And here they come. So they're on it. And how quickly will the response be? Okay, Nice Admiral, pretty good response time. Righteous Lance is getting onto the Chaos Furies. Good cavalry surround here. Partial shutdown of this one, but there are some Jade Warriors there who at least will buffer it a little bit. But overall, that's a pretty good win for Cathay. I would say a decent trade, as Grand Cathay does take the objective back. And now, oh yeah, Big Daddy's here. Look at the cool, quick Chaos Sword of Corn, dude. He's such a badass. Oh man. So he's going to get in there and he's going to start farming some skulls. And as you know, the Chaos Sword of Corn uh, gets stronger as he gets more kills. He gets like some various buffs with melee attack and whatnot. So. 
Yeah, this is great for him. I mean, this is his natural habitat. He's already done a shitload of damage against these Jade Warriors. Jeez, that's pretty impressive. And up on the high ground, Marauder Horseman coming in, and the rest of the Coronate Forces will be engaging soon. Marauders will bounce off Jades pretty heavily. And in the backfield, it looks like the attacks from Medley were shut down, giving Nice Admiral a little bit of a value lead. But now Admiral needs to get these Fire Rain Rockets shooting again and needs to get in there and do some uh, serious work. Uh, the mod shouldn't be that big. Yeah, it's it's not, it's not that big. It, it's something you can download, like, really, really quickly. Yeah, it must be a bug. You must be reading it incorrectly. Anyways, Corn takes the objective, obviously, surging out. Double Chaos Warrior up on the high ground is a mistake. You should pull one of them down here and uh, have them, you know, maneuver around and start pressing into the Cathay backfield. Marauders of Corn, you know, is very, very much going to be bouncing off the armor of Grand Cathay, although the positioning of Grand Cathay not quite optimal. They don't have the Harmony up on their Jades in the front, so going to be paying a little bit of a patrol toll with that. Archers in the back going to be shooting into Ye Old Marauder Horse and Throwing Axes. Very, very good value as they push them back. And now what do we have? We have basic Chaos Warhounds maybe looking to steal the objective and a couple Forsaken coming out from Medley as well. Forsaken? Uh, I don't know. I think they won't trade super well in the Jades. Like, you need Bloodletters or Chaos Warriors. Chaos Warriors just dominate them because they just have better stats across the board. And we do see the first unit of Jade Warriors buckling down as there is going to be a Dragon Breath attack. Yeah, it didn't do too much damage. You know, the Marauders got well, kind of tickled a little bit. Now you can see this unit's moving up. And I don't know if it's trying to give Harmony or trying to shoot, but nonetheless, it has activated Harmony on these Peasants, which may keep them fighting a little bit longer. It looks like they're going after the Forsaken in the backfield. And we have Iron Hill Gunners as well as Jade Warriors coming out and a couple of Cavalry hiding in the bushes. Looks like Righteous Lances still trying to clean up the backfield. So Cathay is maintaining a little bit of a value lead, but Corn is certainly capturing well. Forsaken being the haggard glass cannon that they usually are. Here they come to the Jade Warriors, and I don't know if they got their full charge off. They do have a charge bonus of 40, so it's typically very, very important to get that. And it looks like they're trying to sneak by, which I do like. I, I think charging into the Iron, Iron Hill Gunners here would be a good play. I mean, they're getting Last Samurai anyways by those Iron Hills. You can see big, big damage coming down as they fight in this uh, this Tomb King's Temple, which I think is very cool. Corn trying to get some horsemen around as well, and we see the Marauders of Corn continuing to fight. Some Chaos Warriors have broken through. Iron Hill Gunners being shut down, shut down by the giant Chaos Warrior Lord here. What, what, what is he doing so far? 309. Man, look at that. 743 on his stats. That's pretty bonkers. Yeah, and I don't think he... Does he have any buffs active right now? Yeah, the Axe of Corn is... Oh, okay, so it just increases with intensity as he fights. So his base weapon strength this on this Chaos Lord is actually 743, which is pretty nuts. Fury's continuing to dive in the backfield. Will Cathay's defenses lapse? We'll have to see. Are they going to be able to perpetually defend these Fire Rain Rockets? So far, Fire Rain Rockets have gotten only about 500 value, so they actually haven't done that well for Grand Cathay. It looks like they're going to be trading pretty downward as Medley's probably going to get this one. Granted, Nice Admiral is doing a really good job. I'm very impressed with this backfield defense. Uh, he's constantly had these Jade Lancers and Peasant Horsemen screening out Furies, which is a very important skill set if you want to be a Cathay main. You really need to make sure to protect your artillery in your backfield. As the Iron Hill Gunners continue to rip shots, looks like the center was the Forsaken were pushed out. So Cathay was able to take that one. Corn is ahead on points, though, and the value is somewhat close here. We get some Hounds moving in. Hounds are going to be jumping on Iron Hills, which are very vulnerable. They only have 16 melee defense, so the Spears are going to for sure need to head those off. And uh, this is a little bit precarious. I don't know how the Dragon-Blooded Lord managed to get in melee combat with the Corn Lord, but that's going to be a really bad trade. The Corn Lord is hitting very, very hard, and we see some Flesh Hounds coming in. I think if Medley were able to get a pick on the Lord here, that would probably seal the deal and be GG. We see the Righteous Lances of Wei Jin coming in, and it looks like the Dragon-Blooded Lord is going to get away, so it's not going to be the end of the world, but that does help Medley kind of catch up in value a little bit. Granted, will that value be impactful? There's still a caster on the battlefield. We will see. Firing Rockets in the back uh, are salvaged, so very, very good control. One of them did get taken out, but the other Firing Rockets still going to be shooting, and always nice to have that on Marauders. A couple little housekeeping things. You want to start unsummoning these type of units that are just sitting around so you can get more efficient reinforcements and all that sort of good stuff. So Cathay continues to repel the corn invasion. Corn going to be unsummoning their beat up marauders, which is a good call. And the fire rain rockets, uh, again. The one thing about the fire rain rockets is, that's kind of funny about this, is it's basically like something that is drawing in constant focus from your opponent and like feeding you furies for free. Because these furies just keep diving and they're not really getting it. So, uh... <laughs> It, it's kind of like giving Cathay a lot of free value in that in that regard. Now, Jade Warrior's holding here. They have Harmony, so they're going to be very, very solid. Righteous Lances of Wei Jin, check this out. we got the Righteous Lances of Wei Jin versus the Chaos Lord, but then some giant warriors who are just like eight feet tall moving there, and they are able to help that Chaos Lord, and you can see him in his Bulldog Mount. We're going to be chasing off the Righteous Lances, so there they go. Still 18 of 24 models. A very, very combat-effective unit, and maybe you take the Righteous Lances over the top, and you go over here, and go after the Chaos Warriors and some of this armor that they have in the backfields. It's hard to say. Fury's landing once again. And it's a very stressful thing to have to keep track of for sure. And we have some idle, idle Iron Hills who 
definitely are going to want to move up here and like start helping with some of these warriors if they can. On the objective, Peasant Long Spearmen should be able to trade very effectively against Flesh Hounds of Corn. Uh, they do have anti-large and pretty high melee defense for their price point, so that's a very, very cost-effective trade there. Granted, their capture weight does suck. However, the Chaos Sword stands a little bit alone. He's been listening to some Godsmack back here, and uh, he's going to be just taking some beatings from the Righteous Lances, but giving it right back. Currently, his weapon strength is at 743, so that guy's sitting pretty. And finally, the Fire Rain Rocket in the backfield is taken out. So you can see the Fire Rain uh, with a perpetual effort from the Chaos Furies. That thing does end up melting here. So high ground objective. Again, uh, Chaos Warriors and Marauders. I think you just leave one unit to defend that. Against Cathay, you don't even necessarily need to defend the objectives against Cathay. They're very much like dwarves. I mean, they can send some horsemen over there. But if they send a horseman unit and you see it coming, you could just summon a Flesh Hound. And it'll handle that, right? So I'm more of an advocate of like heavy pressure against Cathay and uh, you know you don't need to be as conservative like you do against faster factions about defending your side objectives. So Korn has taken this point using a couple of uh, Chaos Warhounds and Flesh Hounds out capturing the Peasant Spears here. I would imagine Cathay will move up and send some more units that way because currently right now it is a triple cap. Medley does have the triple cap even though Cathay has a decent little value situation. Korn is pulling ahead in value but a lot of that value is also tied to the Dragon Blooded Lord getting uh, Karate Chops here. So we will see. Will the Peasant Horsemen get in? There they go. And uh, Cathay might be able to get this objective back. I would wager they will. With the Righteous Lances, a little bit of bow fire coming in, and the Peasants uh, there, who should be attacking, mind you, I think they are going to get that point back. It's only a matter of time. But the question is, oh, Sword of Corn, Hitting the Peasant Archers here. Probably not the best target. Um, did it hit the Warriors here? I can't quite tell. Or the Jade Warriors. I guess there's not too many good ones. Yeah, you could just pop it on top of some crossbows or something, or Iron Hills might be a little bit of a better choice. But even still, Chaos Lord still continuing to rampage. And I am actually a big fan of this Chaos Lord. He has been really cool. He's actually gotten about 2,000 value, but a lot of that is just from the Cathay Lord, which in a normal circumstance, you wouldn't be able to catch. So I don't know if it's like an accurate reflection of how well he's performed, but overall, he's really, really not doing terribly. He's continuing to grind. And him and his warriors will out-trade these Jades all day, especially with Flesh Hounds piling in. Flesh Hounds getting into the back of these units is going to be devastating. Jade Warriors, uh, yeah. A dwarf unit could take this better. Like Jade are very strong, but they, they really like that harmony bonus. That's where they really become like bet like if they have harmony, they're certainly more cost effective than Dwarvish Infantry. But down here, Grand Cathay is gonna be taking this objective back, and in the middle, the Blood God continues to uh, take skulls for the skull throne, and the point is going here. Yes, this is one of Wacka Wacka's maps. Yes, it's a it's a beauty. It's a great one. Jade Warriors moving up. More Jade Warriors hustling. We got Jade Lancers in the backfield, just kind of continuing to clean things up, but there's really no artillery to protect at this point. At this uh, at this stage, I would probably unsummon the uh, Righteous Lances of Wei Jin, and the bottom objective is going to be retaken by Grand Cathay, but do they have time to get the top objectives? It's not going to be easy. Korn is uh, not a squishy faction. Like, their warriors have very high melee defense, and, you know, oftentimes they say uh, a good... A good defense is, I suppose, you know, it kind of goes both ways depending on someone's opinion, but, you know, best offense is a good defense, best defense is a good, you know, whatever, right? You get you get the analogy, but Korn kill, even their warriors who are very tanky do kill relatively well as far as Chaos Warriors go with their frenzy, so they're pretty good at defending themselves and uh, pushing back enemy infantry and things like that. So over here, Dragon-Blooded Shugengen Lord kind of chilling up on the high ground. We do see Objective 1 here, going to be held by the Peasant Long Spears, and more and more Iron Hill Gunners are going to be moving on up. So we'll see how this all unfolds, ladies and gentlemen. We will see how this all unfolds. Jade Lance is moving in. Cathay actually might be able to wrestle this one. It might be a situation where, where Korn has to Helm's Deep. It seems like Cathay has gotten a bit of momentum. You know, Korn has about 1,000 value tied up into the um, Lord, which really isn't, like, impactful value because it's still flying around and casting, right? So you got to take that into account. So Grand Cathay has taken back the middle objective, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what is Nice Admiral banking? What the hell is going on here? He's got 3,000. Okay, that could be inefficient summoning, which is partially what it is. If you don't unsummon your units and you get your whole army out and your army isn't dying, then you're going to run out. Dude, what is going on? Is this going to be some weird alpha strike? Yeah, like summon two fire rain rockets over here and start bombarding this corn army off the objective. Yeah, I don't know. I just actually noticed it myself. So maybe Cathay just hasn't been losing that many units. So that can happen. That can happen. But that's why you got to effectively unsummon things. So the Righteous Lances of Wei Jin have come back out, and and yeah, some Jade Lancers. Okay, so this is good timing. You get two big Alpha Strike units for the final push. Whoa, no! The Dragon-Blooded Lord just landed! No, why would you go after the Corn Lord? Well, that was probably just a misclick, and a misclick that could cost you the game, because this guy probably going to route, maybe even shatter. It depends if the Corn Lord and the Bulldog... Oh, Corn coming in! Looks like the melee, melee defense holds. The Bulldog gets in there, and down goes the Cathay Lord! 
Oh no! Anakin, I'm too weak! We get the fire rain rocket up here. Fire rain rocket's gonna be more bombarding in. What an epic hold though. Corn just up on the high ground, like defending a Cathay onslaught. But now look at the Cathay army. Every Cathay unit is gonna be getting negative 16 leadership because of the Lord dying there. So that was a pretty, pretty colossal, uh, colossal blunder. But it does happen to the best of us. It, you know, sometimes you, if you're in a situation like this, you move your whole army somewhere, like because you're in a panic trying to get somewhere, and you just accidentally have your Lord grouped with them. And uh, that can happen. So don't stress it. No big deal. So Cathay has about 80 seconds, so a little bit over a minute to get this objective. Fire rain rockets bombarding into the corn forces. <clears throat> it probably would be GG anyways. The Cathay magic wasn't like super effective, like the Dragon's Breath and the Might of Heaven and Earth just aren't very good spells. Typically against corn, you're going to want Lore of Yin to get the Talons of the Night to kill their warriors, as well as the Ancestral Summons, which are pretty good. But Cathay's doing its best. I mean, honestly, a very well played game by Nice Admiral. It was, it was a very good... Medley is a solid tournament player. And I'm sure Admiral has played in some tournaments as well, but there's no shame in losing to Medley. Medley is a very, very strong opponent, so... GG, well played. It was a nice try. It was a very nice try. And here's the thing, guys. Even if the Cathay player did not blunder their Lord there, they would not have enough... They wouldn't be enough to get the objective. They were just a little bit behind. Um, a little bit behind. See, this is... Um, like, this is housekeeping that needs to be done. These units need to be either up here shooting or they need to be unsummoned. So just little things, but it's very hard to keep track of everything if you're just getting into multiplayer or, you know, you're in a heated game. So you got to give people a break here and there. GG, well played. Great game. Really fun stuff. My favorite element of this game was seeing the Corn Lord. This Corn Lord was so badass the entire game. 2,500 value. So scaling damage and then melee attack aura. Immune uh, psychology is kind of nice. Spell resist, you know, sort of cool. GG, Medley is going to be the uh, queen of the hill, I should say, with uh, a 2-0 lead. So, we will see if any of the upcoming challengers can get in there. Well played to Corn, Blood for the Blood God, Skulls for the Skull, Skull Throne, all that stuff that you guys love. It was a cool Corn build, yeah, just very durable Corn. Let's see what it is in the reinforcements. The only thing I really don't like are Forsaken. I think Forsaken are pretty terrible against Cafe. Like, they get run down by Jade Lancers, and they also, like, don't trade into Jade's well. Um, more Marauder Horsemen would probably be welcome, and get some Bloodletters in there, because once you kill Cathay shooting, Bloodletters tear apart their infantry super hard, so that would be um, probably my two cents. Hey, nice Admiral, GG, well played. That was a great game. Really, really good game. All right, so Admiral, if you don't mind jumping out so we could get some uh, another opponent in here, we'll be on the gates of Akron for the next map. Yes, yes. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, nothing personal, Admiral, just making a spot in the lobby. Appreciate you and thank you for playing. Will these maps be a one-time edition or will you organize more map competitions? Yeah, the, so players are going to be doing more maps. Oh, we have the dreaded Flying Taco, the Lord of the Ogre Kingdoms. Flying Taco was playing ogres before they were cool. He was the he was the the <laughs> the ogre hipster. I love it. Yeah. All right. So let's get this going, dude. Flying Taco is the man. He's one of my favorite players of all time. He's like extremely good, but he also plays bad factions. So this is going to be for Flying Taco. Just watch it land on the Ogres. This is going to be great. I'm so excited for this. All right, what do we get? And we'll re-roll if we get the same factions as before. Okay, Kislev for Flying Taco. And... What's it going to be? Kislev or Lizard Man? Okay. So, um, Flying Taco, you're going to be on Kislev, and Medley, you're on Lizardman. Oh, it's going to be a fun matchup. What's really, what I like about this format, too, is that, like, you get really strong players in it, usually, and and they, like, will have to think about builds. Like, again, matchups they don't normally play. So, Taco's on Kislev, and Medley is going to be on Lizardman. Yeah. Yeah, Professor Pwn explained it well. Hey, Okoy, how you doing, man? Yeah, Medley's been playing very well. Medley's won two games. She is the queen to the hill at the moment. Flying Taco's coming in to try and take it. It's Lizardmen versus uh, Kislev. Yeah. We got, we got bears versus dinosaurs. I mean, come on. What universe does this happen in? This is pretty great, isn't it? The bears versus the dinos. So let us see what the dreaded Taco and Medley will bring. Unusual matchup. Yeah, definitely an unusual matchup, this one. Um, what we'll do is if we get this, any any of the factions that are played in the previous game, we'll just re-roll. So, um, like, for example, if we had rolled the Corn or Cathay again, we would have just re-rolled. So we can get, like, different matchups every single game. How's your sauna? I don't have a sauna because we currently rent a, rent a house. 
So like I, I, I can't, I don't have like the, really the rights to like install Asana, but someday, um, when I, ha- <laughs> you know, I don't know, hopefully someday I'll be able to have my own place that I actually own all, um, which will be much easier if we move out of California. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll have a sauna, sauna put in the house somehow. I love saunas, like just like a nice, like just wood sauna with, uh, yeah, like st- I think stones are how I would want to do it probably. Yeah. That'd be really nice. There you go, Avalon. That's right. Fighting on behalf of all the all the ladies. Yeah, that's true. Med- Medley's very good. Medley's very good. Medley's Cathay is 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 very strong. Very strong. I, I played against uh, her Cathay in a couple tournaments and have felt its wrath, especially on my Empire. <laughs> that was not pleasant. Have I lived in any other states other than California? No, no. I grew up in California. I grew up in a really small mountain village, so I didn't like live in the cities where you know it can get a little bit rougher. Um, but yeah. Um, I'm open to it. We're looking at Washington state just for year round cool weather. Both my wife and I don't really like hot weather. So we're kind of like eyeing that move to Vermont. Yeah. Who knows? We're, we're not sure we're open to options. We're going to go exploring this year because we have one more year on our lease here. And then, um, from there we're going to go, we're going to go to Washington and uh, a bunch of in Colorado and a bunch of other States and kind of like check out the state, see if we like it, check out the real estate markets in those places and move to Qatar. The whole place is Asana. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Ethan says, I have the worst farts inside of saunas. 40K versus fantasy. I prefer fantasy, but I love 40K as well. Yeah. Like, I generally prefer fantasy genres. Like, like if, if you ask me my favorite, like, kind of, like, universe is, it's going to be Lord of the Rings. Like, the original Lord of the Rings trilogy. I just love it with, like, like it's my favorite, hands down. So, Lord of the Rings. My favorite, like, fantasy series of all time. Lord of the Rings. Um, followed up by probably... A childhood like soft spot of mine is R.A. Salvatore, the Dritz Doerden series. So like Homeland, Sojourn, Exile, you know, the Halfling's Jam, um, Streams of Silver, like that whole like 10, 11 book like story arc with Dritz was probably one of my favorites as a kid and like a young teenager. Uh, Game of Thrones, obviously, I love the Game of Thrones books. Love them. Yeah, those are probably my favorite. In terms of sci-fi, I haven't read too much sci-fi literature outside of like Dune. But, um, yeah, like I love the Blade Runner universe, like Blade Runner, the original with Harrison Ford, and even the new one was pretty good too. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I I really love sci-fi. My favorite sci-fi is dystopian sci-fi, like dystopian, like either apocalyptic sci-fi or just like, or like really grim, dark, like future, future sci-fi. That's my favorite. That's why I love Blade Runner. Like Blade Runner's aesthetic is so good. It's so good. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, the Dark Elf trilogy was a blast. Yeah, it was really good. It's been a long time. Hey, Donut. Well, welcome to the stream. Just finished the Game of Thrones books. Wish George would finish it. He'll finish. He better finish it, dude. Oh, my God. It's the Elemental Bear again, guys. Have you seen the House of Dragons? I haven't yet. We'll wa- I'll be watching it soon. Yes. I just finished rewatching Lord of the Rings. Watching the Rohirrim charge just butter. Dude, every time King Theoden gives the speech to the Rohirrim, I just get, like, the biggest adrenaline, like, dump ever. It's just, like... You know, just just the manly tear comes out. You're like, come on. Like, it's it's so good. And they're like the Lord of the Rings trilogy has so many good moments like that. You know, when King Theoden is finally like lifted from the, you know, uh, Saruman's hold by Gandalf. And then like they're in the war room and, you know, they, they finally like when they get him around to like going to Rohan's aid, it's just like and you, you hear the crescendo of the music. You're like, yes, dude. Yes. It's like nothing beats Lord of the Rings. Nothing beats it. Like nothing. It's just. There's too many great moments. Yeah, and then like the like you have the epic Rohirrim charge, right? Where they like charge into the into the orcs and you're like, "Oh, this is you think that's going to be the coolest moment, right?" Oh, thank you for the nameplate. Sorry, I'm just like so hyped on this rant right now. So we have a uh... You you you're like the first time I saw that movie, like when it first came out in theaters, I was like, "Okay, like the Rohirrim charging into the orcs is going to be the most exciting moment. That was super epic." And then like a couple minutes later, you know, the Muma kill show up and then King Theoden's like, reform ranks, reform ranks. And then they reform the line and then they like charge again. And you're like, holy shit, I just get like another huge boner inducing charge, like back to back. It's like nothing beats that. And then it's just like this super intense fight for their lives against these Muma kill. And like, dude, you just can't beat that. Like what beats that? Nothing. And like, even like the small, f- that's the one thing like the rings of power hasn't done for me at all. 
Like even in like if you look at uh, the two towers, for example, you have the the scene where the uh, the citizens of Rohan are fleeing to Helm's Deep, right? And then the wargs attack them, and like even that small skirmish is just like super epic. They have that like slow motion shot going over the hill where like Legolas is like shooting the arrows, and then like the Rohirrim, like who just had to muster like a tattered resistance with the king leading the charge. They just like come out and just battle the wargs, and you're like, dude. It's like so cool. Like that is that one small skirmish is like better than anything in the Rings of Power, you know? Like I I don't like really hate the Rings of Power, but like there's nothing epic in the in that really. Like that. There's a couple scenes which are okay, but there's no moments where like you're emotionally invested where you at least for me where I felt like there was like you know, like some really like moment that was super serious like, you know, the citizens being protected of Rohan by the king and the the tattered guards. Yeah, the Legolas CGI, but come on, it was 2001. Let's give it a break. Yeah. All right, guys. Anyways, rant's over. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Let's get those Rohan, Rohan hype going. So this is going to be a match between Flying Taco. It's going to be Armored Cossars in the front. And uh, yeah, just Armored Cossars, which against Lizards makes sense. You don't really need a ton of armor piercing. Sars only have 60 armor, and uh, they themselves are not the tankiest. So folks, we do have the dreaded Flying Taco coming in with Boris Ursus. A patriarch. See, this is what I'm... I think you need a patriarch with Salax to heal. Yeah, so the bear is going to be getting healed. And then we do also have an Ice Maiden. So with a double Heart of Winter. So we have one Heart of Winter on the Frozen Heart. And we have one on the Frost Maiden. So it's back. Yeah, it's back. Now for the Lizard Army of Medley, our current Queen of the Hill. It's going to be Saurus Warriors in the front. Backed up by Nakai the Wanderer. Man, it's like... who You want to root for the bear, but then you see Nakai show up. And you're just like, oh my god, there's so many cool things. Sorry if there's a little bit of lag, guys. It does happen, but Nakai's coming up. We do have the Skink Priest of Heavens and the Quad Chameleon Skink. So the Chameleon Skinks are here, and uh, and yeah, they're they're going to be very good against that Elemental Bear. It does have how much armor? Oh, it has 90 armor actually. It doesn't have any innate missile resist, but it does have some physical of 25%. So it can probably endure the Chameleon Skinks. I mean, in the Green Skin game, we saw it getting punished by. Doom Divers, as well as Rusty Errors. So there was some Armor Sundering on the table as well. So certainly got to take that into account. That's what you got to do. So side objective is not going to be contested. Um, Lizards obviously have the opportunity for that. And this is a very good play by Medley. Just like send like a crappy 300 gold unit there and just go grab that and just get those three points. Because Taco has like a very elite army. Uh, I mean, elite. And by elite, I mean just this giant bear, right? But, you know, Taco uses meme builds, but he makes them competitive. That's like one of the best ways I can describe him. Like, you know, uh, in Total War Warhammer 2, we had the most competitive tournament series that I, you know, I ran back then was the ECL, which is now Total Tavern uh, Seasons. But ECL back then, Flying Taco was actually an ECL champion, which means he beat all the other best players in the world in Warhammer 2 and was the grand champion of all of Total War Warhammer 2 multiplayer, essentially, at that, for that particular time period. Um, and he would use kind of Mimi builds against the world's best players and make them work. So I don't know how much he, he like practices nowadays, but... Yeah, certainly a lot of potential for sure. Kistle have nothing really changed at all, actually. They just got a new ROR. That's pretty much it. So Pistol's going to be shooting into the Saurus as they advance. And uh, they are shielded, but still a little like kind of Pistol Skirmish Fire coming in from the Kossars. It doesn't hurt at all. And what is that going to be? Oh, it's the Bear Breath. I forgot that thing had a Breath Attack. So the Elemental Bear uses its Breath Attack against the Saurus Warriors. What a meme. I, I actually forgot that existed. But Nakai getting a little bit too ballsy here because even though he's strong, Boris is a better duelist in these types of situations. Boris has anti-large and frostbite, and the Patriarch isn't bad either on his bear. So suddenly we see an overextended Nakai, and Nakai is just getting munched on super hard by Boris as well as that Patriarch. And the the the, the race of the Frozen Heart haven't even gotten in yet. Now I do like this pick. Uh, we do have the uh, Amixon Barbs, which are the armor piercing, of course, uh, Razored on hunting pack. So they're going to be able to kind of shoot in there. And here we do have the Kossify Dervishes on the wings. And on the side, Kislev will be using its Kossify Dervishes to try and clear out the Skinks. Granted, I think the Skinks might actually end up winning that fight. So this could be a game-throwing play, though. Nakai got a little bit overzealous in the charge, and he got trapped by Boris Ursus. Uh, Boris does have Frostbite, so it's going to make it much harder for Nakai to flee. If you're trapped like this, what you need to do is zoom in on your character, and you need to move, like, that way. Because uh, right now, Medley's trying to move through Boris, which will work eventually, but it's going to be much, much harder to do. Amazon Barbs on the side trying to get shots in, but they are shut down by a cost of a dervish flank. So Flying Taco able to get some of the very cheap, uh, cheap cost-effective skirmish cavalry on top of this unit. And the Elemental Bear just gives no shits. I mean, this thing's just going hard. And Nakai does get away, but he's broken. And Rev Crystals are currently banned because they're bugged. 
Um, although we could allow players to use Rev Crystals as long as they don't use them on Cavalry units. I can make that stipulation, honestly, for a casual stream. For a tournament, I would just ban it since it's like horribly bugged, but you guys get the picture. Now, Heart of Winter going down. This is a hard cast. Heart of Winter actually barely does any damage. Uh, it looks like he was trying to hit all these Saurus Warriors, so a little bit of lag here. I uh, haven't had any lag with Medley, so it could be on Flying Tacos in. Hopefully it's not, but we'll uh, we'll nonetheless keep tabs on it. And if it lags into the game, I'll just, you know, we'll probably have to have someone else jump in just so we don't have to sit through like 20 laggy games. Nonetheless, Elemental Bear, nice breath attacks. I mean, it's it's doing its thing, and it's getting Salax Lullaby. So this bear is getting healed for 0.8. And then also, if the uh, Patriarch is fighting nearby, his activated item, the uh, Dazen's Brazier, or Dazen's Brazier, is going to be giving a 0.10 per second. So... Every uh, 10 seconds it's fighting near the bear, it's going to be hearing, healing it for 1% of its HP, which 1% of, you know, 10.5 thousand is actually a ton of HP. And Akai's wandering back home. He has come back here, but so far, it's actually a pretty close game in terms of value trading. But remember, Kislev does have access to some healing, right? And it looks like the little dervishes weren't able to clear off the skin cohorts. You probably need to use some, some winged lancers to get that side point there. So, is the bear tanking it? Yes, it is. It's not taking that much damage. Boris Ursus establishing dominance early on. Medley is actually trading very well outside of the uh the lord situation like now there's going to be uh, feral cold ones coming in feral cold ones will be pretty good at stopping up kissel of armor <clears throat> if they do try and move in there and here we do see uh boris continuing to do glorious battle here with the uh with the old with the old source warriors yeah does not really need large targets nearby for him to go after but yeah chameleon skanks are getting good shots the bear is taking a little bit of work flying tacos gonna micro that thing back moving up some armored kossars lizards are definitely trading very very well in value and we see nakai getting back in there and will the big bear be able to control the battlefield? That's my concern for Flying Taco. Um, it might... Okay, what was that? It looks like it was some sort of Uran and Thunderbolt coming in. Yep, from the Heaven Skink up in the sky. Elemental Bear pulling back onto the objective there. And uh, yeah, he's in a little bit of danger. Looks like another Breath Attack going down the pipe here. And here it comes. Urson's Breath. Yes. That, that animation is so haggard. I love it. But it does hit the Sars and actually does a substantial amount of damage. They were, you know, pretty properly lined up for that. But Kislev uh, is going to have to probably try and kill Nakai here. Nakai is overextended once again. Boris could probably peel over from his fight, come after Nakai, get a nice little attack on that bad boy, and uh, and finish him off. We'll have to see, though. Elemental Bear is being very conservative, and Lizards do have a lot of shooting. Chameleon Skinks, Razored on hunting packs. We had the Pterodons up in the sky, but it looks like the Kossars uh, with Spears were able to kind of shoot them out of the sky in conjunction with the Streltsy here. So they got that business going. That is for sure. And four Feral Cold Ones coming around the side. Uh, going to be charged by the Griffin Legion. So Feral Cold Ones will get wrecked because they didn't get the charge off. Granted, their charge bonus isn't crazy, but Griffin Legion will also take some damage on these. Garrett says, what's your stream schedule? It's kind of random, to be honest. Uh, I just I just randomly stream. Yeah, I just kind of wake up. But uh, typically, you can go in Total Tavern and see when my tournaments are scheduled, and then that's when it'll be. But um, yeah, it's a little bit all over the place. Elements of Bears moving in once again. Going to be doing Glorious Battle. And uh, it has healed up. Fighting near the Patriarch is pretty important. And the thing about the Elemental Bear is... Oh, look at that. Yeah, we get the uh, we get the Ice Sheet coming down as well. Trying to slow down these Razor Dons. This is a little bit of a blunder by Medley. Medley needs to get these Razor Dons back out of, uh, out of melee here. Chameleon Skanks, of course, are shooting reasonably well, but they don't have crazy AP. Those units are what you want. You want the Razor Dons to be shooting happily. One of them is shooting. The Amazon Barbs are shooting from the side and getting a lot of armor-piercing damage into the Bear. It's lost about 3,000 HP here. But the bear can't be everywhere at once, and the value trading is very, very even. Here we do have a Flying Taco trying to wrestle the side point. So he's got some armored Kossars, so he need to be given a full attack order. Um, it looks like they didn't, so some of the units aren't fighting. But if you give him a full attack order, the rest of these units would pile in and fight, and that would be very helpful. So, slight misplay there. Oh look, the bear used the Heart of Winter on itself. It finally did it. It finally did it. So the Heart of Winter went down, and it actually uh, was able to get the job done. I would have actually liked to have seen it attack the Chameleon Skinks and pop its Heart of Winter. And now we see Nakai, and a little bit of an overextension here as Flying Taco comes in with the two bears. So there they go. And Nakai's probably in the danger zone. Like, even Kislev, like, caster characters, if you put them on a bear, become pretty formidable with, like, 300-plus uh, weapon strength and armor piercing. Those bears don't mess around. Nakai's in danger, guys. About to go extinct here. He's not got much HP left. 362. The Red Czar of Kislev doing Ursin proud. Looks like he's going to be dragged down, and is he? Nakai being uh, bullied by the bear. I would imagine Flying Taco's really spam clicking that, super aggressively trying to get the kill. Nakai trying to wander away. Oh, the elemental bear is watching from the distance. Ursin watches on like a proud father as, uh, as the Red Czar continues to hunt. 76 HP. Will the bear get the killing blow? Nakai's kind of getting pushed away and escorted a little bit here to the edge of the map, but I would imagine he is down for the count. The Red Czar has done it. And Nakai the Wanderer has fallen to the uh, to the mighty Tsar of Kislev. Griffin Legion coming out, but Cohort of Sotek by Medley. Really nice micro there by Medley, using their Fuse to Die. So even though the Cohort of Sotek got hammered by the charge, 
It won't lose any model, so their damage output's still going to be very good. And you can see the Griffin Legion's really actually getting wrecked pretty badly on the return because of that. Like, all, all those models were still fighting very, very well. As far as Boris goes, his current value is sitting at about 1,200, so pretty much all of that's from farming Nikai. Elemental Bear is pushing out, and Kislev is still really, really just trying to get this side point. we got Dervishes and these Armored Kossars trying to fight off these cohorts, but, you know, time is of the essence. It's, it's a very, very tight game here, so we'll see how it all unfolds. Medley pulling back with the Chameleon Skinks here, getting some nice shots for sure. Kislev is considered to be one of the weaker factions in the game. That is true. That is very, very true, but um, they can still win games. Like, Kislev actually has some teeth against Vampire Counts. Um, Kislev also isn't bad against Greenskins. I would say Kislev versus Beastmen is fine. Uh, as far as, like, meta factions that Kislev is good against, let me think. Like, like top tier stuff. They, they just get annihilated by Skaven, usually, in my experience. Like, they have some, like, Kislev has some decent matchups in the lower brackets. Um, or lower rung of factions. But they're also pretty good against, like I said, uh, uh, Vampire. Not good against Vampire Counts, but it's like a 40-60 in Vampire Counts' favor. But they can win it. Because they can do the same thing High Elves do by spamming, like, Lothar and Seaguard-esque units in the Kossars. And they can trade pretty well with the Unbreakable and all that. Here they come. Griffin Legion going to get a beautiful charge into the Skink Cohorts. It's exactly what you want. You want to just get rid of those Chaff units with your Big Shot Cavalry. And the Elemental Bear pushing him back. Is Flying Taco going to wrestle this objective? Not going to be easy. There's still a lot of Saurus Warriors, and there is some scrambling. And now we do see a Snow Leopard coming in, more Dervishes, as well as more Dervishes. So just using a lot of those Skirmish Cavalry. On the side, it looks like Medley's kind of taken over the fight here. Very good response from Medley using the old... Um, Using the old Velociraptors. So these Velociraptors are no joke. Getting into the cost fights and uh, nibbling them down. Cold ones are just tough to deal with. They have 90 armor and they don't barely cost anything. And they still have good AP and stuff. But Kislev trying to move up and get this objective. They really need to. Um, they're pretty far behind on points. Currently Medley is closing in on 800. Elemental Bear still getting popped. But here you can see Flying Tacos. Frost Maiden chasing down the Razor Dawn packs. We actually have yet another Razor Dawn pack coming out. But there's going to need to be... Oh, is that going to do a lot of damage? No. Looks like mostly mitigated. But, yeah, there needs to be something to tarp at these characters. But Flying Taco, like, has a lot of good characters, but not a ton of capture weight. See more Armored Cossars coming up. I, you know who I really like in this matchup? Actually, Zargard. I feel like Zargard can be a reasonably good unit. Uh, Empire's fine. They're going to be the exact same as they were in the last patch, more or less. Nothing changed for them, so. Honestly, guys, uh, as far as this patch goes, the meta is going to be the pretty much the exact same. Creative Assembly didn't nerf Slanesh. They actually kind of buffed them. Um, they didn't nerf Vampire Counts. They didn't nerf Warriors of Chaos, really. So Tomb Kings didn't get their healing adjusted. So it's going to be the exact same, um, except new ROR's and slightly less abusive Marauder Horsemen for some of the other Chaos factions. So it'll be the exact same, but it's all right. We'll get there eventually. You know, we just need to you know, be more proactive about getting uh, getting our suggested changes to uh, CA quicker and whatnot. And I think I think we could see them in the future for sure. Yeah, Empire's always going to be kind of a mid-tier faction. They don't really have, like, Wagons are their best unit. Without Wagons, Empire would probably be, oh, oh no. Oh, the Razor Dawn's almost routing off the battlefield. Medley needs to micro the hell out of these units. Just run. Just run. Those are such a valuable piece to lose. This is really allowing Flying Taco to kind of pull back in value. I mean, Razor Dawn's are okay at fighting. Look at the Elemental Bear pushing back here. Oh my god, this is crazy. <laughs> Just the Elemental Bear's going deep in that territory. Lizards still have a cohort on the objective. Medley, is it Helm's Deep territory yet? No. Taco would probably still win on two objectives. It would be very, very close, but yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get to that point soon. Value trading, though, is pretty even, but Kislev has healing, and the Lizards don't really have a whole lot, so you're starting to see Flying Taco take over the game with his Kislevites. Here we do see the Frost Maiden, the Snow Leopards, and all these guys. The Elemental Bear, dude, it's doing some work. Hi okay, High Elves are a lot better now. Yeah, they got a lot of cost reductions. Elemental Bear almost banged for itself, and it is kind of chasing down these, these, <laughs> these Pterodons over here. Now, will Medley be able to hold on to this point is the question. Um, we do have a unit of Saurus as well as the, the Skink Chief over here, or the Skink uh, Priest trying to kind of push that back objective. But Flying Taco, Boris, and the Patriarch and Company going to be taking over this back point right here. So we'll see if they do it. And uh, Feral Cold Ones maybe going to try and engage there. But yeah, they don't have a whole lot of support. Those Razor Dons getting hunted to the edge of the map and kind of being pushed to extinction is, is tough. They keep getting caught by this Griffin Legion. Medley is probably ferociously microing this. But obviously Kislev has a Frostbite mechanic here. So their speed is currently slowed down to 28. So they're going to pay quite a toll. And uh, yeah, it looks like they're just kind of force shooting in. They are killing some of the Griffin Legion. Value trading's pretty even, actually dead even. But again, Kislev has probably healed a lot in this game with Boris, as well as the Patriarch. So yeah, tricky to say, tricky to say. Lizardmen are definitely weird. I mean, I feel like they're kind of weak. I feel like they're maybe stronger than Kislev, but not by much. I don't know. Yeah, Lizardmen are just strange. They're just so strange because you'd think they would be good, like with a lot of the stuff they have, like great... Some really good magic characters, like, you know, decent infantry and, like, cavalry and magic. Like, I don't know what it is with them. 
I really don't know what it is. Griffin Legion coming over here. Flying Taco going for the dreaded triple cap. So he's got the Griffin Legion unit of Saurus Warriors moving up. Griffin Legion will kill them eventually. This objective taken by Kislev. Medley, uh, I wonder if a Helm's Deep would work at this point. Somebody in chat can perhaps do the math for me while I continue to focus on the action here. Coldland Riders, or Feral Coldlands, need to be charging into the Griffin Legion before they can get the counter charge. Saurus Warriors moving up. This objective being held by the Lizards and Medley. So can Medley win with a Helm's Deep situation? And look at this! Taco abandons the objective! Oh no, and then Medley's gonna grab it! Look at that, the little skinks got there! Taco immediately turns around and sees it. Oh, this is gonna be tight. If the if if Medley gets this objective back, okay, that's gonna flip it. Now that we have Boris and, and the Patriarch and the, the Frostbane there, that could have been actually a game losing play potentially. That could have been a game losing play for sure. Matt says Taco needs a triple cap, but only just. Okay, so Medley, Medley, uh, I don't know if she's done the math, but Medley just needs to hold on to the side objective for a long time, which is uh, not gonna be easy. But if Flying Taco maneuvers his bear and his characters over here, there is an opportunity for you to maybe move some stuff over here and try and, you know, stake this objective as well. I mean, Kislev is pretty good at moving over there, for sure. Uh, definitely going to be fast, right, with all their Griffin Legion and their cavalry. We'll see how they do. Saurus Warriors will defeat these Armored Cossars, and we do get some Pterodons coming in, probably for a rock drop, I would imagine, on some of these units. We'll have to see. But I think you just spam out Saurus all day on this point. Saurus are really hard to remove. Flying Taco has his Elemental Bear back now, so the Elemental Bear is going to be just kind of hoofing it over here. So it looks like he's going to be using the Elemental Bear to hold the side point. And uh, now the battle has maneuvered over here to this. So it is on. Saurus Warriors holding. A little bit of lag as the Dervishes come in and swarm the point. Chameleon Skinks are here. Feral Cold Ones versus Griffin Legion. Griffin Legion should be reasonably resilient there. What are these Pterodons looking to do? Is that going to be a Rock Drop? Let's see. Yep, Rock Drop. Nice. That was a very good Rock Drop. Nice micro there. So where are they going to go now? Are they going to rear charge into the Kislevites? And what are the lizards trying to do? Yeah, the lizards are really... Like, look at that. Flying Taco, like, abandoned this point to go... No, like, knowing he has to get the side one. And then Medley's back with some decent capture weight here. Although, is there going to be anything faster? It's going to take him a while. Nice rock drops. Man, these rock drops are really, really good. And now Taco has to come back here. So he's having to kind of, like, split up his forces to get these, like, appropriate objective weights. Which is pretty crazy. Feral Cold Ones fighting Dervishes. Dervishes all over the place. Saurus Warriors winning their fights, but I think Taco might get the triple cap here. We do have more Feral Cold Ones coming up, but Medley is basically just spending resources as uh, she gets them. Flying Taco here on the far side. Holding on to the point. Looks like it. Yep, Kislev's going to be maintaining. I think that's going to be game. I think Taco's done it. Very, very close scrap. This is an amazing game between these two players. A little bit of lag, but hopefully it wasn't too bad for you guys, and uh, maybe it'll subside, so... Yeah, those rock drops are really good. Medley defending her crown very well, but it looks like the streak will be ended at two. So Taco will be taking over, most likely here with a triple cap. I'd be surprised if the Lizards were able to kind of find a way back here, because now it's going to give Taco a triple cap long enough that he could win on two points. So that is going to be the problem for the Dinos. Over here, we see Pterodons coming out. Um, a little bit of theft here. Look at that. Saurus. We got a Saurus warrior on this point. Oh my god, but Griffin Legion's coming out, and uh, Taco's going to make sure they don't do the job. Griffin Legion are probably one of the coolest units. Look at the, like, the glowing ice uh, spikes on their horses. That's so rad. So they're going to move in there, and uh, they will be getting a massive hammering charge. The Asaurus farm ranks, but they are like the orcs at Pelennor Fields. There they go. Big charge. Boom. Absolutely hammered. Those Saurus go flying. And over here, the Elemental Bear is back. Just going to be kind of intercepting these Saurus warriors. And I think that's GG. Medley, Medley must know it at this point. What a close game. That was a really, really close game. Good scrap. Good back and forth fighting on both sides. Kislev's massive cavalry and leopard core. They're not capture kitties anymore. They now have standard capture weight. Back when Warhammer 3 launched, they used to have insane capture weight. Capture cats. It was so stupid. God, the meta was so terrible at the launch of Warhammer 3. Like, previous domination before they made it like it is now, which is so bad. When you really look back at it, I mean, sure, it was all we had at the time. So we enjoyed it the best we could, but it was so, so awful. Yeah. You just like put a tanky shit on objectives and you win. It's just like, there was no time to do anything. It's so bad. All right. So objective two owned by Kislev, the Chad Elemental Bear. I mean, hey guys, you wanted to see the bear work. It did. And it's got about 2000 value. So this thing's made for itself. And it's also been a big damage bunch, right? Like it's sponged a lot of the Lizardman damage. That's for sure. There you go. GG well played. That's going to be a victory for Kislev, for Urson. Yeah. Lizardmen can bring healing via Apotheosis. Uh, they also have a Life Salon. You can bring... Rev Crystals are currently bugged right now, so we're not, we're not doing that. But it was a cool build. 
It was a close game. Honestly, Medley, uh, Medley's build was very capable of winning too. It was, it was a great one. They both played very well. The Razor Dons getting routed was the big, the big thing. When the Razor Dons got routed off, it was, uh, it was a problem. So Flying Taco has uh, taken the victory there. He is the new king of the hill. Well played, Medley. Medley says, I've never, ever played Lizardmen before. Hey, you did really good for never having played them against a really strong opponent. So well played to you. Boris's value was only like 1,600. It wasn't that much. It's not. Yeah, it didn't quite pay for itself. It was a little bit short. It cost like 2,200, I think, 23. Yeah, you did great, Medley. We'll see you back next time. GG's. Uh, so if you cast uh, resurrecting abilities on cavalry or certain units, it, it resurrects them at full health and like instantly full heals the unit to full health. Uh, I, I would love to do Dust Bowl, but yeah, that maps. Uh, we, we're just waiting for an update from Wacka Wacka. All the maps have been fixed on the back end. We just need to uh, we just need to get them. Uh, I think he's in a different time zone, so I'll see if I can catch up with him later. Yes, good. All right. There we go. And now what map do we want to do? I can't remember. Um, did, so yeah, Shroom's maps work, right? We'll do uh, Border Low Landing. This is one of my favorite maps, actually. I really like this one. All right. Hey, we got another moose in here, I know. The moose, is, the moose are everywhere. So let's roll it up. Here we go. It's for player one. They don't have to play the Lord Choice. Remember, they don't have to play the Lord Choice. Okay, so this is going to be Z versus. Let's see what the thing is going to be. And it will be Wood Elves. Huh, okay. That's actually an interesting one. So Z versus Wood Elves. So Taco, you're on Z, and Renegade Moose, you're on the Wood Elves. I feel like someone named Moose would probably play Wood Elves. It seems like like some sort of a woodland creature. Is the cavalry no? The cavalry bugs in campaign two. It has like kind of a weird, a weird, um, a weird condition to trigger. Yeah. So tacos on Zinch. We'll see if he brings a meme build. I would love to see like a haggard village build, but he could also um, he could also use the new ROR if he wants to. I wouldn't be surprised to see it from Taco, honestly. The ogres, yeah, the ogres, the ogres will come eventually. Renegade Moose is on the Wood Elves, probably gonna see some sisters. Genuinely curious what we're gonna see here in this duel of fates. The Moose is loose once again, yeah. It is, it is. So we could probably just do this. So Renegade Moose. I'm just gonna put Moose in, it'll probably fit better. Let me see how that looks. All right, outstanding. So let's go ahead and peek at the build a little bit. I'm gonna take a look. Yeah, the moose is a woodland creature. It lives in the woods, yeah. To a House of Dragon reaction series? I haven't I haven't watched that yet, no. I haven't. Alright, let's see the builds. Man, uh this is this is pretty fun. Holy shit. Man, you guys are you guys you guys gotta love Flying Taco. His build is so much fun. Yeah, so the map making contest finished. Uh the prizes are getting sent out tomorrow and um But if you want to make more maps. If you make a good multiplayer map and just talk to me about it, we'll, we can get it added to this map pack 100%. You know, as long as it's, it's of decent quality and yeah. But we're going to have another contest down the road too. We'll have another one. So I miss Felcon with his Wood Elf Rush. Yeah, Felcon doesn't, I think he still plays. I think he's mostly doing, I don't think he competes in any tournaments anymore. I, I Even land battles. I think he just plays, uh, plays casually, does ladder streams and uh, campaigns. He's, he could be a top player if he wanted to, but yeah, I'm not sure if he's playing land battle tournaments. I'm not sure. I'm calling the new ROR bird. I mean, it's a pretty safe bet considering it's flying taco. So it's a pretty safe bet that, that you're going to get such units. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's always a good time. I have an idea for the next contest that you all love. Yeah. Yeah. Get hyped. We'll have it again soon. We'll have another one before Christmas. So, um, It'd be fun. Just get a, like a ton of maps, right? Like, what if we just had like fifty maps for multiplayer that hosts could choose from, and and really just keep it keep it all fresh. I've heard Empire Crosswomen with shields were a thing on tabletop. Man, if that was true, that'd be nice. That would that would uh, that would help you trade into Wood Elves for sure. Not that it's a bad matchup. Yeah, any any extra tools like that are are nice. All right, let's load in. Let's have some fun. Good luck to these two players. Uh, I'm gonna go fill up my water in the kitchen. 
and I'll be right back. Yeah, appreciate you guys. BRB. Oh my god, what the hell is this build by Taco? We got Chaos Knight, the Severed Claw, <laughs> as well as the, the Lord of Change. Is this, what the hell planet are we on, dude? Look at that, look at that build. The Severed Claw against Wood Elves, like what? What is that thing even gonna do? I guess I guess it could kill Treekin. Yeah. Oh my god, dude, this is just, this is just so ridiculous. Oh, yeah, Chaos Lord of Zinch probably gonna have blue fire. I I, I would imagine he's got to like that build is so haggard that he's got to bring something that is like decent to try and carry him. I feel. Yeah, I I think uh I think buffing uh buffing Empire Great Swords would be a nice start. Yeah, giving him like a fifty to seventy five cost reduction would be a really nice. Aside from that, Empire feels like a decent faction. They just uh yeah, I don't know. And also, Empire is missing a couple of units, so that could help them a lot. Like, uh, a Celestial Huracanum could be really good, depending on how it's implemented. Like, if it gave you, like, infinite Winds of Magic BS, like Vampire Counts have, like, yeah, that could be very, very strong. All right, so, um, for Flying Taco, he's got the Golden Griffin of Theragy, which is the new ROR Zinch Bird. And this thing uh, has some metal spells bound to it, and it also is heavily armored. It's got, like, 90 armor, so... It's got blue fire and pink fire, and it's after and a sort of change for the spawn summon. Chaos Knight, Severed Claw, and it looks like it's gonna be uh, just some basic Zinchi and infantry. Now, looking here at the Wood Elves, it looks like a solid build. It's it's gonna be Glade Guard, Starfire Shaft. Zinch actually has a lot of armor. <laughs> Couple deep wood scouts just to punch through horsemen with their uh, swift shiver shards. Sisters of Twilight, really good against Zinch because they have the conjoined destiny, so that if you try and snipe them, they just heal up and it's like really cost inefficient. So I do like that quite a bit. And uh, yeah, Eternal Guard, great choice. Very, very solid Wood Elf Army. And will Flying Taco's Jank Menagerie here be able to fight back? I Chaos Knights can be very good against Wood Elves too. If you have enough of them, they can really actually overwhelm a Wood Elf Army. Because like, they're just so durable against Wood Elf Cavalry. Stag Knights can trade okay into them. But even still, Stag Knights, if they take a head-on charge from Chaos Knights, not going to have a good time. Oh my god. No, the Lord is the, the Chaos Lord. The Chicken is not a Lord. It's um it's just a standard Lord of Change, which you bring as like a, like a monster in your army. <laughs> in the next patch, Golden Wolf Chariots will lose mass and Hellstriders gain ten anti large. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll give the Hell Scourges anti large too. That'll be that'll be the dreaded change. That'd be really funny. Oh my god. Great swords and tabletop had stubborn. Maybe give them real high morale to represent that or immune to psychology. Yeah, maybe not immune to psychology because they're like, you know, just men of the empire. Um, but like, yeah, giving them like extra leadership wouldn't hurt either. So they just have better staying power. Can we have the map name in a tiny corner? Uh, yeah, in the future, yes. Not in this stream, but I'll, I can do that next time if, if I remember. Yeah, I'll try my best. So Chaos Knight's going to be going to grab the side objective. The middle is going to be uh, probably taken by the Flying Taco. He's, he's moving up with his dreaded Golden Griffin. He does also have the Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Zeech eyeing its prize. And uh, the Sisters of Twilight lurking about. They're, they're going to be sniping. They're going to be shooting at probably that Lord of Change the entire game, I would imagine. That's going to be the gameplay. So Could be a lot of fun. The coloring on the chicken is beautiful. Let's get a close-up. Yeah, he's got the big golden wings. That's pretty cool. I mean, he's basically he's basically just a reskinned Sartorial, guys, to be fair. They just took the Sartorial model and painted him gold and, you know, gave him a little razzle-dazzle. And now he's good to go, which is rad. And I'm not complaining, man. I don't I don't care about reusing reusing assets and things like that. If if we get some new stuff, I'm I'm all about it. Understandably, it's a ton of work. Like I run, you know, me and my one developer run Total Tavern, and the amount of like back end work there is, even for the most simplistic features, is is pretty insane. So like you got you got to put a lot of respect on developers' names because it is not easy work, and designers and all that kind of work is so incredibly hard and, and time consuming. 
Chaos Sorcerer Lord of Zeech getting blasted right there. And uh, yeah, not bad. We'll see if there's follow-up though. If Taco doesn't follow up and you know start shooting the Chaos Sorcerer Lord before its Protoss shields heal, then that damage is kind of like a bit of a moot point for sure. So Zeech is up here. And it looks like the uh, the Lord's going to be falling back. Flying Taco going to be bringing out Horsemen. So that's probably what's going to happen. Like Taco will start with crappy units and then he's going to summon some good ones like Marauder Horsemen. That, that's going to be the plan. That's going to be the plan. Marauders got the point. Back point uh, needs to be taken. Taco probably going to be spending some Chaos Warriors over there. Chaos Knights are looking to envelop the Wood Elf Army. Wood Elves have not sent anyone to get the back point. So they're both kind of just like playing the middle here. So they're holding on to these. And wait, what the hell is this? Is this a... What is this, a forest dragon? What the hell is that? Where'd that thing come from? It's the dreaded forest dragon coming out from Renegade Moose. Oh my god, I, I haven't seen one of those like brought like outside of the Sisters of Twilight in a long time. It's a cool thing about this. You know, you get to see some weird stuff. So Eternal Guard going to be moving up. The Zinchian army is uh, now ready to engage. But Starfire Shaft's going to be pouring firepower into the Marauder Horseman. And what is that giant golden chicken going to be doing? I suppose it'll drop Searing Doom on top of the Glade Guard Starfire Shafts. That would probably be my guess. So Golden Griffin Athergy. Going to be turning about face. And where is the bombardment? Okay, so he uses the bound Golden Hounds and it kills like one unit if even. God, Lord Metal is just so haggard sometimes. And look, he's getting into melee. The big bird. He doesn't care if you have spears. He's going to get in. And I mean, he does cause terror and is very slippery. And, you know, there was a time in the meadow when Zinch players were experimenting with the big, like, Lords of Change. So far, value trading's pretty even. We do get uh, some sort of witchcraft going down. Looks like a pink fire of Zinch. Really good against those Eternal Guard. Tons of damage there. But the chicken is actually helping. Yeah, the Eternal Guard are getting a little bit smashed up here. Chaos Knights with Lances getting around the side. And another Searing Doom from Flying Taco. Going to be hitting all those units. A big Chaos Knight charge into the backfield. Dude, Chaos Knights are just such lumbering brutes. It's so cool. Like the, You can see the momentum when they're charging. Fury's also collapsing on those archers as well. So the Wood Elves are going to need some tools to defend their backfield. And now they have them coming out. So we do see the old uh, Great Stag Knights. So Stag Knights intercepting. The Armor Chicken looking like it wants to fight. So the Armor Chicken going to fight. Stag Knights get the charge into Chaos Knights. But what they really need is some Eternal Guard. Because the Chaos Knights charging into them isn't going to be a good trade. Like, you can see the Great Stag Knights getting absolutely melted here. Now, where the hell are the Severed Claw? Like, where did Flying Taco send the Severed Haggardness? Okay, he sent them into the Fire Park Elders, which is about as good as it's going to get. Stag Knights get wrecked there, and I think Flying Taco is pulling even more of a lead as he continues to rampage in the backfield with his Chaos Knights and his giant Golden Chicken, the Golden Griffin of Theurgy, certainly causing some havoc. And, uh, yeah, man, Chaos Knights continuing to cause problems. The Wood Elf Army is getting completely folded like a piece of paper in the backfield. The Furies, the Chaos Knights, um, the Archers getting chased, and up in the sky, you know, you have Ye Old Sisters of Twilight. So somebody in the stream in the beginning, um, Pepper, I believe, if you're still here, you can see that, like, with enough practice, you can play, like, complete meme builds, and you can still compete and beat, defeat good players, because Renegade Moose is a, is a good player. Uh, I, I've seen Renegade Moose in tournaments before. But yeah, man, it's, uh, like, bringing Severed Claw against Wood Elves is so janky, and same with the Big Chicken. It's just, like, <laughs> it's so janky, but he's making it work with just good control, right? Archer shut down here. In the backfield, we get another Wild Rider unit. But these, dude, these Chaos Knights are just destroying everything on the charge. Their Thunderous Charge is moving in, and here they come. Wood Elves getting hammered. It looks like that's going to be the Zinchian Army ability, as he does have some supplementary Screamers moving down with their Anti-Large. And yeah, all the Wood Elf Cavalry are just getting absolutely hammered. Absolutely hammered. So, looking around, guys. Flying Taco's taking over this game. I would, you know, I would say I've been around long enough that I think I'm pretty good at predicting when games are over. And uh, this one's over. Uh, Zinch has won it. Flying Taco is not going to take his foot off the pedal. And uh, yeah, they've just collapsed that Woodolf backfield. And yeah, dude, I I legit thought Flying Taco was not going to win that. Like when I saw his, his the the severed claw, a really expensive, ridiculous ROR that's terrible against Wood Elves with like with the bird, the golden theurgy or whatever its name is. I just thought there was no chance. But also, is returning to King of the Hill loud? Uh, not today, unless like nobody joins for a minute, then we can get you back in because I want to make sure uh, everyone gets a chance to play. Man, that was, a, that was a brutal game. That was a brutal game. GG, well played. Forest, the Forest Dragon also wasn't terribly helpful. It's a really cool choice by Renegade Moose, but it, uh, it only got 400 value, and it wasn't like particularly good against anything in the Zinch Army. So, GG, well played. Coolest looking unit in the game? Oh, that's a tough question. That's a tough question. That's very, that's like, yeah. I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Uh, it's probably something on Korn's roster, honestly. Korn just looks so cool. I don't know. Yep, pretty rad. Pretty radical. 
The, the Big Bird got 800 value. Severed Claw got 800 too, but Flying Tacos Chaos Knights carried that game. They got 1,800 value and they just hammered through that backfield. The rest of his reinforcements were very, very competitive, right? GG, well played. Ending with an FFA today? Yeah, probably. Probably. All right, Flying Taco is still the king of the hill. And now the next map we're going to do um, is going to be, let's see. Let's do. So, Bleak Spire, Labor Camp is pretty cool. We'll do that one. I like this map. <laughs> uh, probably not, Knox. Probably not, no. The lobby's just called Turn King of the Hill. Well played, you Renegade Moose. Hope to have you back. GG, well played. GG, well played. Yes, first come, first serve. Same code. All right, so we got Mr. Moo in here. It's literally a cow surfing, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Mr. Moo. All right, let's roll. Let's roll the old wheel. I'll dethrone Taco by rerunning the bear. R O R. Watch this. <laughs> That's funny. All right, let's do it. So for Flying Taco, let's see what he's gonna get. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Renegade says he's expecting more blue horrors. You, you can't expect normal builds from Taco, that's for sure. For Tonya, for Flying Taco, hell yeah, sign me up for that. That's gonna be super hype. And Bretonia versus... Yeah, Zinch looks really cool too. The basic Zinch warriors look amazing. Oh, Zinch versus Dowie, oh my god. That, that matchup's not as bad as it used to be, actually. Especially since the dwarves have to play the objectives and they can't just sit in a box. So, um, Flying Taco, you're on Bretonia, and Mr. Moo, you're on the dwarves. Yeah. The thing about getting dwarves as a random faction is they're very, like, particular playstyle. So, like, if you're not someone who plays dwarves, it can be kind of kind of hard. You don't have cavalry, you don't have magic, so there's a lot of things you have to kind of adjust to. There's a, if you join Discord Razor by just going to Total Tavern and go to the community section, there's a, a lobby code, which will pull up the lobby for you. Yeah. Satisfy the grudge. We're on the Bleak Spire Labor Camp. Um, shooting is certainly decent here. Although, let's see. Yeah, this map isn't like, yeah, this map, this map will be fine, I think. I think it'll be fine. For the lady indeed. Slay anything without a beard all day, every day. Peasants and horses versus giant angry dwarves, yes. Dwarves are pretty pissed off, man. They got a lot to be angry about. You know, they're they were once the most powerful civilization in the old world, and now they're kind of like struggling versus all these Skaven and Greenskins and all this other stuff. Uh, which means crafting the widest build you can. You know, maybe maybe there are some te teeth to elite dwarf builds that haven't been explored yet. There, there's a lot. There's a lot. I'm gonna take a look at the build real quick, because I, I must know. All right, all right. I dig it. Flying Taco's build is basically almost ready. Uh, Mr. Moo has only selected his Lord so far. Okay. So he's, he's got some schemes I'm sure he's, he's working on. Honestly, against um, against Bretonia, I'm a fan of like Longbeard Great Weapons. Dwarf Warrior Great Weapons are also good. You don't need any shields against Bretonia. Their archery sucks. Just bring Armor Piercing to deal with their cavalry. So you just go like Dwarf Warrior Great Weapons, Longbeard's Great Weapons, Slayers, Thunderers. That's that's like pretty sweet, and then and then probably Thoric on an anvil um, to get the Rune of Doom, and just have him bring the slowing spell to slow down Bretonian cavalry. Like that's oh sorry, I didn't I didn't know I was still there. I mean whatever, they're not going to stream snap each other. It's it's a casual stream, but um, yeah, spoilers. Hey, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, trebuchets are going to be good for sure. <laughs> yeah. We just need uh, the Korean player to come in and make the Dowie look kind of like... Yeah, yeah, that's true. No, Bretonia is actually good, though. After I saw the true Bretonian play a little bit, um, I emulated his play style, and I was able to get some wins off top-tier players with Bretonia. Like, they're, they're, they're pretty good. But for me, it really, like, a lot of it comes down to using the Green Knight. He's such a menace. He's such a menace. I hope Iron Breakers and... Yeah, Iron Breakers are decent, actually. They're not in every matchup, but uh, against... Would I bring them against Bretonia? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. Hammerers against Bretonia could be an interesting one. If they don't have, like, Fey Enchanters, maybe. Hammerers, I think, got buffed, didn't they, a while back? So you could try, like, a Hammerer build. Yeah, like, three or four Dwarven Hammerers and just march those bad boys up. Yeah, you totally could. You totally could. Okay, guys, I'm going to peek again. I'm really curious what the Dwarf player is bringing. I can't, I can't wait any longer. 
Yeah, I dig it. The map has some line of sight issues, though. You got to be aware of. But this is Bleak Spire Labor Camp. This is one of Wacka Wacka's map. It has a slight asymmetry in it that fav slightly favors one side, but it's really not that huge of a deal. But I would say CP no hammers. I wouldn't say are meta by any stretch of the imagination. By the way, if you guys are enjoying all these wild games today, do, do drop a like. It helps out quite a bit. Helps more people find multiplayer. All that. Uh, Pepper says, as a certified Ironbreaker enjoyer, they're absolutely fantastic against factions that don't have artillery. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I would say I like Ironbreakers against some of the undead, too. Like, against Tomb Kings, against Vampires. Costa, a little bit risky if they bring, like, a Queen Bess. But if you have a cannon that, that can shut down Bessie, you're probably going to be fine. Hey, Major Mula, thank you for the fiber. Really appreciate that. Thank you for the entertainment. You're very welcome. Thank you for uh, for the donation, dude. Really kind of you. I don't know what they changed with hammers. I know there was some sort of a change a while back. I can't quite remember what it was. All right, let's fire it up, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see what the taco brings to the table against the dreaded Mr. Moo. Mr. Moo has, okay, his picture is a, it's a dolphin and a cow breaching from the ocean together. So they're both like leaping out of the ocean. Okay. Yeah, High Elves definitely have gotten a lot better. They, uh, they came off to a pretty good start in season two. If you go to Total Tavern, you can see their win rate is decent. It's only one, turn, one or two tournaments worth of data, but still pretty good. We'll take a look at it. We'll look at the data together after this game. If somebody reminds me. Always love these streams, even if they mean as a UK guy, my sleep becomes truly degenerate. Yeah. You know, Alfie, you could also just fall asleep to it. I, I used to do that all the time. Speaking of the UK, I used to watch one of your own. Uh, Winter's SEO. He's a tabletop gamer. And he was like, he was like, I used to just watch his streams and just pass out. There's something about it that just put me straight to sleep. Oh, Toby, no problem, dude. Please, no stress. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. So for Flying Taco, he he has actually brought Pegasus Knights against Dwarves, which seems like the weirdest pick on the planet. Okay. They, they all counter gyrocopters. Uh, they can dive lightly armored archers effectively, but that's about it. Aside from that, the rest of the units look pretty good. Questing Knights are good against Dwarves. He's got King Lewin. He's got a Dweller's Blowcaster and some peasant mobs. Dude, his whole battle line is peasant mobs. And he's got a, a blessed field trebuchet sitting over here. So looking up here on the high ground, we have objective one, two, and three. Um, dwarves just want to play these. I, I wouldn't even mess with one. Because it's like, so the Bretonians can really, really like hammer you with Cav here. Whereas like here you have this like very like, you can focus their army's like approach angles very well. And you're going to be pretty comfortable for sure. So, Do you know that Orcas steadily feast on, oh no, how dare they bad moose? I did not know this. I did not know this. So for the Dwarven army, it's going to be triple cannons. Um, a little bit concerning on this map. Uh, where do you put the cannons to effectively use them? Probably right here. So you probably cannon here, here. And then you can, can it, it depends on the range. Can it reach there and there? That's like what you want to be covering. You could also just, yeah, this spot isn't bad either. There's like a partial tree line you have to shoot through, but they can still shoot here. But there are three of them, and I mean, if Flying Taco manages to shut down the three cannons, it's probably actually game over. Like, we got Grom Brindle, the White Dwarf, coming in. Dwarf Warrior, great weapons, backed up by a couple Thunderers, which are very good against Bretonia. They kill Foot Squires, they kill Cavalry. Uh, if you can protect them, obviously. So there's going to need to be some Slayers. My only concern about this Dwarf build is there's a ton of units to protect, and Flying Taco is going to have some very, very predatory micro, and he's going to make sure to get right on top of those units and not let them escape. So I personally think it's too much to protect. Now, as far as this matchup goes, it is a, a pretty dwarf-favored matchup. I would say like a good 55, 45, 60, 40 matchup for the dwarves. But that's when players of equal skill are playing. Um, I don't know how experienced Mr. Moo is. I know Flying Taco is an ECL champion and a very, very competitive player. Or he was in the past and you know still has those skills. Uh, so yeah, it, it depends on Mr. Moo's capabilities. But we will see. Oh my god. Oh my god, is this happening? Guys, look. The dreaded Pegasus Knights have been vanguarded on the back of the map. And the Dwarves, okay, I like this. Starting the cannons here, and then moving the Dwarf cannons uh, out to the open field and just like parking them on this hill. That actually feels like a pretty good play. I do like that by Mr. Moo. Now here we do have the Pegasus Knights coming in. I imagine spawning in and like the entire Dwarf army is invisible, right? That's pretty hilarious. What are the first summons going to be? I would like to see some Slayers come out. We do get King Luin hustling across looking to harass the Dwarven army. He's going to try and see where they are, but... Dwarven Thunder should be able to do some work. And are they going to turn about face and shoot? Oh my god. Flying Taco's going for the cannon cruise with the Pegasus Knights. He lands and uh, doesn't get anything. Yeah, we'll see if he, all the Pegasus Knights get away. It looks like they all did. There's like one guy who's like stuck on a tree, but 
for the most part, they should be okay. So, cannons are moving up. Oh my god, Dwellers Below. I forgot about that. That could be super punishing. Mr. Moo going to be using his Thunders to shoot up, shoot up at King Loon. So, King Loon's going to be getting hammered. Takes a little bit of damage. Only a couple hundred. But, uh, guys, I feel like the Dwarven Army, the way they're bunched up now, is very, very risky. And we get more Longbeards coming out. But not even Longbeards with Great Weapons. So, they won't actually be that good against all the Cavalry. Like, Questing Knights, the Great... The ones with great weapons have charge defense as well, and they also have armor piercing, so they can actually trade into uh, questing knights and cavalry reasonably well. But um, slayers are needed because, like, look at this. This is uh, this is this is grim. <laughs> this is it's pretty grim. Those things are very vulnerable here. But nice shots here by Mr. Moo. Yeah, great value. He hammers those questing knights down very effectively, and his dwarf warrior great weapons are in the bushes. The damsel of life is trying to get it. Oh my God, no. Oh, if that damsel gets a dwellers, that's gonna feel so bad. But there's like nothing protecting these cannons right now. There needs to be some slayers coming over. Look, Flying Taco knows this too. He's flying around with the Pegasus Knights. Uh, and we get more shots coming out for Thunders. And the Peasant Mob's not really going to do a whole lot. This feels bad, man. Feels bad here. Feels rough. These uh, these Questing Knights and these Pegasus Knights are about to just get all these cannons. And uh, the Dwarves do have some great great weapons there. Dwarven Artillery, look, <laughs> he's trying to run with the cannons. Oh no. Mr. Moo! We get the Dwarf Warrior Great Opens moving in. Going to be battling the Questing Knights. Dwarf Warrior's fighting here. King Luwin jumping on the guns. And on the other side, we got Questing Knights kind of chilling out, trying to outmaneuver the Longbeards. Objectives are now opening up, so Bretonia will be getting on those. But the Dwarven Cannons aren't, like, taking lethal damage yet, but they will soon. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a Fat Dweller's Blow back here, which is going to karate chop the Dwarves. Yeah, it's looking a little bit rough. Yeah, yeah. He didn't have... Like, this isn't too many missiles to protect, I think, initially. Need to get some slayers in there. Oh no, and Dwellers now is going to be hitting Longbeards, Cannons, Cannons, and also these Thunders, and and this Cannon. Oh my god. Yeah, that's probably GG there. This is like looking pretty devastating. Even though the value is like close-ish, it's, uh, it's not going to be... Without all the shooting online, it's going to be very tough. And hey, you know what happens. Mr. Moo might be a newer player, so... He, he's this is, this is a trial by fire. Having to play against Taco as a newer player is... Certainly not going to be easy. He's he's going to, even though he memes, it's not like pl having to play like a really sweaty competitive player in your first game, but it's still uh, because he, he memes, obviously. But he is, he could be the sweaty if you wanted to, but here comes the Pegasus Knights descending from the heavens. Cannon is offline. I love the Pegasus Knight Vanguard. It's just so janky and ridiculous. So all three Dwarven Cannons are off. And, uh, and yeah. John says, GG from one, one spell. Well, yes, if your whole army is stacked in one spot, all your value pieces... I mean, there's a lot of spells in the game that could potentially do that. Like a Purple Sun, a Comet of Cassandra probably wouldn't have done quite as much, but you get the idea. So, Knights are chasing down many of the Rotting Dwarves. Guns are back online. Will the Dowie be able to pull this one back? That would be a pretty impressive victory if they were. King Luan finds some of the overextending Longbeards here. Going to be uh, trying to drag them down if he can. And on the back side, we get Longbeards moving up to try and jump on over to this point, which is not a bad idea. Just kind of a long game plan there. Cannons are running for the hills. So uh, there they go. We see Longbeards running. We see Cannons running. Cannons running. Flying Taco is going to be chasing down all those different units. And uh, and yeah, I don't know what else the Dwarves can really do. I feel like it's going to kind of be a slow, painful death here. As we see Questing Knights just getting on top of these. And he did bring Hammerers out, which is pretty cool. Here they come. It was just too much range to protect. Like, three cannons and three thunders and, like, a very narrow core of infantry against, like, a very mobile faction is not going to be easy. In dwarves, like, it takes a little bit of experience to protect your, your shooting and stuff, for sure. It's not easy. GG, Mr. Moo. Well played. You tried, man. You tried. I mean, you got a really tough opponent for, for you know, for your game. So hold your head up high, man. Don't let that one defeat you. Flying Taco's a champ. Uh, cannons, yeah, obviously. We saw the game. The positioning, they just weren't being protected. Needed something to kind of guard those. Wilson, thank you for becoming a member. Really appreciate that. Welcome to the Dukes of Haggard. Yes. <laughs> the moment I saw that turn uh, Matt with a bunch of bunched up missile units, I was like, Anakin's lightsaber ignited on, on the younglings. Yeah, totally. Mr. Moose says, I'm sorry, guys. That was a bad game. Don't worry about it, man. Don't worry. You, you, you should just hold your head up high for getting in there and trying, man. You know? That's what it's all about. Don't worry about it. It's You also probably aren't, like, you got a random faction. You didn't know the map either. There's a lot of things there that are tough. Yeah, there's a beginner's tournament on uh, Saturday, I think. Oh, it's Professor Pwn versus Flying Taco, the two biggest meme lords in the community. Oh, yeah, dude. You're about to see the Duel of Fates. Cue the Star Wars music. All right. So let's switch over here. You forgot your Slayers? Yeah, don't don't worry about it, man. 
All right, so for Flying Taco. Hey, Wilson, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. You've been watching since Warmer 1, Jesus. That was so long ago, dude. Please the green skins for Taco, that's a perfect meme faction. So Taco, your green skins and Professor Pwn. Let's see what you got. Uh, Bretonia. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait, no, we, we had them last game, so the rule was to reroll. So Pwn, you're not Bretonia. Because we can't have the same factions in, in like back to back games. Yeah. We want to give you different matchups every single game that you haven't seen in a little bit. Z, perfect. That's way more fun. Okay. Uh, Bretonia is really fun, but Z, like, Pwn will play Zeech in a very fun way. Alright. So, Pwn is Zeech and um, Taco's Greenskins. Pwn, if you're still listening, you're Zeech. Yes. So, let's do another new map. We can do the Glinty Tooth's Crag. Outstanding. Uh, Professor Pone, did he see the update? Let me shoot him a message in Discord. Uh, you're Zeech. All right. He's still in Bretonia right now, so I need him to switch. It's funny to see how different and yet how similar your videos are from number one, yeah. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's, it's a big change. Oh no, Pwn. Okay, he got the message. Perfect. Yeah, Zinch vs. Greenskins. But I, I, I would love to see some village play, man, with the regenerating shields in the ground. That could be really cool. That would be really, really cool. Yeah, this matchup is, uh, uh, I think, in, in hyper-competitive. With like ultimate sweat lords playing, I think it's each favored, but I think at like mid level, it's like it's definitely greenskins have some tools. They have some good armor piercing to cut through the Zinch armor, and they have good skirmish cav that can trade or at least force back Zinch skirmish cav. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Warhammer one's pretty haggard if you look all the way back. hundred percent, dude, hundred percent. Yeah, it's a good time. Thanks for becoming a member, man. I really do appreciate that. By the way, let me see here. I tried to turn on um, a setting. If you guys could let me know. So YouTube sent me this this thing that now on YouTube they have a feature where you can gift, me like you know how on like Twitch you can gift subscriptions? I think YouTube has something where you can gift memberships. I thought I had turned it on. Like, do you guys see the option to do that? Is it possible? Like, do I have to turn something on in my channel? Yeah, let me know if you guys see something. Like when you're like clicking around there, because obviously I'm not able to see it. I don't even know how that would work. Let's see here. So yeah, I don't see anything down there in the bar. I'm just so terrible at this. This is like my job and I'm just terrible at it. Uh, green skins versus Zinch, what would I bring? Uh, Black Orcs could be okay if, if like, they will crush the Zinch infantry, but you have to watch out for blue fire spam and like vortexes that, that can really just wreck them. Yeah. And do, you, do, you have to, do you have to click something that says to accept a membership? Yeah. Like maybe you have to click something like that. I'm not sure how it works. Yeah, it wasn't a nerf to Marauder Horseman, it was a fix. I don't see the option. Okay, guys. That is a thing, though. Let me check. I'm gonna just load up my YouTube on the back end and see what I can find. Uh, okay. Let me see what it says. You see, uh, allows your uh, channel to buy, okay. Let's see. Okay, looking here. Yeah, I'm taking a look here. Trying to see how you do it. Hmm. Tricky business, tricky business. Who would win a game of chess? Zinch or Gork or Mork? You know, I feel like Zinch would, oh man, they're so unpredictable. Both of them are like unpredictable, right? So it'd be like Zinch is like, the whole thing is just being unpredictable. Zinch would probably be like playing Stockfish or something. Like if you guys play chess, Zinch would be like playing like a bot that just like, it's just wild. It doesn't use like typical styles, but it ends up beating you, right? Yeah. You have to mess with the options to be able to accept. So you're saying people in chat have to, to have to do that? Yeah. I remember notifications on the chat about giving what you, you probably have to do something on your end. Okay. I'll take a look. See if I can enable that. Learn more about, okay. I have no idea how this works. Where are you at? How do I turn this on? Maybe it's on the back end of my YouTube channel or something. We will see. Existing, exist, so okay, so existing channel members click the button next to live chat. 
membership is only available to viewers who purchase on desktop live streams. So you have to be on desktop, okay? And then viewers have to opt in. It says during the beta, the only way to opt in is to click allow gifts on a membership announcement that shows up in live chat. Okay, so someone who's already a channel member should maybe have an option. And then like a message pops up where you click allow it or something like that. Okay. So I'm taking a look here, I'm gonna be peeking around. Yeah, I have no idea how it works. It's very, it's very, very strange. I'll keep, I'll keep looking while we, while we load in here. Okay, looks like we're in the game. So we'll take a look afterwards. Okay, looks good. Looks good to me. Got the back end here. Hmm. Well, it is what it is. We'll figure it out another day. I'll figure it out off stream. All right, guys, back in business. Yeah, you don't see anything? I just have super chat and super stickers. Okay, got it. Yeah, I'll take a look another day. Oh my God. Ladies and gentlemen, look at this. Flying Taco with the Rogue Idol. Oh yeah, dude. Look at that thing. It's the Rogue Idol with the boys. And I think it has an aura of leadership, doesn't it? Yeah, it has the spirit of Gork or Mork. And then Pump Wagon Flappas, which are actually pretty good. So he's got Pump Lab and Flappas. He's got Grimgore Ironhide <laughs> and no caster. So this is like a Bronzodia build. I love it. And Professor Pwn brought the Demon Prince of Zeech, dude. Look, he brought the Feathered Lord. So what does this thing even do? It, it did get a cost reduction. So he's got Winds of Change, which gives him power recharge and miscast chance. Blue Fire, Plague of Rust. And uh, he's also got Paragon of Change, so he replenishes shields. And Arcane Flight for a little bit of spell mastery here. Oh my god. Wow. Check that out. This is gonna be fun. Um, Chaos Warriors of Zinch. We do also have some Marauder Spears on the flanks. Double Cultist on the ground. Gonna be summoning in pinks. So the pinks will be quite nice, but yeah. Dealing with that many pump wagons, it's gonna be nasty. Nomi, thanks for becoming a member. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, the casters are in reinforcements, obviously. Taco's gonna bring it in. Yeah, it'll, it'll get there eventually. Dude, oh no, never mind. It's up in the front. It's an Orc Shaman. Uh, he's got Foot of Gork, and it looks like there's gonna be a Blue Fire. So Pwn going for the kill. Does get the snipe on the Orc Shaman. Orc Shaman gets its bread buttered a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's a good idea. If you're pwned, just kind of snipe the snipe the Orc Shaman off and, you know, give him the dirty. Demon Prince getting in there. Yeah, getting a couple free shots. So really nice opening here for Pro Professor Pwn. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, the pump wagons are coming. The pump wagons are coming. Oh no, the Demon Prince is getting, getting rammed by the old wagons as the shields are going down. Spear's going to be defending the flank here. And they'll be contesting the middle objective. Dude, this Demon Prince is getting flapped on, dude. Look at this. He's getting he's getting the business. Did Grimgore use your next on him? No, he didn't. Okay. The Demon Prince's shields are gone. Dude, is this Demon Prince going to die to the pump wagons? Oh my god. Pwn, you need to send in your screamers. You need to help the chicken. He's getting wrecked so badly. Yeah, pump wagons put in work, dude. I mean, they've already gotten a lot of damage in. And now they are going to be moving in. And that's going to be some anti-large armor piercing onto the pump wagons. Taco will pull back, and uh, Professor Pwn will have learned a valuable lesson. <laughs> to fear the dreaded pump. Yeah, scary stuff. On the side, Marauder Spears versus Goblins. Marauder Spears will win that and outcapture it. So the uh, initiative, or the pressure, is going to be on Flying Taco. He uses a Plague of Rust, and what's the follow-up going to be? A Blue Fire Plague of Rust combo? That's interesting. Is that actually good? Ah, uh, not really. Because <laughs> he still has 90 armor, so it's a bit of a haggard combo. But, you know, this is, this is the place to kind of experiment with things, right? And try and figure it out. Yeah, Pwn needs some Chaos Spawn, like, stat. Like, if he doesn't get some Chaos Spawn in this army, he's going to get wrecked so bad because Squigs kill warriors, Pump Wagons kill warriors, Grimgore kills warriors. Like, the Zinch warriors are not going to have a good time. Screamers are, like, one of the few things he has that are very useful here, so we'll see how that goes for him. In the meantime, Spears taking this, the Zinch and Spears on the side, and we do get the Pinks coming out, so the double Pink Summon is going to be giving some Daka as the Zinch warriors absorb that charge, but, I mean, guys, this is not going to go well. The Greenskins are just going to pump the jams all over their face right there. And also the Rogue Idol is just going to be stomping the yard so incredibly hard. Here it comes. Oh, okay. No, you got, you got dazed by something. Grimgore is also chopping through. Screamer is getting into combat. Gives some nice anti-large. Pinks are not firing at the moment. Uh, Pwn needs to give them the uh, correct shooting order. Oh, Foot of Gork! Foot of Gork coming down. Crushes the Marauders and Chaos Warriors on the flank. Massive damage from the Foot of Gork. And Flying Taco pulling massively ahead in value. Also getting the capture weight here. The Zinch army is just getting absolutely steamrolled. Absolutely steamrolled. And we see the uh, we see the blues back here. The pinks trying to shoot, doing a little bit of damage. 
But like Poe needed some spawn a long time ago. Yeah, we got Flamers coming out as well as Doom Knights of Zeech. Not going to do enough. Um, over here, we might see the Marauder Spirits actually defeat those Squigs as well. There still are some Warriors, but the Foot of Gork was able to do some big, big work. Demon Prince got the Winds of Change, trying to fight in combat a little bit. Do the forces of Prof P have any tools for getting back in this game? Doom Knights uh, don't know how well they're going to do. Yeah, I mean, I guess they'll be okay against some of the squig units. If Professor Pwn had a big Vortex spell, man, he could really punish this army pretty badly. Uh, looks like he's getting his Doom Knights behind the army, which is a good play. And then Professor Pwn's going to pull back in and just, like, charge into them. No, he's intercepting the Spider Rider Archer. It's not a bad idea. But you're about to see Pump Wagons killing Doom Knights, because that is a thing. It's going to happen. And the big Demon Prince kind of hanging out in the wings. We get the... Uh, the pink's continuing to shoot, getting a little bit of DACA. Value is still at about 2,000. Zeech does have some units still fighting. There's still some warriors enjoying themselves. And now the flamers of Zeech are here. So Professor Pwn has adapted. And he's brought out some DPS of his own to try and melt down the big rogue idol. Doom Knights in the back able to clean up those spider riders. So those guys get completely broken off as more and more spears come in. We got Marauder Spears here. High ground objective going pretty well for the Professor as his spears hold. But obviously uh, Flying Taco is trading very well here. And now we get the pump wagons coming, guys. We've seen the devastation that the pump wagons can cause. And all jokes aside, they're actually a good unit. The Flappa ones, they do a ton of damage against pretty much everything. They're a little bit squishy to, you know, armor-piercing anti-large stuff. But aside from that, you can see them killing the uh, Flamers of Zinch pretty effectively. So we get some Marauders coming out and some Forsaken moving out from the spawn zone. While the Zinch Warriors continue to fight, but, like, Grimgor and the Rogue Idol here are going to be such beasts... It's going to be really tough to stop them. The Demon Prince should probably come attack the pumps right here. It looks like he's using blue fire on them as the uh, summoned pinks are going to be disappearing back into the void from whence they came. Doom Knights of Zinch doing okay. Fighting a couple squig herds, you know, taking some armor piercing damage. And now Orc Boar Boys get in there and a lot of them are trapped in the ground. So Professor Pwn's going to be losing a lot of value there as Flying Taco continues to take over the game here with his... You see, like, he makes weird builds work, um, for sure. Like, the Rogue Idol, Grimgore, like, Flappa rush against Zinch, like, you know, that's, that's something. That's definitely something. So Pump Wagon's coming across. Gonna be jumping on top of the Chaos Warriors here. Now, the way that Zinch counters this is, is they bring Chaos Spawn. Chaos Spawn would have just really, really shut this build down. It would have blocked up the Rogue Idol. It would have uh, stopped the Pump Wagons from doing damage, and uh, Zinch would have been much happier, for sure. So, um... No spawn, though. Mostly just infantry. Things that, you know, the pump wagons are very, very good against. But this game's uh, probably over. I think the Rogue Idol and Grimgore are too healthy. Pump wagons are just going balls deep into the back line and um, over here. These spears are doing great. I mean, they're doing really good. Trading upwards very, very well. But, um, yeah. Looking grim for the Professor. Another uh, blue fire Plague of Rust combo in there with the Warp Flame. So it's, the Rogue Idol's armor is now down to 20. And it looks like the big Demon Prince is going to go after him there. Pump wagons on their way in. Cultists of Zinch and Chaos Warriors still fighting. The chicken's going to have to flee the scene now, though. Grimgore's come in, and he's used your next. So suddenly this thing has, like, like no melee defense, only 15. So the Rogue Idol breaks through its armor, and then the Pump Wagons come in. And Pump Wagons actually have good mass. They can kind of trap you in place if you're not careful. So you gotta you got to put some respect on the pump. you got to pump them jams a little bit. Now look at the Rogue Idol value. This is what you're all here for. Uh, that's Pump Wagon. So let's look at the Rogue Idol. Um, 800 value, not that much, but it still was devastating to the Chaos Warriors. As we get Forsaken coming in, like, Forsaken aren't going to do anything against this type of an army. Pump Wagons will kill them. One rogue idol jump, like, completely karate chops all of their shields. And uh, I think that will probably be it. Oh, my God, the Foot of Gork plays, too. That first, first Foot of Gork was really devastating as well. Well played to both of them, man. They both brought fun builds. I love seeing the Zinch Demon Prince. That's so cool. It's so different, you know, than uh, what we normally see. And he does, uh, he does resurrect, not resurrect, but he heals shields on nearby units, which is something that the other Lords of Change don't do. So you can kind of sit him over your army, and he's going to replenish the shields, which I think is... Pretty badass, but that's going to be it. GG, well played. Um, we have the Hammer of Gork. We have the Orc Boys in the back, and Zinch is just straight up out of steam. It's a triple cap. It's a value lead. Uh, the Wa has done it. The Rogue Idol just going ham on this line. Uh, the Lobby, you just need to have the Total turn, uh, total, total Tavern Tournament map pack, and then you just... Uh, it's called Turin, uh, Turin King of the Hill. You can also join my Discord from Total Tavern, and in the community section, there's a, there's a, a joining code for that, so... Man, that was a sweet wa build. That was a sweet, sweet wa build. So what we're gonna do now that Flying Taco has um, has four wins, he'll keep playing. But if somebody beats him, they'll have a chance to beat his record, and then that will be like it, basically, right? So that I mean, you guys are guaranteed a lot more games. Don't worry. There's there's a lot more hot action today. Yeah, Pone's got nothing at this point. He's he's gone out of resources. 
Little goblins kind of holding the side points. And, uh, you know, you're not going to get rid of Grimgore on the Rogue Idol here. As well as some Stone Trolls and Orc War Boys. It's a lot of stuff. Charging into Spears, obviously a little bit dangerous. But considering they're just so beleaguered and tattered, it does not really matter. Pump Wagon's being chased off by Screamers in the backfield. And, uh, yeah, man. GG. Well played. That's going to be game blouses there. As we do see the Furies in the distance and Screamers chasing off Pump Wagons. Taco's got a big value lead. Just going to be summoning out more stuff. Professor Pwn getting his beat up Doom Knights trying to get on top of the Hammer of Gork, which is a good play. Definitely going to get on that and uh, maybe even kill it with a couple Doom Knights. It just goes to show the value of those units. Just having them around is nice for shutting down RD pieces. Yeah, I don't see how he gets back in this. What is he resummoning here? So he's got his Cultists, he's got some Warriors, and some Blues. So it looks like this is the last March of the Ents. This is Professor Pwn's last stand. He's going to move up, make one last consolidated effort to get on the objective and get some good value. Maybe kill the Rogue Idol or something. He still has his other cultists here as well. And this was a cheeky little play too. Shutting down the Hammer of Gork back here with just like a couple Doom Knights I think is very, very nice for sure. As Condi once said, Grimgor is the best. Hey, so I was playing, um, <clears throat> I was playing Ultima Online last night. And uh, I ran into a guy on the server whose name was Grimgor Ironhide. And he was role-playing as an orc. I was like, all right, that's pretty cool. That was pretty cool. I've also seen, uh, I saw someone named, was it Vlad von Karstein? Like, it seems like there's a lot of people on the server who, like, have names that are, uh, yeah, from Warhammer, which is pretty cool. Here, Cultist getting its butt kicked. Grimgor, you know, talk about a mismatch. Oh, my God. You don't want to be that Cultist. That would suck pretty bad. He's got, what, 400 HP. Grimgor's had enough. He's like, all right, you're shattered. You can just you can go away. Well, grow strong again, and we will heal. So, Pwn's last stand is here. Not going to go great. Stone, Stone Trolls, Boar Boys armor piercing into Warriors. Stone Trolls armor piercing. The Blues get shut down. Also, some supporting chaff infantry. Uh, this build would honestly work fine with Grom the Paunch, too. Grom is very similar in functionality. I mean, he's, he's like a good fighter and hard to kill. Grom would probably be better than Grimgore, potentially, here. Uh, maybe I'll do an Ultima stream someday. I'm not sure. I'm not sure people would even really want to watch it. So, it's, it's a pretty, pretty ridiculous game. Maybe, maybe. So here we have the old Stone Trolls. Orc Boy's still fighting. Pwn's still trying desperately. Chaos Fury's going to be descending from the heavens, maybe. Nope, just sitting up there. And yeah, this is just not going to go well. He doesn't have enough time. I mean, he's triple capped 1,000 points. It's got to be GG. Forsaken moving to the side. Um, going to try and wrestle the point, but Taco has such a points lead that he can afford to send Black Orcs over there. The Black Orcs are going to just get in there, dude. They're going to give the dirty. Like, Black Orcs versus Forsaken is a super one-sided fight. These guys will just crump them. Does Forsaken lack armor piercing? These things have 110 armor. Great armor piercing to punch through the Forsaken uh, shields and HP and all that. Another blue fire going down. That Rogue Idol just tanking it like a champ. Up to 1,400 value now, which is pretty cool. Rogue Idols cost, what, 2,000 gold, give or take? I think something like that. Yeah, well, maybe so. Maybe so. Not a bad idea. GG! The Pump Wagon Rogue Idol Grimgore Rush. The new meta is upon us, ladies and gentlemen. It is being innovated here. Well played to Professor Pwn. He brought an awesome build using the Zinch Demon Prince, which was very fun to see. He also gave us some Doom Knights, which actually Doom Knights got a 1500 value, despite having a relatively bad trade in the beginning. GG, well played. <laughs> Pwn, Pwn's in chat. He's like, what? Like, what just happened? What kind of a build is that? All right. So, Flying Taco up to four wins, guys. Man, Flying Taco doing, carrying the carrying on in the King of the Hills takes me back. Okay, we got Silver Lance. Uh, let's put you on. We could put you guys on. Uh, what's another new map we could do? <clears throat> oh, you guys want to see it? This is a, I, I, this map is just like the Thunderdome. This is this is called the Hell Pit Depths. I don't use it in tournaments yet. It's a little bit too small, but um, yeah. Oh, Pwn, you said he surrendered? Oh. Oh, Flying Taco probably has to go. Okay, let me let me see what he said. So, uh, Pwn, you go ahead and stay in the game. Yeah, you're good. So, Pwn will carry on. Uh, Flying Taco still is, is the score to beat. All right, so Professor Pwn. So, four for Flying Taco and Prof Pwn will be here versus uh, Silver Lance. Let's go ahead and switch that. Very good. And outstanding. All right. So Pwn will be starting from zero. So we'll see if anybody can beat Professor Pwn's scores. We'll see. 
Am I a filthy casual for using Thoric and Felix? No, you're not. It's, it's not a t Thoric's really good, and Felix is, is decent in some matchups. Yeah, not at all. All right, let's roll. Let's roll. We've had some really fun games today. Hey, Flying Taco, thank you for playing, dude. That was super fun. We, love, we loved all those games. We loved them all. Professor Pwn using Zinchi and Magic to defeat, to get the victory there, yes. All right, so this is for Silver Lance. Let's see what he gets. What is it going to be? Yes. Nurgle's Pestilent Glory. And on the other side for Professor Pwn. What's it going to be? All right. Defender of Ulf High Elves. High Elves versus Nurgle. Pwn gets his main faction. All right. Let's see if Silver Lance knows how to play Nurgle. All right, Silver. You're on Nurgle. Pwn, you're on High Elves. You're on the Hell Pit Depths. Somehow these two factions have found their way into a Skaven Under Empire and they're fighting down there. So it's going down, man. High Elves versus Ye old Nurgle. All right, Pwn, show us what you got. Yeah, this is actually a really good map for Nurgle, I think. But it depends on if he plays Nurgle, right? Because this is completely random, so players just kind of get random shit. <laughs> yeah, this is very fun. Are you guys excited? Yeah? I'm hyped. I'm definitely hyped for this one. It's going to be great. Well, Silver Lance is playing on, uh, he's playing on Nurgle. So uh, he's not going to be the one getting the Nurgle, the high elf stuff. Has he started picking yet? He's like looking at it. He's like... <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my god. I see I see his first selection. I'm hyped. This is gonna be ridiculous. Oh my god, Pwn's build also. Wow, you guys are in for a treat. You guys are in for a treat. You know, I'm i I'm I'm really getting in the mood right now. I'm having a good time with you guys. So I'm gonna go get a coffee and just crack that bad boy open and uh we're we're gonna we're gonna fasten in for a lot of great games. So I'll be right back. All right, guys, you ready to hear the, the satisfying sound? Crack open a coffee. So it's actually, um, it's a cold brewed coffee. It's uh, it's like a nitro cold brew thing. They're so good. Oh my God. They're so good. Pwn sold his soul to Zinch. I know he did. It's a very satisfying sound. Oh, that's the good stuff right there. Oh, that's so good. Oh, it's so good. All right, so Nurgle versus High Elves. Um, what does Nurgle do? Yeah, on this map, I would probably just do like a Nurgle Tide. I would just get like a million units and... I don't know though. Yeah, Nurgle's got Marauder Horseman throwing axes to kill dragons. Pwn, Pwn is like an Imric man. That's his thing. That's his thing, 100%. Yeah, Zinch, Zinch manipulating the system. So Taco is the current, current winner for sure. Cracking open a cold one with the boys and girls. Yeah, we're, all of you guys, yeah. Mass Tyrannock Chariots would be so terrible. That would just be so terrible. You and Italian both showed that they're... Uh, I don't think Italian Spartacus... He doesn't drink coffee, though. Whatever Italian Spartacus is cracking open on his stream is not coffee. He he drinks caffeine, but in uh, like ener like pre-workout energy drinks things. I he, I've tried to get him to get coffee. I, I don't think he drinks it. Yeah. Triple Soul Grinder? Soul Grinder's got a cost reduction. I actually think they're going to see more play now, for sure. They're down to 1750 so from 1900 Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think I've ever seen Tyranox on a stream. I've seen them before. They're really bad. They're really bad. Oh, my God. You guys, you guys are going to love Pwn's build. I saw the beginning of it, but the Nurgle build looked great, too. Hold on. I just can't, I can't hold on any longer. Oh, my God. This is, this is what it's all about here, guys. This is what it's all about. 
Like both of them brought just super fun builds. I'm very excited for this. Uh, Medley says, doesn't he have some sort of a sneak thing? Yeah, some sort of a, like a healthy energy drink. Yeah, I uh, I think the way that sneak does the energy drink like does business. If you're like not like a massive streamer, it's like an affiliate program type thing. So they like they um, you know, if someone like buys an energy drink using your code or something, you like the whoever gets like a cut or whatever. I, I don't think like sneak does like like legitimate sponsorships unless you're quite big. Yeah, like like big chungus, you know, Twitch streamer level stuff. Yeah, Bannerlord's great. Yeah, Bannerlord's a fun game. I really, some I have some super fond memories of playing. <laughs> look at that! Look at that! That that thumb art right there. Look at that! Oh my god, that Demon Prince of Nurgle is so haggard looking. Look at it. <laughs> What's going on there? And then we got Uncle Fur Uncle versus a Moon Dragon and Imric on a Star Dragon. Holy shit! Uncle Fur Uncle and the Demon Prince of Nurgle, baby. This is this is great. This is what this is what this is the spice of life here, guys. Oh, oh my god, look at it. The Demon Prince of Nurgle is so cool. And you know what? He honestly might become a pick because he gives you access to fleshy abundance and a spirit leech. Does Nurgle have a new good lord? I think so. Now that he's at a 500 gold cost reduction, I would totally bring this character like all the time. Just spirit leech and and healing? Dude, that's a great combo. Yeah, hell yeah, dude. Give me that. And he's got Cloud of Flies, too. And he hits hard. Like, this Demon Prince can kill SEMs. This has been a problem for Nurgle. Like, m for many, many moons, is killing big monsters. But the Demon Prince is actually a good fighter with poison. I love it. And then we got the new ROR, which is Uncle for Uncle here. So check it out. He's there. He's uh, he's ready to party. He has Spirit Leech. He has Stream of Corruption. Ooh, I like that. So you have double Spirit Leech right out of the gates. And he has that, like, AoE damage spell. On top of that, Marauders to absorb shields, Forsaken to just fight against whatever. Not not a great choice, in my opinion. I think Marauder Great Weapons are the best choice you could bring here, but even still, dude, I, I'm exp I'm a little bit inspired to play Nurgle again. That's really, really cool seeing that. White Lines of Krace. We do have a Moon Dragon as well as Imric. And uh, yeah, Demon Prince going to be Spirit Leech again, which is a great call. And then wait for that Spirit Leech to wake off, and then Uncle for Uncle comes in and drops another Spirit Leech down. Dude, look at the Demon Prince. Look how cool he is. Oh, he jukes it! Holy shit, that was the coolest play ever! Imric went for the breath attack, and Silver Lance used the landing, and then he gets hit with that one, but it's okay. Dude, that was some Matrix stuff right there. He just descended from the skies. That was such a cool play. Oh my god, I don't know if that was intentional, how that worked, but that was really good. So Uncle Fur Uncle gets in there and drops the other Spirit Leech, right? So now you just Spirit Leech spam Imric the whole game. And there are regrowths, there are healing, but you're going to need to healing cap him eventually. Now in the back, Professor Pwn has the talents of Torcolata. High Elves, of course, do have a life caster somewhere in the bushes with a Dweller's Blow and Regrowth with the two magic items to get those heals. And now Nurgle's Pestilent Glory has uh, gotten on top of all of the objectives right there. That was a sweet dodge. Nice stream of corruption coming in from Silverlands. Off to a pretty strong start against those guys. Oh, yeah, baby. Uncle for Uncle's getting in there. Oh, yeah. The ROR big boy. And right into the White Lines of Grace with the Beast of Nurgle. Demon Prince getting hit. Imric's coming in for the kill. Professor Pwn wants vengeance. The Demon Prince better be careful. Honestly, probably running away at this point is a good call. Dragonhorn is sounded. Uncle for Uncle is attacking the White Lions. We get Plague Toads coming around the side. But if he just like throws the Demon Prince into Imric and the other dragon, it's probably GG. Um, Talons and Torcolata are imbuing extra fire weakness, if I'm not mistaken. Making it light him, lighting him on fire. And Imric then does, oh my god, so much damage. Yeah, bit of a throw with the Demon Prince. He was playing a very clean game up until that. Now, is there going to be a heal coming down? It looks like Stream of Corruption. That Demon Prince is going to be trying to escape. And if he gets away, I think Nurgle's still in the game. But if he dies, then it's going to be very precarious. So, objective. Forsaken will kill Spearman. Marauders will do well there. Toads into Silverhelms is a bit of a whatever matchup. And Nurgle is going to be grabbing the side objective as well. So, that's the scary thing about Imric, for sure. He's, he's, a, he's a beast. If you slip up against Imric at all, he can give you the dirty. And Uncle for Uncle is doing great. Look at him. He's just he's just having the time of his life. <laughs> he's just getting in there and throwing up on the white lines of Krace there. Certainly doing great. Beast of Nurgle fighting as well. Big Dragon gonna be doing it. And dude, you gotta be more you gotta get some some fleshy abundance on this boy here. You better run. Oh, the Star Dragon Breath just barely dodged once again. Talents of Torcolata imbuing that fire weakness as the Demon Prince of Nurgle. He better run, dude. He better pray. Better pray to Nurgle, because this is not looking good for him. 
Imric gets in, 1700 HP. Imric misses the attack. The melee defense of Nurgle is very high. He has 70, so he's able to mitigate some of the attacks, and now he's on the run. And if he starts crumbling, he's going to take a lot of damage. Imric, with the steel chair in the back, negative 42, this demon prince is gone. Demonic crumbling is serious. It is serious. So that is a huge setback as the prince of Kalidor defeats the mighty demon prince of uh, Nurgle. Now, honestly, Nurgle was trading pretty well in this game, but losing your big expensive demon prince is pretty rough. Uncle for uncle, absolute Chad. Getting in there and just crushing these guys and, you know, taking it like a champ. Uh-oh. He's coming for the talons of Tor Kaleida. Here he comes. I love for uncle here. He's so cool. He gets the, the big underhanded clubbing attack. Fecundity is active, but, you know, he's a strong fighter. He's very strong, but against Imric, the Lord of Dragons, and another dragon with Lord of Dragons active, Professor Pwn's showing no mercy here against the champions of Nurgle. As when Uncle for Uncle dies, that's that's going to be Nurgle dying with them. He's playing the Kalidor scheme. Yes, he is. I'm not mistaken. Yep, Uncle for Uncle gets wrecked. I mean, look, Imric is one of the scariest SEM duelists in the entire game. So you're not going to have a good time there. That is for sure. Typically against High Elves, you want to go like have a like a less impa like uh, a Rotfly Lord would be my or the Demon Prince is fine too. You just got to be very careful. Stay away from Imric. You know that's the, that's the big thing. Talons are cool, man. The combo with Emmerich is badass, and viewing the fire weakness was really, really fun to see. Hey, but I love Silver Lance's build. It was very, very cool. And look, the stream of Deluge goes down. Does about 500 damage to all these units, so Uncle for Uncle gets that. Nurgle does have a triple cap, but the value is 9,000 to 3,000, which is pretty brutal. Um, it's only a matter of time before the elves get all three objectives back, and he withdraws. Yeah, by the way, if you if you think you're, the game's over, just for the sake of like getting more people to play, just withdraw, just like that. That was perfect. Um, GG well played, man. That was a Silver Lance, that was a great game. I loved it. I loved it. You had a really good start, Silver Lance. It's just when your Demon Prince got caught, you know, it's one of those things that you can pay the troll toll. The dreaded Professor Pwn getting his W here. Unstoppable force of nature. Uh all right, yeah. Imric with 1600, Dragon with quite a bit. Uncle for Uncle got a thousand value. You know, he, he took he did pretty good. He did pretty good. That matrix dodge on from Silver Lance on the on the dra on the Demon Prince was really cool. That was so super cool. Yeah, well played to both of you guys. That was really fun. All right, so let's fire up the next game. And thank you, Silver Lance, for joining. That's Hell Pit Depth. It's a pretty fun little map. And you know, I don't know what the Temple of Usirian looks like. I don't think this is like a terribly competitive map, but it'll be very fun to try. So we're gonna do the Temple of Usirian, which I believe is one of Wacka Wacka's maps. All right. He did get the Matrix Dodge. Yeah, he did. Matrix Dodge was really cool. All right, so let's go to news. It's going to be for player one. There we go. So here it comes. Player one is going to be playing Defender the High Elves, of one. which we had last game, so we have to reroll that. We want to get different matchups. So player one is playing... So just not Nurgle or Hiles. They just can't be selected. I see the yeah, so much Zeech, but we'll let it fly. So Zeech versus... Let's see what player two is going to be getting. Okay. Corn Empire. Come on, give me the Empire, please. For the motherland. Zeech versus Kislev. Um, it's not the most fun, but I guess we'll go for it. So, Pwn, you're playing Kislev, and how are you, Bob? You're going to be playing Zeech. Ah, uh, some good coffee right there. That's the good stuff. We can also um, give each player one reroll if they want to. I'm fine with that. Like, if you wanna, if you wanna reroll, just shoot me a message in Discord and uh, and yeah, that that'll do it. So Zinch versus Kislev. I forgot to mention that. I think I said it in the turn the stream announcement, but um, you want to. Yeah, so how are you, Bob? Do you want to play? Bob, if you're in chat, you can you can let me know if you want to reroll too. Anyone can. We'll just do that from here on out. Just because we've already seen a lot of factions, so it also encourages a little bit of a variance here. This is really fun, my man. Turn, thank you for all the good work. Yeah, I'm glad you had fun. Kislev's pretty weak. They're pretty weak. Yeah, they're definitely weak, but... Pwn said he's already played a lot of Kislev, so he's going to go ahead and use his one reroll here, which I forgot to mention earlier, so my apologies. So this is for Pwn. So it can't be Kislev or the games, the factions that were played previously. Okay, so what's it gonna be? And Dark Elves. Okay, 
That's fun. We're gonna probably see some crazy memes. So Pwn, you get Dark Elves. Bob, I don't know where you are. I'm looking for Bob to see if he wants to. He's probably happy with Zinch though, I would imagine. Yeah, and if it, if it re-roll into Zinch. Bob says, I'll re-roll. Uh, you don't want to play Zinch. Okay, I see you, Bob. So we're going to re-roll for Bob too. And watch him just get the most haggard faction ever. It's happening. The, the Ogre Kingdoms. Yeah, we've had a lot of both of these factions today. We've already had like two Kislev, two Zinch games, I think, so. Yeah, green skins. Okay, it's fine. Green skins versus dark elves. Uh, actually, a decent matchup for green skins and for dark elves. So I'm always down for green skin parties. They're always really fun to watch. So you got the you got the lads. The lads are ready. You know Rackarth is coming. It's Professor Pwn. Something is coming like Rackarth or some sort of weird character. Let me see. Let me see what Lord he's already picked. Oh my. Oh my God. Oh my God. Is that what I think it is? Dark Elves versus the Wa. So I've actually played this matchup in the past two weeks. I played it in two tournaments. I played against Platypus and I played against, uh, who was it, Subutai? And the Greenskins won both games in that, in that matchup against Dark Elves. Dark Elves would usually outvalue the Greenskins, but Greenskins could just play the objective so well. <clears throat> Maneuvering around. It depends on the map. Could you do a Lord Roulette Wheel? We could do that someday. That would be like a separate stream. Goblin Great Shaman or Bust? The Goblin Great Shaman on the Wolf would be pretty funny. Donovan says he predicts the crone. <laughs> Copi Copal says the crone as well. Is that what you guys think? You think it's the crone bone? Foot Hellebron or nothing, says Samurai? Oh, man. Sleds are good, Sipe. Yeah, the Kistle Sleds are good. They're not like as broken as they were before, that's for sure. Hellebron James, I love it. That's such a funny one. Oh, my God. Hellebron on, you know, Hellebron on an altar, Rackarth on a dragon. Um, Lokir on a dragon. That's like Pwn's territory. You know, he likes that kind of stuff. The Kraken Lord of Karen Kar, yeah. That's so cool. We'll have to see what it is. Rakarth incoming. Yeah. Shaman on a spider against Dark Hill is a little too risky in my opinion. They have too many armor-piercing missiles and dragons and things like that. You're going to have a bad time. Uh, Paunch is decent. Wurzag's decent. Azag's good. Grimgore is probably a bit of a liability here, in my opinion. Um, you got a lot of good choices. Skarsnik could even be potentially viable. He's a little bit of a glass cannon, but if you rampage the, the Greenskin Lord, or the Dark Elf Lord, and drag him to his doom, you know, with a big, like, goblin shooting line with the Rusty Errors, maybe? There's some, there's some cool tech here. Six Doom Diver Catapults. So this is the Temple of Usirian. Uh, this one might have like a capturable tower or vanguard or something. I'm not sure. I haven't played it yet, but I want to see it. So we're going to load in and, and try it. So do you guys feel that like all these new maps are just like typically just way more fun and better? <laughs> I, I'm getting that. I mean, I still like it. It's an arc and a couple of them, but man, like looking at the old maps here, like I like it's a, I like arc. Arnheim has like a weird asymmetry that kind of makes it unfair, but I still like it. But aside from those three, it's just like, like crossing is bad. Death Pass is just, Death Pass is a, is a decent map. I actually like Death Pass. There's so many like, yeah, haggard ones. But yeah, like we have so many good new maps, man. Marathi is still a very good pick too. She's still good. Malekith is just very popular because he's such a raid boss. With the percentage healing change, his soul stealers are so cost effective because like the HP on Malekith is very valuable considering he's on a dragon. Logard, thanks for becoming a new member. Welcome, welcome. Yes. They added so much depth. Feels fresh. Yeah, it feels like we got like a DLC. So we haven't updated the... There's a couple maps in the map pack that for anybody who's playing with it that aren't working at the moment because um, we, had, we had to do an update to fix the capture, the objectives. Um, Wacka Wacka, has he finished them yet? Yeah, I don't think he's updated it yet. So I'm going to talk to him uh, like in the next day or two or try and get a hold of him and we'll get him to update it. And then all the maps will work at that point. The ones that currently uh, will be bugged is Celestial Lake, Dust Bowl, uh, Needle Mist Isle, and Proving Grounds. All the other ones should be fine. I haven't done Geothermal Crevice yet. That would be kind of an interesting one to check. I've never seen Temple of Usirian. I have no idea what this map looks like. Yeah, dude, if you guys want to make maps, we will add them. And you will see your map played on stream and played in tournaments if it's like a good competitive map. Even, like, even if it's a little bit more casual, you'll still see it on like streams like this. Like you, you'll get to you'll get to get your map out there. 
I know, Medley. I wish to. I wish to. But it'll it'll happen. Don't worry. And once it gets updated, uh, you'll be all set. It probably won't take him long to do it. If he's busy or something, you know, I'll I'll, I'll make sure it happens. You know, if he, we'll, we'll we'll get it. We'll get it taken care of. Yeah, which is great. Trying to get Creative Assembly to add them to the actual game. I've sent a couple of messages about it. Um, I'm going to try and have a meeting with with some of the the, the people. When you do the YouTube uh, and work with CA, there's like a point person you can kind of talk to. So I'm going to try and set up a meeting to see if we can make that happen. You know, we just send them the map pack and then if they could just add the files in after we vet them and test them, it's like, that's a win-win for everyone. It saves their guys time and effort and it makes it so we don't have to download mods. Not that it's that hard. It's really not, but um, yeah. Do I have the Indominus box? No, I don't. Um, I, I I have so Silver Lance. I have a full Death Guard army. I have multiples of every single model. I never I could play Death Guard until the end of time, and I, I'm never gonna have to buy another model again, which is great. That's the thing. Like Warhammer Tabletop is really expensive to get into, but once you finish your army, as long as like you're satisfied with that army and you don't get the the craving for more, which is the hard part to resist, like. I actually think it's cheaper than like magic and things like that. Like with magic, the gathering, when I was actively playing every single Friday night for a full year, right? I was, I was playing at Friday night magic and buying singles for my commander decks. So it wasn't as much in burst as like buying a Warhammer army, but like I haven't spent money on Warhammer tabletop on my death guard army in years and it's still fully functional, right? Which is cool. It's the crone. Yeah, it's the crone. So this is the Temple of Usirian here. Wow, this is actually, this is a cool map. Let's take a look at this. Is there, okay, this map's competitively playable. So when Wacka Wacka submitted his map pack, he didn't submit this one because he said it wasn't like a competitive map. I'm trying to see why not. You move up, you have these two objectives. There's some line of sight blocking and pillars and things, but like, yeah, this map is beautiful, dude. It's a great one, man. He should have submitted this one to the map making contest. It's a really nice one. I still remember when you made Commander. When I oh my god, those videos, Zachary Jesus, those are those are from like ten years ago. Yeah. All right, so taking a look here at the build of how are you, Bob? It's got to be Wurzag, Wurzag. It's got Doom Diver catapults, which will be very good on the Temple of Usirian, and he does also have Arachnox spiders, Savage Orcs, Orc boys, Orc air boys, and some skirmishers. So a very standard green skin army, kind of mixed forces. And for the Dreadlord Professor Pone, oh my god. Oh my god, look at this monstrosity of a build. Oh no. Look at that. It is a massive, massive core of just witch elves. Backed up by a blood rack Medusa, a sorceress of dark magic, and crone Hellebron on the manticore. Jeez, this build's so haggard. I love it. Oh, this map is not smaller than Crucible. It's not smaller than Itza. It's about the same size as those maps, so I think it would be fine. And we'd have to test it out. I still have the old player name up. All right, let me go ahead and fix that. So uh, we will put Bob. Thank you so much. Despite drinking the coffee, I'm still not fully fully there yet. Yeah, and Bob's name needs to be a little bit more powerful. Dude, Pwn coming with like a full... I don't know how that's going to work. I mean, there's a chance he could tear out and rush through the Greenskin army. Yeah. <laughs> you guys like this build? <laughs> Yeah, it's the it's the it's the full uh, scantily clad scantily clad build here. So which elves going to be charging out? Sisters of Singing Doom do cause terror as well, which is pretty cool. So against greenskins, that's very very impactful. Crone Hellebron's going to be using the uh, Cursed Blade as well as the uh, the Fury, the Gaze of not Gaze of Cain, yeah, Gaze of Cain to just sauce up the witch elves. He also has the Medusa in there, the Bloodrack Medusa for another source of terror. And the greenskins, I don't know how this is going to go, man. Like this build from Pwn is so strange. Savage Orcs will do a ton of damage back, though. They're, they're pretty fighty boys. They have really, for their price point, they hit very, very hard. Which else do you have the Rampage? You thought the Iron Maidens are coming? Yeah. No kidding. Is that, look at that little Dust Devil there. Isn't that cool? Is that actually going to do damage? Hold on, I have to watch this. Wouldn't it be funny if there was, like, randomly generated... Oh, wouldn't that be wild to get, like, a map where you have, like, Dust Devils and, like, random Storm Elements crashing down, like, com like Comets, like, Warpstone Comets that do damage... It wouldn't be fair for a competitive, but for like a ridiculous event, that would be really funny. But although it'd feel pretty bad to lose because a random comment just like crushed your value piece, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that'd be really funny. <clears throat> All right, so shooting in, Dark Rider Peter Crossbow's getting in. Pwn gets the charge with the Dark Riders into How Are You, Bob? 
the Forest Goblins, and Pwn has won two games, right? How many games has he won? Not he. I'm not counting the Flying Taco one because that was obviously uh, I think I think he's won two games. Am I wrong? Can't quite remember. Which elves are hanging out? Medusa, Sorceress of Dark Magic. Soul Stealer isn't as good here. I think Lore of Fire might be better because um, Soul Stealer is more about the healing. I mean, it still does decent AOE damage. You guys get the picture. So, objectives have opened up. Um, as far as the top objective goes, uh, so we got the two, and then the one down here, which is going to be controlled by the Savage Orcs. It looks like Professor Pwn is just going to get in there and just charge. I don't think he cares. I don't think he cares. The Blood Rack Medusa probably just have it shoot at the Arachnox Spider the whole game with its armor piercing. It's probably what I would do. Sorcerers with Dark Magic get some punishing blobs on all those bad boys, and we'll have to find out. Dark Rider, Repeater Crossbows, also just sit those on the Arachnox Spider. That's going to be your best friend. And it looks like Pwn is going to go for the central push, so he's going to consolidate all his forces, but hopefully for his sake he doesn't forget about his Manticore and his caster. Uh, otherwise, the you know the Witch Elves aren't going to hold up terribly long on their own, that is for sure. Yeah, the only thing about this map is it's a little bit choke heavy. That's the one thing for competitive, is you have a big choke point here and here. Um, you know, choke points are fine, but these ones are pretty stark, so I can see the issue with this, I suppose, but it looks really good. Maybe that's why he didn't submit it. So Sisters of Singing Doom into Savage Orcs. Let's see how this fight goes. Did they get the charge off? Did Pwn issue the charge order, or is it... Okay, kind of looks like he did. It was a weird one. I mean, Sisters should win that. Witch Elves getting in there. We need a fat Gaze of Cain right now. So Pwn's coming. Gaze of Cain on these two Witch Elves here is going to be super clutch. And one Witch Elf sneaks through the back line, looking to get us around. We also get some Witch Elf sneaking around here. Uh-oh. Oh, nice Brain Busta coming in there from Warzag. And the Repeater Crossbow shooting into the Spider is very cost-effective. And the Harpies in the backfield are going to be jumping onto the Orc Air Boys. Sisters of Singing Doom taking quite a bit of damage. Manticore, or excuse me, Bloodrack Medusa shooting in. But you can see the Orc Boys kind of getting crumped. in the Gaze of Cain, the whole army here, 72 melee attack. Talk about a buzzsaw unit. They're going to be able to cause some serious problems. Crone Hellebron needs to get in there and dunk on these guys, that's for sure. The Manticore is running away a little bit. Crows of Cain shutting down the Orc Air Boys, and they're very, very tough to remove unit. And the Sisters of Singing Doom dominating the Savage Orcs, to be expected. They are a pretty extensive ROR unit, and look at that, Crone Hellebron going for the dunk! Heroic killing blow after Wurzag. Uh-oh, Wurzag's on foot! Oh, that's that's scary. He probably has Effigy of the Git, so he could snare down Crone Hellebron and lock her in place a little bit, but the Crone Bone, uh-oh. Uh-oh, those ladies are coming for you. Nice foot of Gork! Beautiful! Oh my god, that foot of Gork by How Are You, Bob, was so good. So good and tasty. But now, Wurzag has been rampaged, and Crone Hellebron James is just going to get in there and just do a 360 dunk on this guy. There they go. But he, fortunately for him, he broke. Professor Pwn's going to keep jumping there. Greenskin leadership not holding up well. Has Pwn captured the home objective here? Dude, that foot of Gork kept the Greenskins of the game straight up. Without that foot of Gork, I think it was probably GG. So the Orcs are getting absolutely dominated by these ladies. Crows of Cain jumping into the backfield. Doom Diver Catapult's getting shut down. Black Orcs coming in, which is a good choice. There's not a lot of armor piercing for Professor Pwn's build. Wurzak's in trouble. That's a really good soul sealer, actually. That's going to hit Wurzak, going to hit spiders. We'll also hit the infantry trying to fight here. And Professor Pwn's build is... It's getting there, man. And look at this. With Wurzak dying, Greenskins are in Skaven are two factions that if you lose your lord, that is just going to be so incredibly bad. Oh, my God. So in the meantime, Witch Elves moving up. Here they go. Greenskin's forced back. Professor Pwn pulls massively ahead in value, and I think he's in a pretty comfortable position. The Black Orcs could be able to push back for sure. On the low ground, oh yeah, look at this. So on the low ground, we get the Sisters of Slaughter. The the big, these, these are the serious ladies, and uh, they they will take some damage from Squig Herds, but they do have Coldwind Knights coming in to help them. I think they'll still beat Squig Herds. They're, they're a pretty resilient unit. They have 58 melee defense, so we'll have to see what happens there. So Squigs do pile in, attack them. Big damage on impact, but as soon as they're able to get up and pile in, I think those squeaks could be in some danger. Now, up on the high ground, Professor Pwn has stolen the home objective. Black Orcs are a bit of a problem to deal with, like I said. We have the Blood Rack Medusa over here shooting its Medusa laser beams uh, into God knows what. Spider routed, actually, so it looks like the... Oh! Professor Pwn brought the Raven's Heralds and was using them to kill the Arachnorok Spider here. That's really, really cool. So there are the Repeater Crossbows and the Raven's Heralds and the Medusa. Continuing to do well. And the Crows of Cain have just been such a disruption piece this entire game. Gaze of Cain going down. And uh, the Manticore, I mean, Black Orcs are resilient against Witch Elves, but, you know. Hellebron James herself with the Cursed Blade here. Going to be doing some nice damage. You can see they're taking a Mortis Engine effect. So she has a conditional Mortis Engine on her. A lot of people forget that. And, you know, Dark Elves have such a hard-on for the Corsair skirmishing playstyle. It's kind of refreshing to see uh, a melee-focused Dark Elf build actually do pretty well. 
Now down here, Sisters of Slaughter grab the point. We do also get the Cold One Knights. I think that's going to be a very secure double cap. And like I said, all these Greenskins, look at their leadership right now. Negative 10 for their Lord having died, which is just brutal. So um, that negative 10 on an already low leadership roster is pretty brutal. How is the Medusa done? Medusa's only got 400 value. It's pretty janky. It's usually just better to send it in a melee. Look, it's like shooting the ground. It, it needs it needs to have some adjustments to it. It's like shooting arcs, I think. So Crone Helebron is here. She's on her Manscore, continuing to do glorious, glorious battle. We'll have to see how this unfolds. Yep, getting a nice little route right there. And the thing is, all these guys are moving into a Mortis Engine and into a Soul Stealer. Dude, Crone Helebron, man. She's up to 2,500 value. The Crone Bone is no joke today. Look at her maneuvering around and just causing all these issues, which is just amazing. Repeater crossbows continue to shoot into the Savage Orcs here. As Crone Helebron pulls back at this point. And the Crows of Cain just rampaging in the backfield. Absolutely rampaging as the repeater crossbows uh, saturate into the Savage Orcs. Squig Herd's moving up, looking for fights, but obviously... I don't think the orcs can muster anything that's going to be strong enough to take this low ground objective from the elite sisters and the cold one knights. Looks like we got some savage orc biggins here. This is a mistake for Pwn to charge in here for sure, but looks like he maybe just thinks they're regular orc boys. Sisters of Slaughter will probably um, do well enough against them that you could rear charge them with cold one knights and shut them down. But again, big valley lead with Warzag being dead. I think that the crone zone is upon us. Crows of Cain, dude, these things are just pumping it up, man. Look at the value on them, almost 1,200. All the greenskin archers and artillery positions are just getting heavily compromised. Savage Orc Boar Boy's coming out, um, but the Savage Orc boss is down for the count. Repeater Crossbow should be able to kite them. Crown Hellebron can get in there and fight, and the Medusa does tear out off those Savage Orcs. In the meantime, in the backfield, we get a little bit of pressure. Squig Hurt's trying to get here. Um, Witch Elves can come in and rampage them and probably kill them, though. Witch Elves have very good DPS, 44 with 58 melee attack. It is pretty incredible. Good usage of Harpies. Harpies going to move in there, and they will shut down those Squig Herds for sure. Meanwhile, over here, Crone Helebron juking about. Her Mortis Engine uh, appears to be perpetually active. Amulet of Dark Fire. And, uh, oh, that's the Blood Frenzy. Oh, that's right. So Crone has a scaling damage buff. Yeah, look at that. So the longer she's in combat, she gets, like, a buff. That's pretty cool. It's kind of counterintuitive, though, because she's, like, uh, very squishy. So keeping her in combat is, is, like, hard to make it work. But even still... She's gotten a fair amount of value this game, about 2,500. This is probably going to be GG. I don't see a way for the Greenskins to make it back. Although Professor Pwn did just blunder pretty badly with those Cold One Knights, having them fight into Savage Orcs. Sisters of Slaughter down here. Um, going to be trying to hold it. It's going to be hard. Savage Orc Biggins are no joke. They, they hit super hard. And also there's some pigs. Savage Orc Boar Boys. He, so he's going for a Savage Orc style, which I love. Could the Greenskins get back in this game with some blunders? We'll have to see. Here comes the Wog, getting a beautiful charge into the Sisters of Slaughter. That's going to hurt. Those ladies, uh, 59 melee defense holds up well. They're trading back damage a little bit. Dark Riders are nearby, but the Wah's going to be taking over the low ground objective. And the Wah has actually taken over the high ground objective. Is there some weird glimmer of hope for the Greenskins here? I don't think so. I feel like the game is mostly over, but oh, man, I mean, maybe. Maybe Medusas are bad enough that they're not going to be able to do it. Because the Wah's is, is taking ground again. They got the low ground objective. That's going to give them a double cap. Professor Pwn definitely taking a, a rough trade down here as the Savage Orcs pile into the cav units. Goblin's going to be chasing down the repeater crossbows to screen them out, which is a good choice. Raven's Herald's kind of getting popped in the face. Value lead is about 3,700, though, which is pretty substantial. And I feel like it's going to be tough for the Crone Bone to effectively... Uh, or for the Greenskins to kill the Crone Bone, unless she really blunders and dives into, like, Broken Tusk Mob or, like, some Rusty Error Fire or something like that. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. So on the backside, we get more Sisters of Singing Doom coming out. So it looks like they've been refreshed and are returning to the battle, uh, rekindled and ready to party. Down on the low ground, it looks like this. Whoa, my God. Those Sisters of Slaughter are still going and winning, kind of. Man, they are such a durable unit. And you forget about it because every Dark Elf competitive player typically just uses like you know, Scourge Runners, Repeater Crossbows, you, and, uh, you know, Handbows and Corsairs and Malekith, like, that they have some they have some staying power. Those those ladies fought hard. I mean, they stayed long enough for Pwn to maybe even get this objective back. Though it looks like his repeater crossbows and melee is a little bit Bronzodia, but we'll see if he's able to kind of escape that now. Here at the back, Crows of Cain uh, could just dive onto the Rusty Arrows again if they want to. Pwn is two-capped, guys. The Greenskins are catching up in points. How are you, Bob, is doing it? He's getting back in the game. Dark Elves having to kind of figure out their path and how they want to get this. What I would do if I were in Pwn's position is I would take the Crone down here and have her secure the bottom objective, forcing the Greenskins to overextend here, at which point you have the reinforcement advantage. There's certainly a lot of tactics in that regard. But the Wah is able to hold on to the bottom objective. They do have some reinforcements coming in as well. Big Soul Stealer is going to be hitting the Goblins and Savage Orcs. 
we'll be okay. Um, the value on this lady, how much has she gotten? Only, you see, it doesn't do that much damage. It's more about the healing on Soul Stealer, really. Um, you'll see, it barely does anything. Yeah, the damage is actually pretty pitiful. But why it's good on Malekith is because it heals him for 12% of his HPs, which on a dragon is a ton of healing. Whereas, like, Lore of Fire could have just, like, cooked all those goblins, like, using, like, a burning head or, like, something like that. Very scrappy play. The Waz not giving up. Professor Pwn's going to have to get aggressive here because he's going to fall behind on points. And, yeah, it looks like he is. So Professor Pwn is pulling the trigger on the low ground. He's deciding to use the Witch Elves and, and put some aggression down here, which I think is smart. And Crone Hellebron has gotten the message. So she's pulled over. Harpies can basically jump on squigs. They are infantry size, so squigs actually hurt them. But even still, if they get the jump on the squig, it's not bad. Witch Elves going to be cutting through these Savage Orcs and, and just mulching through these goblins. Witch Elves are definitely a lawnmower unit. And uh, the Rampaging effect is very good. I mean, in Warhammer 2, Rampage was a little bit more pertinent. And it was able to get a lot, a lot of games won. But they move through. Repeater Crossbow sitting back. Another unit of Witch Elves is up. So the double Witch Elf from the low ground. Greenskins are going to be passing the Dark Elves and points very, very soon. And the game's getting a little bit tight. Looks like some more Savage Orcs are coming down here. It's kind of a standoff up here. I think Pwn has too much guarding this objective. I think he needs to take the Sisters of Singing Doom down here to guarantee he gets this. Because right now they're they're really chilling. Or push up. I don't hate that idea either. Like, yeah, like a mobilized push. Because he has a big terror-causing Lord. And the Greenskins lost their Lord, right? So there's there's... There's a big advantage that Pwn has. Is he has this presence that can just like route things. So Savage Orcs are on their way down. Um, still a big value lead, but it has been narrowed by about 700 points. It's just about 3,000 now. It was almost 4,000 before. So the Greenskins have been trading back a little bit. But still, going to be very, very tough. Greenskins do take the point lead, but the Dark Elves do resecure the objective. Now it's going to be uh, on the wall to get this back. And they really don't have much, right? The Greenskins had to pull a lot to get that low ground objective. So now they're going to be using the, uh, you know, what little scraps they have here. A couple beat up Black Orcs and different units. They have any reinforcements coming in. Doesn't look like it. Obviously, the points for How Are You, Bob, are going to be very stretched thin. Since the, the point deficit is so substantial, it's going to look that way. And the Dark Elves are going to get a triple cap. So Professor Pwn coming in with the, the Sword of Cain and is going to be probably sealing the deal here. That is for sure. On the other side, Crone Hellebron, Dark Riders, and the Witch Elves with the Gaze of Cain. Able to continue buzzsawing, doing a great job, and this is uh, this is great. This is a really fun. I actually like this map a lot. That was very cool. To do some testing on it, play some games, and uh, beautiful game by Pwn. And how are you, Bob? Bob, you know, lost his lord early, but he showed that he is a scrappy git. He came back in here. He almost got back in the game despite a massive value deficit. But again, having a big terror causing lord and your lord being dead is very very tough. So GG, well played to those two players. It was very fun. I think that's game though. Uh, I think it's official. We can call it now as we see the Sisters of Singing Doom continuing to buzzsaw through things. And what a cool build. Yeah, Professor Pwn plays really fun builds. He's really he's a really fun guy to play with. Um, and he's a good player too. You know, he plays meme builds and he's he's, he's also very fun to play with. Yeah, it's great. Um, we'll have some head-to-head -head campaigns coming up. He's, he's, he's my head-to-head -head, uh, campaign guy. We, we played a head-to-head -head campaign on our own recently where he, uh, he, he pretty much, we, we still have it going, but he's basically won it. It was his Mike Kislev versus his uh, Grimgore. He basically confederated the entire like Eastern Eastern world, and then just like, I mean, I'm still alive in it, but unfortunately the patch screwed it up. But um, yeah, so we'll be doing some more head to head soon. It'll be really fun. Peter Crossbow sh shooting into the goblins and uh, Harpies, Orc Arrow Boys doing their thing. We do also have the Witch Elves pushing and some Squig Herds desperately trying to get to the objective. But the dreaded Medusa is here. Check it out. The Medusa is on, and it has claimed victory. Wow, we got a full rush from the uh, from the old uh, <laughs> from the Dark Elves. A, a, a Witch Elf rush with Sisters follow up. How cool is that? How cool is that? Crone got three thousand value, which makes sense. Which makes sense. Some of the Witch Elves, yeah, some of them did decent. Poor Wurzag needed to be on a mount. Professor Pwn says, hashtag girl power. Yeah, apparently so. Pwn, how many games have you won, by the way? Was that your third win or second? I can't remember. Awesome game. Really awesome game. That was super fun. Uh, the Medusa's damage, uh, I don't think it was that much. It was like 800. Yeah. It just kind of sat there shooting and missing most of his, most of his attacks. Pwn, how, how much value did the Medusa have? You could let me know. He, he probably looked. All right. So let's do the... Um, we got Freddy here. All right. Very cool. And for the next map, we'll do the Glade of the Everqueen. Kane is pleased. Yeah, Pwn, was that your second or third one? I lost track. Hey, how are you, Bob? You played very well. Three, if you count. Okay, so it'd be two then. Uh, so, Bob, 
a couple things against Dark Elves. I would highly recommend, if Wurzag's a good choice, but you need him on a mount. Dark Elves have pretty good gooning characters, so put Wurzag on his pig. It, like In that game, Bob, if you, if you don't lose, if you didn't lose Wurzag and he survived, that game's very even. It's very even. Like, you could have won it. But Pwn, you know, did a good job hunting Wurzag, and, you know, you paid the troll toll for that, so. All right, so this one is going to be for player one. Yeah, and the spider isn't good against Dark Elves either. You want to just go wider. All right. Ogre! Oh, the Ogre yes. Kingdoms. Yes. All right. Let's do it. Let's see what's going on here. And... Ogre Kingdoms versus Wood Elves is actually a very fun mashup. Okay. So, Pwn, you're on Wood Elves. And, um... And, Freddy, you're going to be on the Ogre Kingdoms. <laughs> yes, dude. The Ogre Kingdoms. Yes. Unleash it, brother. Unleash it. Hey, thank you guys for becoming members. I really do appreciate that. The Dukes of Haggard grow in numbers. I see many green names in chat. It's always good to see it. It's greasing time, baby. Let's grease up them wheels and get going. I was looking for more Photogorics, but no words like I know. Dude, you, Bob, Bob, you are a good player, bro. I, I'm very impressed. If that's your second time playing like multiplayer tournament type stuff, you're a great player, dude. You have really strong fundamentals. If you just tighten up your build a little bit, you could have competed and potentially won. So don't give up, man. Keep plugging away. If you ever have any questions about multiplayer, um, I don't always respond super quickly. Uh, but shoot me a message in Discord. And if you have questions about builds and matchups, hit me up, dude. Hit me up. 100%. Uh, I don't know who's the advantage here. Um, yeah, Ogres are better this patch. No, they're much better this patch. There's a couple players who use them at the high level, actually. Okay, one sec here. Sure. You can... He says, I never played Ogres, but I'll try it. <laughs> okay. Cool. So just responding to him. Very good. So Freddy said he's never played Ogres, but he's gonna play them. He wants to play the Ogre Kingdoms for you, which is truly honorable. So Professor Pwn will probably do something fun. You know, intense keyboard noises, yeah. He was, he was, asking, he was asking about Ogres. So I was just giving him some tips. <laughs> like, this is how you beat Professor Pwn. No, I'm just kidding, well, that would be pretty funny. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. All right, very cool. Outstanding. Now is the time. So I can tell you guys, I played this matchup against Xyphos the other day. Um, Xyphos is probably considered to be one of the best Woodall players in the entire world. We practiced this matchup. Um, the first time we played it, I brought an Ogre build that got absolutely smashed. Um, but the, sec the second game... I played later after updating my build, I actually was able to compete with Wood Elves. It was against, yeah. So like Ogres, here's what you do. You max, you play max Noblar Shields. You get two Noblar Trappers. You get one Iron Blaster to shoot the Wild Riders and Glade Riders. You get two Noblar Scrap Launchers to hit the Archers. You, and then you summon in Ogre Iron Fists, a Slaughter Master and Saber Tusks to hunt down their Archers. So you do that. And you can also mix in one Lead Belcher as well. Cause like, the shielded Noblars, like Eternal Guard won't kill them quickly, and Iron Fist Ogres will counter Dryads pretty well, and they'll also counter Eternal Guard if they're stacked on top of Noblars. Um, and then you you have the Iron Blaster shoot the Wild Riders and Glade Riders, the Scrap Launcher shoot the Archers. Uh, Noblar Trappers are just like a utility piece to block things up and get a little bit of extra DPS. Yeah. Hey, it's Intensity. How you doing, man? We're we're just we're towards the later end of our King of the Hill. So, did I forget to update Pwn score again? I can't remember. 
that's a brainy build turn. It works okay. It's still Wood Elf favored, but I think like the fact that I was able to kind of have a close game against Xyphos with it was like, and he's one of the best Wood Elf players in the world was good. Like and that was with Ogres, but this was on a big map. Um, this was on a map where the 54 speed for the Ogres is pretty pertinent. Yeah, Noblars are supposed to be meat shields. Like, let me let me look at the Ogre build real quick. He said he's never played Ogres before, so... Yeah, I like... I, I, I like that build for the Ogres. Um, I definitely don't hate it. Yeah, it looks good. Let me see here. And... Uh, Yeah. Cool. So just giving him some tips. He seems like he might be a little bit newer on the Ogre Kingdom, so I'm, I'm trying to, like, give him some pointers just so it's, like... Because otherwise, Wood Elves will just massacre him. Pwn's a pretty good Wood Elf player, so... <laughs> oh, wise Anticity of the meta. Who <laughs> is the best lord? Yeah, he's here. And I think Anticity was streaming today. Yeah. Big Bird is up there for sure. Absolutely. What were you streaming today? You were doing um, a Carrick Apex Rush. Was it a head-to-head -head campaign, like you versus someone else? To see who can get there quicker, or was it like you doing a solo Carrick Eight Peaks to see how fast you can get there, like a speed run thing? Yeah, I saw your stream. I was watch I tuned in for a little bit, but then I, I had my uh, my stream start, so had to had to get on that and jam. Yeah, the ogres the ogres have some chances against Wood Elves. It's not impossible. Now that they have a lot of capture weight, like ogres can overwhelm points pretty quickly. If you get like three or four bulls, like 54 speed maneuvering between points on a it's a type map or like this, they can be like suddenly they got your Mr. Steal your objective, you know? Yeah, if ogres got more chaff, that would be the direction. You, if you gave them more like Noblar type units, like I think that would be really nice. So it was both playing solo. Got it. <laughs> Petition to introduce Anticity as a legendary lord. Yeah, if you, if you int introduced him as a legendary lord, it would probably have to be like a vampire coast character. What would what would your kit be? So Anticity, if you got added to the game as a lord, what would your what would your abilities be? Like what would your uh you're on Vampire Coast. And and you gotta balance yourself. Don't make yourself egregiously OP, but you can make yourself like an a, a top tier lord. But let's like what's like a reasonable style you would want yourself to be? I already have an idea for myself. If I were if I got to be a lord, I'd want to be like a, a, an empire an empire uh master engineer who has a, a war wagon mount and can just ride around <laughs> that would just with a mullet waving in the wind and like aviators yeah it'd be perfect what would your real uh you'd have to ask me for the reroll a vampire pirate ogre oh anticity would would you ride a scurvy dog around the battlefield just like a vampire lord riding a giant oversized scurvy dog yeah, Pwn brought a very good build against the Ogres, but the Ogre build is actually pretty good. He, I gave him some pointers, although he brought the wrong Slaughter Master. I told him to bring healing, but, you know, if he wants to go Beasts, good on him. Yeah. Anticity riding like a scurvy dog. Just like this, like, really fast character, like, dual-wielding pistols riding a scurvy dog. <laughs> just in your backfield, just, like, sniping things. That would be pretty great. That would be really fun. It's all good. Yeah, slam in the back of your Dragula. Yes, it would be a Rob, Rob Zombie song. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So here's here's the thing about the matchup. Iron Blasters, having a single Iron Blaster against Wood Elves is pretty good. It's not good against Archers and Eternal Guard, but you can put pressure on characters. And more importantly, you can shoot cavalry and things like that. A dog mount for a bloated corpse. Oh my god. Imagine if Vampire Coast could have bloated corpses that rode, rode uh, scurvy dogs. Like... And they just like dive into your expensive units with like 90 speed. Oh my god. That would be so funny. <laughs> Turn an Arawar Hellstrom rocket battery with the hell. So the Empire, to make them top tier, if you gave the Empire an Arawar war wagon with mounted Hellstrom rocket, with mounted uh, Hellstrom rocket batteries that could fire while moving, <laughs> just like. And turn 360, it has like, like an anti air like platform that can like spin and shoot. Oh my god, I would have a full chub. They would probably still lose to Warriors of Chaos somehow, even with that. Anyways, let's talk business, guys. So, we got uh, Noblars. Iron Blaster to shoot at, like, you know, uh, Cavalry. Noblar Scrap Launcher to shoot at Archers. 
And the, some lead belchers do have 200 range, so they can outrange things like uh, Glade Guard and actually put some hurt on them and any number of things. He brought Iron Fist, which is a good choice, obviously shields, and a couple Nobler Trappers in the bushes, which is going to be pretty good. So that appears, appears to be it for the old Ogre army. Now, taking a look at ye old um, Eternal Guard. It's going to be Eternal Guard moving up. Backed up by more Eternal Guard. Surprisingly very good against Ogres, not surprisingly. Uh, Glade Guard Hagvein Tips. Amazing. Ogres are typically pretty light armored. Iron Guts, you know, are tanky-ish, but still, you know, basic Hagbane tips can drag them down. It's always not. Mixing in Starfire Shafts is a good idea. Although Pwn didn't go full sweat, I guess. He didn't bring the Sisters of Twilight, I think, which are a little bit better because they can just sit on the Ogre Lord the whole game and eventually kill him. But, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool indeed. Yeah, Balthazar Gelt needs, like, an update on his gear. Like, his staff is so terrible. Oh, my God! Look at the Scrap Launcher! See, this, I told I told them to bring two Scrap Launchers in his build. I was like, bring two. You're not going to hate it. And against Wood Elf, look at the damage. Like, that Scrap Launcher and that Iron Blast are doing some work here. So let's see if he can continue to get value. As the Ogres got their Noblars screening up on the point, they got Saber Tusks working on the side. So Freddy's hanging out on the wings. The Glady is back, and she's very good. The Glady's nasty. If you pray of an Othrame of the Ogre Lord and just, like, shoot him with all those archers, he's pretty much dead. He's pretty much dead for sure. So the Haggard Flock of Doom... The overcasted flock of doom from downtown. He's gonna really regret not bringing a troll guts when like one of his high value pieces gets shot. He's gonna he's gonna feel the pain. But the ogres have a bit of an alpha strike waiting in the bushes. They have like this big saber tusk iron fist thing that's probably gonna collapse on the flank of the wood elves. Ogre's obviously gonna get pushed back here. And uh, once again, the scrap launcher is doing some good work. Nice stuff. Hagbane tips getting pounded. And you know, honestly, now that I'm seeing this, I'm like, okay, maybe triple scrap launcher is gonna be good here. Iron Blaster also shooting downtown and doing a little bit of work into the uh, Starfire Shafts in the back. Not quite as good at killing those type of units. Probably put the Iron Blaster on the Glade Lord and just like force your opponent to micro. And on the side, we do get a fight between Lost Sylvan Knights and some Noblars, which is fine. And now the Ogres are coming out in numbers. Saber Tusk Packs looking to maneuver around the back, so Freddy's coming for blood. And if those Saber Tusk Packs can get into the Wood Elf back line, that would just be brutal. Um, Pwn has like 600 saved up for some Glade Riders, but oh man, the my going to the back of the map i'm hitting this giant tower so it's like zooming me out but this is a really nice play by Freddy. Uh, freddy he's gonna move in he's gonna get some archers most likely uh pwn turns about face gets his archer shooting into the saber tusks lost sylvan knights Ooh, nice nice prey of an othraman by pwn that was very very good that was great uh platypus says what must i do to join the fight um platypus all you have to do is download the map pack and uh just it's first come first serve we're towards the tail end of the stream but i'll be doing these more often but anyone's welcome to join it's just first come first serve in the lobby so that's how it goes. Now, Blood Belcher is still shooting back here. Looks like more Noblar Trappers are coming up. Value trading's pretty even, actually. So that's a good sign for the Ogres if they can trade evenly with the hard wood. But the Ogres are going to be throwing their Lord a little bit here. He does get popped in the face, and we get more Saber Tusk packs coming out. As Noblar Trappers actually trade reasonably well, but unfortunately he brought a pretty haggard Lord of Magic against the Wood Elves. Flock of Doom is not particularly a good spell. It's okay. You know, it, it had its day, but, you know. Tro Lord of the Great Maw is actually very good. Like, Troll Guts is an amazing spell, and, uh, you know, Toothcracker, the, the one that gives you some of the, uh, the armor and missile resist isn't bad in the Wood Elf matchup. And a lot of Ogre Bulls piling into the Lost Sylvan Knights. A little bit of a Bronzodia blob. He's got, like, he should take two of the Ogres, go smash them, send Trappers into melee with these guys. But again, you know, Freddy said he's never played the Ogres before, so this is his first time learning them, and it's against a good opponent on stream here. So, shout out to Freddy for trading evenly with Pwn in terms of value. That's very, very good, despite losing the objectives here. So Iron Blaster and Ye old Noblar Scrap Launcher still generating good value. Noblar Trapper's moving up, and we see Archers on the flank kind of getting chewed on. So Freddy's getting in there, and uh, he's certainly chewing on these Archers. They are on the run. Pwn's Archer is very bunched up. If there ever was a time for Flock of Doom, it would be right here. That would be one of the better spots. Noblar Trappers are actually a very good unit. They're incredibly underrated. Their DPS at a range is actually pretty good, and they are surprisingly difficult to remove in my experience. And now we got the Ogres tied into the spears here this is going to be bad uh oh professor pone getting the christmas charge it's going to be delivering saint nick's gifts early here as uh if he charges into the back of these iron fists that's going to be a mass route and that would just be super strong but you can see the new and improved capture weight here right ogre bulls with iron fists are just absolute absolute beasts with capture weight but they're fighting spears and sylvan knights both of which are bad trades pone decides to deliver the christmas gifts over here into the nobler trappers not a bad idea they're still 400 value units but freddy's getting real aggressive man freddy's getting into the archer line he's got trappers here in the backfield he's got uh saber tusks on the glade lord a nice flock of doom here by freddy his lead belters are still continuing to shoot honestly really clean trading despite being behind on points he's not doing bad at all for somebody who's never played ogres before this is very very impressive 
Is it possible to play this map as normal player and multiplayer? Uh, you would need to download the mod and play with your friends. But honestly, there's been a lot of people I've seen who've just had the mod downloaded and are making lobbies, so you could probably get a game. And also, if you join my Discord, go to Total Tavern and join the Discord in the top, you can find people to play with there. Just say, hey, I'm new, want to play some games and looking to practice. And uh, just tell them you want to use the map pack, which is going to be standard for tournaments going forward, at least for me. And uh, yeah, you can do it. It's totally up to the tournament host, whatever maps they want to use. So every tournament host will use different maps and, you know, it'll be fun. We have so many awesome tournament hosts. It's amazing. Shout out to Platypus in chat for hosting the beginner tournaments. A, a true, a true hero. So Slaughter Master of Beasts. Moving up onto the point. Ogres getting into Wild Riders. Again, value trading is very, very even. Freddy might be able to resecure his back objective here as these Saber Tusks are really feasting. Like, Pwn's formation is falling apart a little bit. Like, some of the Saber Tusk packs are starting to just get loose and just hog wild. And the, the Slaughter Master of the Great Maw is getting in there with his peg leg. And I bet you the Scrap Launcher's got good value. Yeah, 900 value. And the Iron Blaster is only about 500, but still not terrible. Iron Blasters they are really good against cavalry. You want to be shooting into Wild Riders, like 100%, because you'll get a lot of value. If the Iron Blaster had been set to shoot against Lost Sylvan Knights, it would have already gotten like 1,500 value or only things like that. So, highly recommend it. Knobbler Scrap Launcher is doing their thing. More Ogre Bulls coming out from the spawn. Really important for Ogres to do your housekeeping. You have a lot of units. You want to be unsummoning them when they kind of route. Uh, obviously, so you can get that Bulls on Parade type thing going. Flock of Doom going down once again. Do a little bit of damage. And the Ogres recapture their home objective. So, suddenly... Our boy Freddy is, uh, you know, in this relatively tight game here, but this is where it becomes scary. If he had had a Troll Guts character, this thing would be, like, close to full health, and it wouldn't even be an issue right now. But, oh, okay, he's got Butcher. Check that out. He uses the Butcher ability. That's a fat heal. Butcher is an insane amount of health. And it looks like there's a Great Eagle. I really like that pick from Professor Poem. Going to be moving in. Saber Tusk packs moving across, attacking the Great Eagle. Now going to be hustling across the battlefield here. And we do see Wild Riders as well as Eternal Guard cleaning up some of the Ogre units. Lead Belchers still shooting, man. And they've gotten 1,000 value. Lead Belchers are good against Wood Elves. Slightly vulnerable against the, um, what are those things called? The Way Watchers because they have almost enough range to match them and can creep up on them. So you got to watch out for that. That was something Xyphos did against me. That was very, very strong when we were practicing. But uh, aside from that, like you can see Ogres are, Ogres are much better. Like now that they can actually capture objectives a little bit, that's, uh, that's no joke. Back objective, Saber Tusk pack here, clean it up. And you can see these drives might get broken off. Saber Tusks are chasing down the Glade Lord. And the Butcher ability has kept the Slaughter Master alive for now. As in the backfield, it looks like there's going to be some sort of Wood Elf magic here. I saw some bombardment or something going down. Sylvan Knights moving into the backfield, most likely to go after the Nobbler Scrap Launcher as well as the Iron Blaster here. I have to say, guys, I'm really impressed by Freddy. I mean, he's playing a, a seasoned opponent with a faction he's never played and doing very, very well. This is, this is very impressive. Sylvan Knights coming across. Great find by Professor Pwn. Finally shutting down the old Lead Belchers. Um, they're going to get wrecked bad. Those Lead Belchers. They did good, though. They paid for themselves. So, you know, you can't complain. They, they've done something. But Christmas is coming. Oh, that was a cool shot. Seeing the Lead Belchers uh, get in there and, uh, and shoot as they're being charged, kind of standing their ground. In the back, Professor Pwn pulls in Wild Riders to clean off the Saber Tusk packs. On the side point, Wood Elves have a pretty firm hold. And Professor Pwn does have Azurai Spears out now. So he's able to get these guys in here, get these board answers. I really think more Scrap Launchers. Like, Scrap Launchers seem really good in this matchup um, against all the Glade Guard spam. But he's been doing pretty good with the... Oh, my God. Is that what I think it is? It's the Snowhorn of Morn. Oh, yeah, dude. Get this thing on the objective and get this thing getting down and dirty. So here they come. Ogres do struggle in Tantai Large, but they're not helpless. If you buffer with Noblars, use magic like the Power Fist abilities, use your Scrap Launchers and Iron Blasters... Um, ogres can kill infantry size stuff, you know, anti-large spears. Like, like if you stack an ogre on top of an oblar, like a dual weapon ogre, it'll tear apart an eternal guard, like, very quickly, you know. This is pretty hype, though, guys. Stonehorns with their charge attacks can do a lot of damage. Well, that was a pretty lackluster one, but we'll see what kind of attacks he gets here. The eternal guard are not unbreakable, so definitely going to want to get a little support. Like, this thing should have some noblars with it or some chaff, and yeah. Looks like Freddy's going to be sending out some Noblar Trappers, holding on to the back point. Professor Pwn does have a big value lead. Unfortunately for him, though, there's a lot of Azurai Spears. These are pretty tough to drag down. In the middle, though, the Ogres are kind of resurgent. He's using the Dreaded Iron Blaster in melee to ram things. Which is how you know, that's how you know it's getting pretty serious. And Professor Pwn's in a little bit of danger of losing his home objective. If these Sylvan Knights get crumped, and they kind of are by the Iron Fist and the melee Iron Blaster, he might be able to move up here and take this. Meanwhile, the Stonehorn, like, oh man, this is not the play. If he had brought the Stonehorn over here and had it help to secure that objective, maybe. But it's it's basically being shot by Starfire Shafts and also fighting very cost-effective anti-large spears. Still doing a decent amount of damage in the process. It's gotten 500 value, which is impressive. If it had Noblar buffering from the start, it would uh, have taken like maybe like 
you know, half like half the damage it's taken so far. It's wavering right now. Um, has he used the ability on it? Nobbler Trapper is getting into combat, and it will be breaking and running as the Sylvan Knights and Wild Riders come in. I think this is going to be the death blow. Professor Pwn has pulled a pretty big value lead. This was a really good game. It's a really good game. Uh, the trading was like literally dead even for like a good 80% of the game. I'm very impressed. This was a, a super fun match to watch. Maybe, maybe Freddy, you're secretly an ogre main. If you just refine your play a little bit and your engagements, you get there. You get there, I think. Yeah. Ogres and Noblars moving out. I think ogres are going to be one of the new factions I adopt in this season. Hey, Nakamura, how you doing, man? Hope you're doing well. We're playing some of our new maps today, having a good old time. Now, these are a unit I think are really good in this matchup. Mornfang Cavalry are actually amazing. They dominate Wood Elf Cavalry. And I think you should give them the Iron Fist, though, for a little bit extra cost. Because, you know, it, again, it'll stop a lot of damage from the Starfire Shafts and different things like that. So, the no Unholy Unwashed Noblar Hordes are moving up. That is a lot of them. You don't want to stack them up. You want to kind of surround with them and envelop. And this is what I'm talking about with Ogres. They're very fast, and now that they have good capture weight, they can kind of just, like, jack your objective. Like, if these Wild Riders didn't react that fast, this objective could just straight up be the Ogres, right? Which is just wild shit. Mornfang Cav, I think if we had seen them a little bit earlier, maybe. And this is how you play the Stonehorn. You get Noblars in on them, and then you charge with the Stonehorn. You pull back. You use Troll Guts on said Stonehorn. And look at the damage it did to those War Dancers. That's brutal. And would you also get the Mornfang Cavalry coming in? Again, charging into Spheres, which I think is a slight mistake. But look at this. The Ogres just jacking an objective just like that, man. Beautiful stuff. You're able to get on that point there. Uh, will they get it in time? There are some Azurai Spheres coming up. But Azurai Spheres trade horribly into Noblars. Like, really badly. Like, Noblars will trade very well, actually. The Mornfang Cavalry crushing through. The Wood Elves are actually kind of getting buckled on the side point a little bit. And do the Ogres get it? Oh, they were one sliver away from getting that objective. But the Azurai Spheres get there in time. And they're able to get that one. So the gut plate's coming out, able to bump into those bad boys. The, dude, I love the ogre karate kicks. Those are my favorite things. They have the Anderson Silva straight kick going on. The one that the, the dreaded Steven Seagal taught him. Look at that. Ogres have wrestled the side point, I think, with the Noblars and all that. Um, yeah, like, look how badly the war dancers trade into Noblars. That is how you do it, right? That is how you do it. More spears coming up. The old Stonehorn here with about 287 HP. Really nice play of an Othrama from Pwn, though. That's a beautiful play, locking down those expensive cavalry. And Pwn wins. But, very good game by the Ogres. And it just goes to show, Ogres can beat Wood Elves. That was a competitive Wood Elf build. Yeah. Pwn, great game. Great game to you as well, Freddy. I don't know who you are in chat. Are you Razor there? If you are Razor, you played really well, man. Hold your head up high. A couple adjustments. Switch your Slaughter Master to the Troll Guts guy. Okay, number one. Number two, switch these to Shields. Mornfang Shields. Uh, maybe... Cut the Noblar Trappers in your opening build and get a second Scrap Launcher. And your build is great. Like, dude, like you're ready to go, man. You're ready to go. All right. So, Professor Pwn up to three wins. Will he pass the dreaded Flying Taco? Uh, great game. All right. One sec here. And let's go ahead and refresh this, get this going, and we can go ahead and roll factions for the next players here. Uh, where'd Pwn go? Pwn, do you have to go? Let me check. So I saw him just leave the lobby. Hold on. One sec. So the first person in here was uh, Sperare, I think, at the top. I'm just seeing if Pwn crashed. Because he, he, was, he was in the lobby. Okay, so looking around. Waiting for you, Professor Pone, to see if you have time. I would assume maybe you need to go to dinner or something like that. Pone's got to go. Oh, no. Waiting for a response from him before we move forward and roll the factions. So let's see what he says. Yeah, Pone said he had to go. Okay, no worries. Hey, Wacka Wacka. We've been loving your maps today. We played the Temple of Usirian and all that stuff. So yeah, it's fine. We'll just start here. Um, so now we'll let someone play until they uh, potentially beat Flying Taco score, which was four. So we got um, we got that versus Seraphon. We've been loving your maps today, Wacka. They've been great. By the way, I was going to ask you about updating the... Because all the maps have been fixed by the uh, other map creators. Is there a way we could get those updated? Is that like a really complex process? Let me know. Uh, shoot me a message in uh, in Discord because it'd be really good to have those uh, those other maps in there as well. 
Razor, you played well. You played very well. All right, so we'll do another set of games here until somebody beats uh, Taco's score or, or fails, essentially. So whoever wins this, they will get the chance to keep playing until they lose. All right, now we'll get we'll get more people in so we can get get it refreshed. Not refreshed, but give, it, give more people a chance to play. All right, so let's get in there. Because he, he already left the lobby, it's kind of hard to like coordinate and all that. I normally would just, if he had just stayed in there, we would be fine, but um, yeah. All right, so for player one, let's see what matchups we get. Dun, 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 dun. Is it gonna be rats? We haven't had any rats today. That's okay, I'm down. Some corn is always fun. I love corn. <laughs> yeah. Decisive victory. Uh, corn versus... Okay. Yep. Oh, I almost want to let this happen. You guys want more ogres? Because I'm down for more ogres. Who wants more ogres? So, normally we re-roll the previous faction, but since it's a faction that doesn't get picked a lot, we'll do a quick poll. Alright, so you guys vote real quick. Yeah, let me know. Okay. So do you guys want to keep ogres in this game? Let me know. But as of now, it's corn, uh, Sprare, your corn, and Seraphon, your ogres. Looks like it's pretty decisive on ogres, yeah. A good 80% uh, of the people who voted, 73%, 74, yeah. Damn, I would have had corn if you rerolled, that's true. Honestly, you did really good with ogres though, man. It was a great game. Ogres are not as bad as they used to be. Yeah, they're not as bad. All right, so Seraphon, you're playing ogres. The Maw Hungers, yeah, it does. Um, so let's do another one of Wacka's maps since he's here in chat. We can we can, uh, we can can have some fun. Geothermal Crevice is yours, right? I think it is. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's one of his maps. So we'll do this. I haven't seen this map, so this will be a good time to actually see it. Uh, know why Counts and Slanesh are out, but why kick Tomb Kings? Because uh, Tomb Kings are bugged right now. So the uh, the Tomb King's army passive, the Realm of Souls that triggers when stuff dies. If you have any cavalry units that it like resurrects, it like heals them to full health. It's bugged. Yeah. So Tomb Kings are banned from tournaments until Creative Assembly hot fixes it. Yeah. It makes it unfair. It could just straight up win you the game. Yeah, vampire counts. I think are in the pool. The capture value on the ogres felt good. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Ogres are a really fun faction to play. I'm, I'm excited to kind of dive into them. I want to main. This season, I want to main Ogre. I want to have five factions I really focus on, which Empire, I've already mastered. Um, Empire, Bretonia, Dwarfs, uh, Ogres, and Corn. Those are the factions I really, really want to play. So you bring Mass Halberds against Ogres. Typically, it's not a bad idea, but they can still shoot them with you know Scrap Launchers and Lead Belchers and all that kind of stuff. So Yeah, it is. This map has lots of cliffs and elevations. It's okay, Wacka. It's fun. All right, sounds good. So Wacka, the great map maker, has said he's going to update the map pack tonight, which will be fixing the um, Celestial Lake and a couple of the other great maps we have, including the uh, Proving Grounds. So that's going to be super fun, which means uh, all the maps will be playable as of tomorrow. Super, super excited. Yeah, CA needs to hotfix the resurrection. It's pretty janky. Well, the Duke, if you want to host tournaments, you just, you just ban the things that are bugged, and you can still have good tournaments. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's like... I'd have to have an O and Dead rule. That's not true, Duke. You can, you you have to ban Tomb Kings because they the bug is unavoidable. But what you do with Vampire Coast is you just say no lore of vampire. Uh, you can no invocation of Nehek and no vampires lore passive, and then they're totally fine. And then if you're looking at um, vampire counts, you just ban you ban uh, Heinrich Kemmler's Tomb Blade. You ban uh, invocation of Nehek and the vampires lore passive, so they could use lore of death, and they can still use raise dead. They just can't use the lore passive, so you can still have the undead. And honestly, they're still like a decent faction, even without healing. Like yesterday, we had Platypus, like, was it Platypus beat someone with vampire counts with no healing in like the higher stages of a tournament? It was like a day or two ago. Yeah. So this is a fun one. This is Geothermal Cremis. The Geothermal Crevice. Cremis. The resurrection bug. I'll show you. I can show you guys at the end of the stream. There's a huge bug with healing right now. Yeah. Not healing, but resurrecting. I'm, I'm excited to have some Dust Bowl games. I am medley. It's, it's a cool map. 
yeah, you go to Human Boy's channel, search Human Boy Yes Yes on YouTube, and he, he did a whole video on it. Um, so yeah, you can check that out. He did it. He did it. All right. Perfect. All right, what's going on here? Cool. Corn? What this is like one place where maybe the new Haggard Demon ROR could be good cuz he gets his ward save if large entities are nearby, which is like the whole ogre roster. So maybe there's something there. I don't know. Yeah, vampire counts have a good win rate even without, yeah. Vampire counts are a, a, an even win rate with no healing, which is telling you how unbalanced they are. Yeah, I know. When you give them healing, they're up to like, they just become so unfair. Would you play Blood Bowl IRL? I did play Blood Bowl IRL. I played football for seven years. American football. Shroom says the map update will also be adding more spikes to the Crucible. Yeah, Shroom, hopefully you were on the stream earlier. Um, we played Crucible. It was one of the first maps we played today. By the way, Shroom, what's your other map? Your other map is the uh, Codel's uh, Mistwood. We'll play that one next. We'll do that after this. I love that map's really cool. Oh, uh, the infinite ammo bug got fixed. Creative Assembly got that one. Ever coming back to Age of Empires 4? Yeah, very soon, actually. The new civilizations are coming out in five days. And uh, for anyone who's missing Age, I'll be streaming it pretty heavily for that week. Um, and then after that, maybe like a stream a week, two streams a week, something. Depends. The problem is I have hand problems um, that come and go, depending on what I'm doing in my life, like with exercise and you know IRL stuff. Um, so sometimes like playing really sweaty RTS games for like four or five hours is kind of taxing. Yours is Gates of Ekron. Who is, who is uh, Codel's Mistwood? It, yeah, we already played Gates of Ekron Shroom. Okay. That's Chromo Sumos, which I think his maps had some bug issues. So yeah, maybe we'll avoid that one for now. Uh, offense or defense, which position? I played running back um, in high school. And I, um, I, played, uh, I played strong safety as well. I wasn't like terribly big, you know, but like I, I didn't play at like a huge division, you know, one major high school. So I played in like a smaller league, but yeah, I played running back. I played strong safety. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. I could show you guys. I have the highlight video somewhere. I could show you guys. I think it's on the computer somewhere. Yeah, it's it's fun because I was going to play high. I, I was going to play college football. Uh, I was looking at some division two, II, division three schools to play at. Um, because I, I was a really fast runner, uh, but like I didn't have a lot of size, so I wasn't like probably big enough to play D one, but I could definitely play D two, D three. Yeah, another Warcraft stream, probably. Yeah, yeah, Warcraft's fun. I'll definitely get back to that someday. Mistwood should be fine. I think it was it was, it was proving grounds. Okay, Chromo, if that's the case, then I'll uh, I'll try it next game. If it's bug, we'll just jump out. Yeah, running back's fun. You know. Playing football was cool and all, and honestly, some of the most fond memories of my life were from that. You know, just some some of the camaraderie and team teamwork and the epic moments and, you know, the crushing defeats that you suffer. It's like a really good emotional experience in that way. But, you know, the brain damage you take from playing football, even just high school level, is is rough. Like, like you don't notice it, but like all those like constant hits you take, those add up, you know. Um, and I'm not saying like I had that myself, but like people who play, especially on like, you know, certain positions, they really get messed up. I would say I avoided it pretty well because we didn't play in a very competitive league. So I, I wasn't getting hit hard. It was mostly like arm tackles and very like, I wasn't getting cracked by like NFL prospects, right? Um, so I, I, I kind of dodged it for the most part, but even still like you take a lot of damage. Yeah, safeties were typically the small. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in high school football, I was like 5'10", 175, but you know, I could run a, uh, I could run a sub 11, 100 and had a really good 40. Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. It's, 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 it sucks. You know, the, the damage you take. Yeah, no, I agree. The pale King. Yeah, for sure. I assume you called your lineman Haggard. No, I was friends with all my linemen. Yeah, I was friends. we were all pals. We all hung out after school. Yeah. CT is real bad. Agreed. Like if I could go back and do it over again, I probably wouldn't play football. Um, I would just I would just do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or like wrestling or something. You know, I know wrestling's a little bit can be a little bit hard, but it's not like football where you're just like full. You get like two basically grown men just full sprinting into each other. Like that's so bad for you. That's so bad for you. A kid from my high school got CT and he's like mid twenties. Yeah, exactly. That's that's part another reason why I didn't try and play college football. I was like, yeah, it, it's rough. 
Yeah, I, I do like combat sports a lot, though. Like, I would do, I, I definitely want to get back into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and grappling. It's not that bad. Like, BJJ, like, kind of is hard on your joints and, you know, your knees and, and, you know, tendons and all that. But as long as your, your you know, brain is, is that's, the, that's the important thing, right? You want to protect that bad boy. This map looks great. Probably not competitive, but visually so nice. Yeah, which is fine. Today is a, just a fun stream. We're just, like, practicing. People are getting a chance to play and learn and get some analysis and all that. Used to rock the cowboy collar. Yeah, that was all the linebackers had the cowboy colors, yeah. Yeah, players are still loading in here. Yeah, most he did in wrestling was, you know, yeah. Yeah, you would like bump heads every now and then, but it's not that bad. Uh, what about competitive slapping? Oh my God, that is brutal. In competitive slapping, those guys are getting brain injuries. Like people get knocked out on that shit. And they, the thing is, they just stand still and let it happen. Like at least in like some sport, combat sports, you could like protect yourself and avoid it, but you just are eating like full force head trauma every time competitive slapping is terrible i mean it's funny to watch but dude i feel bad for the people doing that they're getting serious brain injury yeah that's not good it it, it like makes me cringe because it's like man that's like when i was when i was in high school i used to volunteer at um at a local retirement home and you know i i you know interacted with a lot of people who had dementia and you know those type of things and it was just so freaking sad man and like when i see those type of injuries happening i just feel so bad like MMA is my favorite sport, but when people take like brutal knockouts, I'm like, oh man, like that feels, feels bad, man. But yeah, football's a really bad one. Football's really bad. It's probably worse than MMA, honestly. All right, guys. Anyways, let's talk about some fun, positive things. Here we are. Sprare and the forces of corn against the Ogre Kingdoms. Chaos Warriors with Halberds. More Halberds over here. Marauders of corn with dual weapons. Going to be three of those. And we do also have the Blood Brute Behemoth. So the Bloodbrute Behemoth is pretty awesome. This thing is anti-large, it's armor-piercing, it can go deep on any big target. And of course, Valkyrie is a good pick against Ogres too, because she is an anti-large hunter, so she's going to be able to effectively hunt these big Ogre targets. Now, over here we do have Marauder Horse of Corn with Throwing Axes. On the far side, it's going to be the Chungus Kingdoms, opening with the Trapper Frontline. Uh, we have the Snowhorn, yes! We have the Anti-Infantry Snowhorn, Slaughtermaster of the Great Maw, Iron Guts! Hell yeah! Hell yeah, man, look at this! The Iron Guts coming out here. Oh, the Armored Boys. And they'll be pretty good against Corn, like Marauder Infantry, Flesh Hounds, those type of things. So yeah, it's gonna be tough. It is gonna be tough. So moving up to the side point, this is two, there's three, and then there's one on the other side. This is actually a really cool looking map. This map's beautiful. I wouldn't say for like a competitive tournament, but for like casual play, like this is this is a beauty. This map's really cool. It has a nice aesthetic. I think it's awesome. Battlebots are really cool, Nakamura. I love, I love those shows where like engineers make like robots and have them battle, like these little go kart robots. Oh my god, I love that show. No Red Olgor today. Yeah, it's Valky the Bloody. She's great though. She's great. Does she have the Demon Shield? She has Demon Shield and Sloutnir, which is her spear. Sloutnir is okay for clearing out trappers, but yeah, what you do is you pop, you go in, you fight something scary, you pop Demon Shield, and you run away before it wears off. She gets like two or three free attacks and takes no damage and then pulls back. Takes a little bit of micro, but you can certainly do it. So more Noblar Trappers coming in. Ogres really, really, you know, plopping down here on objective two. So they're going to be sitting right here. And on objective three, this is this is the Thunderdome. Corn is just going to park the Bloodbrute Behemoth and some Halberds in here. And good luck getting that shit from them. Maybe the Ogres are going to have to play the side. Like, nobody's taking this objective. If you're the Ogres, send an Ogre Bull over here, dude. Like, they're fast. They have good cap weight. They could fight off a Flesh Hound, probably. Uh, yeah, and I would just definitely do that. So back here, this is where the Thunderdome uh, commences. We do get the uh, Marauder Horse and Corn getting into melee. They do have bonus for infantry. And Valkia looking like she wants to fight the Iron Blaster. Curious choice, probably not a bad idea. Valkia gets in there. She immediately does damage on the charge. And uh, now she's gonna get charged. His Demon Shield's gonna get popped. As the Iron Guts come in, she does pop Demon Shield. And Valkia is immune to damage right now, which is very cool. So the Stonehorn charges her, but guess what? She takes no damage for another five seconds. She gets one attack into the Stonehorn, it looks like, maybe. We'll have to see. And uh, she's going to have to watch out, though, because Ogres, if they trap you, it's actually kind of hard to escape. Slopnir, that's a good cast. That's going to hit two Noblars and do some decent damage, so not terrible at all. Valkia's going to stay the course, actually, and is starting to get some returning damage onto the Stonehorn here. And looking in the back, she's got some Halberd support in the middle, owned by Corn. Side objective, owned by no one. Looks like there's some Ogre Hounds going over the, there to get that. And Valkia was able to escape. Halberds might still get wrecked by the Stonehorn. It depends if they have buffering support. Iron Guts will also lose pretty bad to Halberds, so you need to get some Noblars in melee. Probably send some trappers into melee here, honestly. That would really, really help you deal with the halberds. But look at the Stonehorn just 
rampaging through. But guys, the new and improved Minotaurs with Great Weapons. The Minotaurs with Great Weapons are here. These bad boys, they got some big karate chops. A, a, a very useful tool against the Ogres, to say the least. But it looks like the dual weapons have cut through the Noblars. The Ogre battle line's going to get buckled, probably. Iron Gut's not going to trade here well. That is for sure. And it looks like some Harpies are jumping in, but they're taking the dreaded uh, Noblar Traps damage, which is actually really good. Noblar Trappers are actually a really, really underrated unit. The Stonehorn trying to get back. Seraphon does get the Troll Guts on this bad boy. He's battling Valkia the Bloody. And now basic Noblars have gotten in a little bit late to the party. Iron Guts, uh, unfortunately for them, are broken. And the Slaughter Master is a little bit overextended. I mean, there's Minotaur's Great Opens here. He has done some good damage to them, but also if they are able to get a surround on him, it could be game blouses for sure. So back in the middle, we see Objective 3 is not being contested. Ogres have taken the side objective. They've sent some Ogre Bulls over there. So Ogres do have a double cap. The middle's also open. Now, this is what you need against Corn. You need Lead Belchers. Lead Belchers should be parked on this hill right here and right here. And they should just basically, here's what you want to do. You want to get one Lead Belcher right here, one right here, and just shoot into that Corn army. Just massive damage, blasting the Minotaurs, really, really getting that good work there. So... Iron Blaster's on the run. Valky the Bloody is going to be hunting down that retreating Iron Blaster, which is a great, great usage of her. As far as the brawl goes here, Noblars are holding back the Cornate Army reasonably well, but they're starting to lose the momentum. Yeah, look at the vent coming up from the earth. Isn't that cool? Iron Guts will hard counter these infantry. Iron Guts have a ton of armor, and these, uh, these Marauders do lack armor piercing, so that's going to be a little bit problematic for sure. And in the middle, Noblars are still holding them back, but it looks like Corn is starting to get the momentum. The trading with the Minotaurs is going very well. And also, the Bloodroot Behemoth is here. Check it out. Oh, yeah, dude. This is great. Bloodroot Behemoth is a hard counter against this thing. This thing was born and bred for one purpose, which is to just get in there and go fisticuffs against big monsters and enjoy yourself. So glad I didn't miss this. Matt, I know. You got to love it, man. It's it's uh, it's the spice of life. You got to do things in life every now and that, then that just bring back that, you know, that vigor, you know, that just keep you going. Reminds you the, <laughs> reminds you the good old times. Yeah, you just made me laugh. My girlfriend is taking a test for school. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Anakin. I'm sorry. In the backfield, Iron Blaster has come back online. And we do have Saber Tusk packs battling into Flesh Hounds. Flesh Hounds will win that pretty decisively, especially with Our Lady of Valkia just getting in there and battling. You can see Saber Tusk packs getting nibbled on by the superior Hound unit. Corn should have the best hounds. It makes sense. Flesh Hounds of Corn getting over here into Lead Belchers. The Ogre Army is kind of falling apart. Seraphon probably needed Lead Belchers earlier. He brought them out later. They're a very good unit. The Iron Blaster is also a decent unit, but um, at the end of the day, it looks like Corn's taking over. You know, the Giant Stonehorn didn't really do much either, except get killed by the Bloodroot Behemoth. I did, it got a thousand value, but Corn just came in really prepared. Minotaurs with great weapons uh, and several other substantial threats for sure. So, GG well played. Slaughter Master in the back is going to probably get killed by these Minotaurs or at least uh, take a lot of damage. These guys hit like absolute trucks. They have 110 weapons rank pop. And uh, on top of that, they have a bonus for Sergeant 28, which is really, really good. Yeah, beautiful map. It's got a lot, it's a great aesthetic on this. I really enjoy this. Man, map makers are just, they're such talented individuals. I went on and I started trying to make maps and it just looked like a potato. I was like, I, so I had this like grand ambition. Like before I did the contest, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go make some maps. And then I was like, with my, with my hand problems, my repetitive stress injury and like clicking and all the detail work and my lack of artistic vision, I was just like, I was like, all right, I'm just going to host a contest and put some money up. <laughs> Let's get some actual, tal actually talented people in here to do this. And uh, look where we are. They did it, and uh, we've, had some, we've had some great results. So that's probably it, though. Like, I don't see Ogres getting back in it. They're down by 4,000 value. Valkia has been used very well. Sprare has done it. Very, very good corn play. Corn versus Ogres, I think Ogres can win it. I think you need to focus on Lead Belchers, though. Lead Belchers are just beast mode. Lead Belchers, Noblar Trappers, and then, like, Frontline kind of Tar Pitting is probably the way to do it. This map is inspired by Warcraft. I have a map inspired by Warcraft, but it's bugged. No worries, it won't be bugged next time we stream, Edley. We'll, we'll have you back. Marauders of Corn holding on. Side point being taken by the Marauders, so Corn just kind of taking over the battle here. Controlling the objectives across the battlefield. Corn owns here, the Blood God claiming its domain in the middle of the map. Slaughter Master being hunted down. The Bloodroot Behemoth is just unholy. Absolutely unholy. 2,000 damage, and it heals in combat. This thing's so good. It has, the, uh, it has the good healing. It has the 0.2 healing. So every five seconds, he heals 1% of his HP, which is nice. A lot of units have like the 0.10 healing, but um, these guys, yeah, these guys have the superior healing. Yeah, map making is really hard to do. It's really, really hard. So there goes the Slaughter Master. Flesh Hounds of Corn still tearing it up in the backfield. The Stone Horn is wavering. Well, he's unsummoned at this point. And Valkia, the Valkyrie of Corn, one of the cooler characters in the game, in my opinion. 
Descending from the sky is going to be hunting down the Slaughtermaster. This is very thematic. Like, enemies retreating from the battle, and then, like, Valkyrie just, like, hunting them down. Yeah, very, very corn. Looking for a worthy fight. So, here they come. There goes ye old Slaughtermaster. And the big boy, the Blood Brute Behemoth routing. I don't think there's any chance for the Chungus Kingdoms. They're trying, they're scrapping. These Marauders of Corn honestly will fight pretty well here. Ogre Bulls will, you know, pound them, obviously, but there are some Marauder Horsemen who can come over and help. So, even if Ogres get this objective back, you know, Corn has. The, uh, it's a mass route. I'm surprised he hasn't left yet, actually. Um, Scrap Launcher doing how much damage this game? I'm actually curious about how it's performed against Corn. I guess it hasn't been out that long. Maybe it was a relatively recent summon. That's for sure. So, shots going through the heart, and you're too late. You gave the Ogres. A little bit of trouble. Chaos Fury's moving out. Skull Crushes of Corn, a badass unit. He's, uh, these guys actually have some relevance in a couple of matchups. I think Corn has a lot of unexplored meta. They're not like a t they weren't like, I guess they were somewhat popular, but they didn't see a lot of super high level play last season. But with the Minotaur cost reduction, maybe that gives Corn the edge they need. Marauder Horseman still very dominant. You see that with Norska. That the reason why Norska is competitive is because they have Horse Masters. Honestly, it's like without the Horse Masters, if they just had basic Horsemen, I don't think they'd be like terribly competitive. Yeah, so Ogre's being pushed back to the Shadow Realm. Seraphon pulling out Saber Tusk packs. We've got Slaughter Master here, but basically just being fully routed back to the spawn. They are holding on to that side point, but I, I don't know what the Ogres hope to accomplish here. There would have to be a Colossal Blunder. Mornfang, Iron Fist, so that's a bit of a mistake. You don't really need Missile Resist against Corn. You would want to bring the Anti-Large variant or the Basic variant instead of the Iron Fist with the Shields. It does provide slightly more melee defense, but I don't think it's worth the premium. Valkyrie gets a little bit surrounded here by Saber Tusk packs. Could be slight, slightly dangerous for her. Sword of Corn coming down, it does hit. It, it does barely any damage. It hits the Saber Tusk, because Ogres don't have like a super high model count, so it's uh, it's not going to do that much damage. Yeah. On the other side, we do have uh, Chaos Furies moving on over. They're going to be attacking on the side, going after the Noblar Trappers. And ye old uh, Blood Brute Behemoth just terror routing everything. Dude, this Blood Brute has just been unstoppable this game. Almost 3,000 value. I mean, that makes sense. Like, uh, totally bringing Blood Brute on a map like this, where line of sight is very, very hard. And now we got Minotaurs coming over here, and the Ogres are going to try and defend this point, but there's Halberds coming, there's Skull Crushers. The value lead is, uh, is, is yeah, is serious. So here they come. They're moving across. And, oh boy, this is going to be some serious pressure for sure. So down goes Saber Tusk Packs. Ten leadership. Not going to hold long. They are large entity models, so the Halberds and Skull Crushers get a bonus for them. And Corn is basically just farming Skulls in the backfield. The Blood Root Behemoth has actually been healing capped, which is pretty insane if you think about it. Just fighting, and uh, yeah, these Chaos Fury is going to get torn up a little bit, but yeah, I'm I'm very, very surprised he hasn't left yet. <laughs> this game feels extremely over. Feels extremely over. Skull Crushers on the side. Crushing Skulls. Very fitting, actually. I'm going to have a little bit of sip of a coffee right now, as we can watch these badass Corn units fight. Even if the game is decided, we still get to see some cool kind of duels between these units. Get to see the applications and their effectiveness. I think Skull Crushers, if I were to say what matchups they would be good in, Okay, definitely against Ogres is like a utility sweeper, not bad. Um, against Bretonia, I would probably bring one Skull Crusher in reserve, because Bre all Bretonian cavalry will trade badly into Skull Crushers, with the exception of uh, Questing Knights. And even though Skull Crushers will win, um, granted, Questing Knights could get like a regrowth, Companions of Quinells would beat Skull Crushers. That's probably the only one. So if like the Bretonian player is spamming out like Knights of the Realm and Knights Errant, you have like a Skull Crusher out there, it could be really nasty. Yeah. So. Very cool. So next we're going to do a very cool Wood Elf map. GG well played. That map was won by Sparare. So now he gets to play till he loses. And if somebody beats him, the stream's over. And he has a chance to beat Flying Taco's record today of four. Blood Brute, 3400. Valkyrie, 2000. Cool play by the Ogres, too. I love the Iron Guts. They're so cool. But yeah, needed more Lead Belchers. Lead Belchers really give Corn the business. They definitely do. All right. So let's go ahead and try... Codel's Mistwood. This is a beautiful map. Well played to you, Seraphon. It was a fun game, my friend. Hey, Ogres, Ogres are trying. People, let's see, a lot of people haven't had time to play the Ogres. That's for sure. So let's get this going. And check this out. Where are we at? And do we have another challenger in here? We do. We have Logard. Ugh, the dreaded Logard has come. So let's go to the faction roll. Let's get this going. See what we can get. Come on, baby. Give us the goodies. Oh, I got. Okay, we got a reroll. We've had like 
We had like three, two ogre matches in a row. We got to re-roll. So this is for player one. All right, come on. What are you going to give us? What if we just got ogres again? That's what I'm talking about. Beastmen, baby. So the beastmen are here. Hey, natural born. I'm glad you're enjoying the stream. Natural born patriot. Cheers, man. All right, so... Okay, Dark Elves and Beastmen is a fun one. They Either one has rerolls. So, Sparare, you are playing Beastmen. And honestly, Beastmen are really, I think, good on this map. And Logard, you're playing Dark Elves. So, good luck, have fun. If either of you want to reroll, type something on stream and just say it's you, or uh, shoot me a message in Discord and we can give you a reroll. But do let me know. Do let me know. Yes, yeah, this, this is a good Beastman map. I actually think it is. Yeah, Morker on that side point is very nasty to get rid of. Like two Chaos Spawn units over there. Looks like they're both happy with their picks. This is this is going to be a fun one, actually. It's I'm glad we got like a Beastman game. I'm glad we got a Beastman game today. We've Who have we not had? We haven't had the Empire. Um, yeah, there's a handful of factions that haven't played. No Demons of Chaos. We had Nurgle. We had Zinch. Yeah, we've had, a, we've had most of the factions, honestly. Made me sit up and type boo. Shane, Shane, we already had two ogre games in a row, though. I get where you're coming from because they're fun to watch. But um, I want to give people different matchups, too. Beastmen are fun. Beastmen are like one of those really underrated factions in Dom, I think. Yeah, I think the Beastmen are incredibly underrated. Morker is a very fun lord on this map. I like him a lot. Just like plop him on that side point and just like summon spawn and just be like, come at me. Yeah, he's, 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 he's tricky. And then you just defend your home objective. So, Beastmen versus Dark Elves. Let me see if I'm getting any messages. Nope, looks like they're both happy with their factions. Let me look at their build so far and see what they got. Okay, they're both bringing wild builds. So, it's not going to be like meta as you know it. That's for sure. That is for sure. Just opening that. Uh, Demons of Chaos are actually, after the Demon Princes got cost reductions, maybe there's more you could do with them, but probably just still going to be the Bellicor show. God, I hate Bellicor. He's so annoying to play against. So toxic. Like, even if he doesn't always win, he's just not fun to play against because he's, like, impossible to kill. I know he got some cost increases, so it's a little bit better now, but... Uh, oh god, what stream was it where someone surrounded the, the VC RR Vargas with like five centigores? That was like two or three streams ago. It was a big tournament stream at the end of season two. Uh, Moffat was playing against, uh, I can't remember. But Moffat got uh, the B spend against Vampire Counts on Black Ark, and uh, he, he, he was pretty wild. Yes. So yeah, Beastmen have a lot of Vanguard options that are pretty relevant on this map as well. A lot of sneaky, sneaky Beastmen tricks that can come, cause all sorts of problems. The Bray Herd, they cometh, they cometh for blood. Thank you guys all for joining. I know it's getting a little bit late for those folks in Europe. Probably only a couple more games, we'll see. Depends on how long Sparari can go. At the most, it'll be uh, four more games. At the least, this will be the last one, if he loses. Yeah, Moffat's insane. Moffat's insane. No, it wasn't versus Void Loss. It wasn't Void Loss, it was someone else. Yeah, it was someone else. I can't remember who it was. I cannot remember who it was. Yeah, Moffat's in, got insane micro. He's got he's got that Zoomer micro, that that early early twenties <laughs> RTS gamer micro. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty hilarious. Total War is a game that you can get away with not having the craziest micro if your builds are done. If your builds are good and you have like good decision making with your placement, like you can be a little bit slower and still compete at the highest level. But obviously, it's better to like have that and insane micro. Which legendary lord is most like the Macho Man Randy Savage? Okay, so like very like brazen and like kind of like huge and jacked. Probably Grimgore, right? Grimgore would totally like be like Macho Man. Talking about how he's the best and how he's like the cream of the crop. Oh yeah, Grimgore is like closest to Macho Man Randy Savage for sure. I don't think there's any discussion about that. Maybe, I'm trying to think of, okay, definitely no Skaven, definitely not any Empire Lords. They're all like a little too serious. Grimgore, um, yeah, probably Grimgore Ironhide. <laughs> Wilson, you paid for the whole chair, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fun, man. It's mooing time. Yeah, it is Melonhead, it is, it's mooing time. Yeah, Grimgore is Macho Man, for sure. The Undertaker is probably just like Vlad von Karstein, you know. 
just like constantly rising from his like casket. When you think you got him, he's just still there. Uh, have any Brood War pros tried out competitive Total War? Probably not. They probably wouldn't play it because there's no, not that much money in the scene. Like, there's a little bit of money for like season finals and things like that that I have, like five hundred to a thousand dollars, but probably not enough to like lure over a Brood War pro. Hey, know me, Grimgore Macho Macho Giz Savage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Nakai doesn't really speak. He kind of just like a big part of Macho Man was his talking game, and Grimgore probably knows how to talk. Like, he knows how to get out there and like talk about how he's the best. He's not terribly eloquent though, and Macho Man Randy Savage was actually very eloquent. Like, you know, he he would he would like use some crazy vocabulary and ridiculous like, yeah. Ah, I don't know. Imagine that micro. Oh my god. Oh my god. Who's Andre the Giant? Um, Andre the Giant. I mean, is that just going to be like Throg? But Andre the Giant was like a gentle giant. Like if you if you actually like looked into his like real life, he was actually like a really gentle, nice person and very friendly. Throg, I wouldn't put in that purview. I don't know how you, who he would say there. <laughs> yeah, Andre the Giant was great, man. I remember him in The Princess Bride. Oh my god, that that movie was a classic. <laughs> Cream of the Crumps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really fun. I like that. Andre the Giant's just a giant. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, Andre the Giant could be uncle for uncle, maybe. Like a big... Because the Nurgle, the Nurgle big guys are kind of jolly and jovial in their personalities. Mazda Mundi isn't very friendly. Like the Lizardmen are actually like really... If you look down at like the core of what they want to do, it's pretty evil. Like sure, they fight chaos and stuff and they have like a, an order leaning side to it. But like... Yeah, they, they the lizardmen have like a villainous side to them for sure. It's it's a little scary when you like dig deep into it. Like sure, the empire has some dark side. It's it has you know elements that are corrupted by chaos, and you know occasionally in the lore, you know Carl Franz will have to do things that are a little bit dark to like, you know at least in his opinion are good for his people. But like it's not like it's it's pretty easy to call them the good guys, you know when you look at Warhammer Fantasy. Um, but yeah, like. The Lizardmen got some questionable stuff going on if you look at the Great Plan and all that. Yeah. Yeah, Boris is a big Jolly Bear King. Okay, yeah, Boris could be. Lizardmen are the embodiment of Lawful Neutral. Yeah. You could call them Lawful Evil, though. Doesn't the Great Plan call for, like, the extermination of everyone that isn't Lizardmen? <laughs> because that sounds pretty evil. Like, I think they're, they, they will ally with some of the other Order factions, right? No matter the ends or the means. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Somebody would have to check the lore. They're very neutral is what you guys are saying? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, they just kind of like hang out and do their own thing. Yeah. Andre the Giant as Greasus? I don't know. Greasus, uh, if he was standing up, it's kind of hard to tell. It's kind of hard to tell. Lizardmen aren't evil. They're just single-minded. Defeating chaos takes precedence over all, everything else. Yeah, it makes sense. Copy that. More lawful evil. Yeah. That would actually be kind of a fun video to do. Maybe maybe doing like uh like like D and D lot like like uh like like doing a D and D analysis of like all the factions about like where they stand and like that scale, like lawful evil, lawful good, lawful neutral, like all that. Yeah, that would be kind of fun. That would be a fun video. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll get like someone who knows the lore very well and talk to him about it. I think that's just Mazda Mundi's recent interpretation. Got it. Andre does drink like a machine. Yeah, there was apparently a story of him drinking like something like, I don't know, like it's an insane amount of beers. Clint Eastwood is a dwarf lord. Clint Eastwood would probably be like a witch hunter, I feel. Like in a lot of movies, Clint Eastwood plays the spirit of vengeance. He's like this vengeful, like, and, and uh, you know, like unforgiven, you know, like those type of characters. And I feel like that's a witch hunter. Like Clint Eastwood would be a witch hunter character for sure. If we're talking that, yeah. Like a legendary witch hunter character that's just like super badass. He just like rolls up with his like hat and his poncho on and like there's like some heretic and he's just like having a having a stare down with him. Totally Clint Eastwood would be would be an Empire Witch Hunter. That would be a cool video. I think it'd be fun. Yeah, maybe we'll do that. I think Lizard made a more lawful evil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although I don't know. Lawful evil. I don't really know what I'm talking about with Lizard Men, so I'm I'm gonna I don't know. I just feel like there's something villainous about them. Neutral, neutral evil? Maybe lizardmen are like 
Is there a lot? Yeah, is there one for that? I'm not sure. It's been a good discussion. Who would Henry Cavill be? Oh, High Elf for sure. Henry Cavill would be like Tyrion. He would be Tyrion or like, or no, you know what? Henry Cavill would probably be a better Eltharian the Grim. I think Eltharian the Grim and Tyrion, because like, you know, I think Eltharian has like black hair and like he's got, I think Henry looks more like him than like Tyrion. Eltharian the Grim is like one of the coolest characters in Warhammer Fantasy. He's so cool. Can't really see Clint. Yeah, but you know, Clint could be a different type of witch hunter. He doesn't have to be like one of the super... Dowie or lawful neutral? Yeah, I would say Dowie or lawful neutral, you know. That's that's a good way of saying it, yeah. This is kind of a fun discussion. Cavill is Franz? Yeah, Fr Franz could be Cavill as well. But apparently, I think Henry Cavill has said that his favorite is High Elves. So I'm just trying to trying to give him his favorite stuff. He, he would be a great Eltharian the Grim, though. That would be really good. Yeah. Eltharian has a hero in the campaign called Cavill. Yeah, he does. Yeah, CA did that. It was pretty fun. Sigvald would be need to be played by... I don't know. Ooh, you know who would be actually good as Prince Sigvald? You know who would be the best... Okay. You know who would be the best Prince Sigvald actor? Here's my here's my updated opinion. I had some different opinions before, but I think, like, uh, Evan Peters, the guy who plays Quicksilver in, uh, in X-Men, and he also is in American Horror Story and stuff. Cause he's got that kind of like young, younger look. Like he's he he would fit Sigvald, I think, if he grew his hair out long. Oh, that's Sigvald, Evan Peters. Yeah, that guy's he's a great actor too. Hmm. Maybe I got to do an updated version of that. That'd be pretty fun. Benedict is Teclas. Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch is Teclas. He's like real life Teclas. Yeah. No, Evan Peters. Look him up. I think that's his name. I could be wrong. I see some good ones there. Danny DeVito, Sigvald. Yeah, Danny DeVito should just play everyone in Warhammer Fantasy. Yeah, that would be really good. Damn, yeah, that's good. I know. I thought so, too. Guys killing it is Demon Targaryen. Yeah, I mean, that guy could be any number of characters. He could be any number of characters. Yeah, Jamie, the guy who plays Jamie and Nikolai Kostrovaldo would be an excellent, an excellent Sigvald, but he's a little older. And Sigvald is supposed to look like he's, like, in his early 20s, late teens. So that's why, like, I think Christopher Valdo would be, like, a be better as a different character. He'd be a great... Warhammer, yeah, he'd be good, but I think he's a little, like Sigvald's supposed to look like he's like tw in his early twenties. So that's that's the only reason I suggest that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, back to action. We have Kazrak, the one eye for the Beastmen, facing off against Marathi, the Hag Queen. This is quite fun. So Kazrak, let's talk about Kazrak. He's terrible, but he does have some armor piercing and can certainly run over some units. Ungor herds, just basic shielded chaff to absorb handbows, things like that. Bray shame in a pit of shades, no surprises. On the other side, Centigars with Great Opens and Tuscor Chariots, both good choices. Tuscor Chariots are very, very good against uh, Dark Elf Infantry. And Centigars can trade reasonably well with Colden Knights if they get the charge. And in the back, we have several units of Chaos Spawn, which are... And Minotaurs, too. Both of which are pretty good. As long as they're not being shot by bows, which this map has heavy, heavy mitigation on, I think that's pretty great. Look at this. We have the Bray Herd coming up through the trees here. I like that. So they're going to be approaching through the forest. But the Wood Elves or Dark Elves seem very ready for them. Now, Marathi... She's pretty good. Big AoE debuff. She can kick Kazrak's butt for sure. Uh, we do have Dread Spears, Sisters of Slaughter, as well as Shades with Great Swords and Corsairs for Low Guard. On the other side, we have Black Guard. Oh, yeah. The Black Guard are such a cool unit. Dark Elves are one of those armies that I've always wanted to make in tabletop. I think they have some of the coolest models. I would actually really enjoy making a Dark Elf army um, to kind of go with my Empire forces that we do have. So, the Black Guard battling against the Chariots here. On the other side, a little bit of a light skirmish as the Centigors do move in and attack the Sisters of Slaughter. Oh, that's awesome, darling. I'm just going to leave for you to I love it. Um, Anna just finished doing a, a custom drawing of, of Katarine with a... Yeah, it, it's really, really cool. We'll, we'll post it up in the community section soon. So, pulling back here, Centigors intercepting the Dark Riders. And we do have Kazrak the One-Eye as well as the Minotaurs. Eyeing down the Sisters of Slaughter right here. They're looking for that prize. But the Minotaur is able to successfully route off some Dark Riders of Logard, which is a very, very good engagement for Sparare. So that's got to feel pretty good. Now, looking at the objectives, the Beastmen uh, do not have anything capturing their home objective at the point at this moment. Dark Elves look like they're going to get a stranglehold on this one. We see Logard moving up with some uh, Bleak Swords as well as some Spears and the Black Guard. 
The Black Guard have also gotten into melee right here. So they moved in and uh, they're really chewing through Centigors in melee because a little bit of a miss micro there by Sperare. So unfortunate. Going to be taking some, uh, getting, letting the Dark Elves get some value here. But how is this main fight going to go? This is really going to be the deciding one. Okay, Marathi gets a really nice Soul Stealer here. Hits Minotaurs, hits Spawn, hits Spears. Bleak Sword is obviously a pretty cost-effective unit. Marathi should probably be used to intercept these Tusk Wars, or at least fight. And we can see in the backfield a beautiful Centigore flank by the Beastmen. So they get on top of the Shades. Oh, man, beautiful Pit of Shades going to be coming in. Kazrak the One-Eye, Apocalyptic Vision going down. That's going to just be a huge buff for these units. And a giant Erect Pit of Shades is coming down on Low Guard's forces. So, so far, the Beastmen getting the upper hand in a lot of these trades, in my opinion. That's a nice one right there. So Shades with Great Swords get absolutely smashed. Sisters of Slaughter moving in, and they'll have a good fight here. They'll cut through a lot of these different units, including Spawn. They'll do okay against him. Kind of like a generalist unit, to say the least. But Kazrak the One-Eye and his Chariot squad in the Centigore is able to crush the Dark Elf backfield. Bleak Sword's getting messed up. Marathi probably needs to get a little bit more involved. And now we do see Raven's Heralds coming out. I don't hate that. Um, they're going to sit. They're just going to shoot at Kazrak, and potentially over the course of the game, they can wear him down. The Druki have a very strong hold on the far side objective. They have Black Art over there, so that's pretty much guaranteed to be theirs for most of the game, unless the Beastmen commit heavily to trying to take that. I think the Beastmen are probably going to play two, three, and one, and just try and value trade there until they can overwhelm that side objective and just have like a huge advantage. Granted, Dark Elves aren't trading terribly. You know, the Raven's Herald's up in the sky doing okay. We do see Dread Spears being routed here. The Canaid Assassin's probably going to die. Scourge Hunter Chariot's caught in melee by Centigors with great weapons, which is essentially a hard counter to them if they can get them in melee. So these Scourge Runners are getting pounded and are going to be on the run, but the problem for them is that Centigors are faster than them. Scourge Runners have 84 speed, Centigors have 90, so they can chase them into the Shadow Realm. Although there is a response, Dark Riders coming out. Um, we'll be able to probably do well against Centigors, although they lapse in their charge. A little bit unfortunate there. Black Guard holding on to the side point, and it looks like the Bray Herd has taken control of this point right there. And over here we see the Sisters of Slaughter. How are they doing? 781 value is pretty good, considering they've been swamped by chariots and a bunch of high-value units. They've almost paid for themselves, despite being in a pretty horrific fight. Raven's Heralds still shooting at Kazrak, trying to wear that bad boy down, but the Bray Herd has really taken, taken control over this side of the battlefield. Even though the value trading is very even, they really, really have pushed the Dark Elves back to their spawn, but you have to be careful not to overextend. The Dark Elves are a nasty faction, and if Kazrak were to die to these Raven's Heralds, it kind of looks like they are. Yeah, Kazrak just being terrible, like usual, right? Like, if this was Morker, like any, like, Durable Lord or Torox, he would be at, like, you know, near full health right now. But Kazrak's just absolute trash. He tries his best, though. He tries his best. He's not the worst Lord in the game. He's better than Greasus. Kazrak, there, there's a running meme on the channel that Kazrak never makes it past 500 value. Let's see what he's at now. Oh, man, he's he's broken the record. He's at 795 right now. That's That's got to be something serious. More Dread Spears on their way out. And Dark Elves maneuvering the Black Guard, which is a smart play. And, oh, big Soul Stealer again. Canaid Assassin a little bit surrounded. Soul Stealer is going to be going down. Pit of Shades as well? No. Oh, that is a Pit of Shades. Oh, oh, that's right. Marathi has Pit of Shades too. Yeah, it's pretty good. Does hit the Minotaur, some of the infantry there. Marathi probably needs to get her hands uh, involved in combat. I suppose waiting for the Black Guard to arrive would be good. The Dark Elves and Low Guard are value trading back though a little bit. You can see the value is within 100 points. And uh, neither side really has access to healing. So it's a pretty accurate representation of the state of the battle as Spears continue to fight Spawn. And this is an excellent play by the forces of the Beastmen. Getting some Harpies up in the sky and shutting down the Raven's Heralds is going to be pretty money. Crows of Cain coming as well. Crows of Cain trying to save the Raven's Heralds. They might be able to be saved. They still have 11 models, so their DPS is not bad. And Crows of Cain will for sure win in combat. Now, can the Dark Elves get their objective back? Good fire from the Repeater Crossbows. Looks like there's going to be a Melkoth going down. And now we got the Black Guard moving on to the objective. And they're mainly fighting against Minotaurs and Chariots. They're things that they're pretty good against. They do have a ton of anti-large, so they're going to be able to cut through these. And the other Minotaurs back here obviously don't want to be fighting these Black Guard as they continue to grind. Tusk or Chariot's getting cut to pieces. Marathi, is she getting involved in combat? Doesn't look like it. Dark Rider's getting caught. Valley trading, pulling up for the Dark Elves a little bit. Crows of Cain, uh, maybe being baited onto the ground to fight some of the spawn. There are some spawn and uh, gores down there, but Dark Riders are also coming out to help. But those spawn certainly tough to remove. Uh, side objective, just being held by Dread Spears. Bleak Swords of Low Guard coming over here. This is a very, very good game. Both these players seem very, very uh, evenly matched in terms of their trading. And old Kazrak the One-Eye getting a little bit beat up. Another Pit of Shades going down by the Beastmen. It's going to be hitting the Black Guard. It does really, really nice damage. But they should be able to weather the storm there and continue to trade well. Now the Dark Elves are in a position where maybe the Beastmen have been overextended for a little bit too long. And the Perpetual Reinforcements could be problematic. k Assassin battling against those Centigors. And more Corsair infantry coming up. Granted, they will get wrecked by Minotaurs and even Kazrak. Kazrak has gotten 900 value. Marathi's going for the kill now, which is smart. Um, 
Even if you surround Wrathy, she lowers melee attack pretty heavily, and she can also use Soul Stealers to heal. Going to be dropping a Soul Stealer here, it would appear. No, Doom and Darkness. Interesting choice. I'm going to try and route these guys. I think it's better just to save your wins for Soul Stealers, but... Nonetheless, it looks like she might be able to get the Bray Shaman of Shadows. And guys, Logard is back on the menu, coming, coming in, trying to end the king. So the Bray Shaman here getting killed as Marathi gets a nice little jump. In the backfield, we see the Centigors finishing off that Canaid Assassin. And more Bleak Swords have arrived. And it looks like the Dark Elves have pulled ahead in a decent amount of value. And honestly, this is looking a little bit dicey for the Beastmen. And this is kind of what happens when you bring Kazrak. Like, he might do okay initially, but he's not, like, doing anything. Whereas Mar Marathi is very impactful. She's gooning things, casting magic. Kazrak's just being terrible. If this were Torox, if this were, like, Morker, it's much harder to remove the Beastmen from this point. But, you know... Still, big props for bringing Kazrak. Deadly Onslaught and Scourge. And on the backfield, Centigors being chased by the Crows of Cain. Crows of Cain, a very good ROR. Regenerating Harpies. They do have the Crow Feast, which is strong, strong healing. It's 0.20, so they can actually stabilize pretty well. Nice bit of shades, though. Really, really good one by the Bray Herd. I believe that's going to be hitting the Corsairs pretty heavily. But those Black Guard, man, they are tough to remove. They've gotten 1,400 value, and they're still beating these guys down right here. These Ungors are getting chopped up. Dark Elves got more infantry coming onto the point, And now... It looks like the Beastmen are switching up their game plan. We have Ungor Herds and Spawn. So the Beastmen are going to be going to the side point, which I think is a good idea. It's like hard for them to keep overextending like this. The side point, uh, I think they've softened up and kind of forced the Dark Elves to send their reinforcements there. So bringing the Ungors in and the Spawn, they might be able to kill those, ble those Dread Spears. But I think Dark Elves can reinforce it quickly with like Dark Riders, which would probably be enough to stabilize it. Dark Elves do own this objective. Marathi's coming in for the kill. Gets on top of Kazrak. What sort of magic is this going to be? Melkoth's probably to slow him down. Keep him from escaping. I think that's what it's going to be. Uh, nope, Doom and Darkness. That's such a weird choice. I really don't like the Doom and Darkness. Um, I doubt Kazrak's going to break here. Maybe. Although he's at five leadership. So maybe maybe he'll make me eat my words. But I feel like you're just going to kill Kazrak anyway. So might as well just you know attack him and use Soul Stealer or something like that. Dude, Marathi's battling though. Can Kazrak the one I carry the game? Okay, I, I was getting hyped for a second. I was like, maybe Kazrak's going to beat Marathi with his other character here. But nope, Marathi gets the duel. She's anti-large. Kazrak's a chariot character um, on his chariot. So he's going to run for the hills. Doom and Darkness breaks him, but he's at negative 30 anyway. So he would have broken without the Doom and Darkness. And the Dark Elves have a strong stranglehold on that objective. Now what it comes down to is the Beastmen overload here. Looks like Dark Rider's going to be charging into the back. Dreadspear is holding on, but Spawn do hit very hard. They're active with 30 leadership. Holding on, uh, dragging down spawn models. The Dark Rider flank might be enough to break the Ungors off. We'll have to see. We got more Beastmen forces heading this way. Dark Elves maintaining a value lead of about 800. Looks like another uh, Pit of Shades going down there. Nice dodge. The Dread Spears move out of the way. What a scrappy game. This has been a really, really good game. And yep, Kazrak's being escorted off the map. And hopefully the, for the Beastmen, he escapes. Because if Marathi kills him, it's going to be a, a penal, uh, an even bigger penalty. Your Lord fleeing is only like 6 leadership penalty. Whereas it's like 10 if your lord dies. So, oh, is Kazrak going to get gooned? Oh, he just barely makes it off. So, if we go look at the, the leadership penalty for the Beastmen now, you can see they're at 21, and now the lord recently fled is negative 16. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. I always thought it was uh, the death and fleeing penalty was different, but I could have sworn. Like, why is it sometimes 10 and sometimes 16? Curious thing. Anyways, I guess it's equally as shameful if your lord abandons you on the battlefield, right? So... I guess I was wrong. Okay. Anyways, back here. Dreadspear is still fighting. Beastmen getting very aggressive on this point, which is what they have to do. But now all their stuff has way less leadership. And the Dark Elves, are they going to move up and try and press the home objective with the Beastmen on Objective 3? It does not look like it. I think Crows of Cain, uh, wow, they actually got beat by the Beastmen Harpies. But it's probably just because they were very tattered at this point. So we get Repeater Crossbows coming over, which will be an excellent tool against the old Chaos Spawn. But these Dreadspears have just been old faithful, man. Like, look at them. The Dread Spears have just been holding on and grinding these units down. The value is only 600 now. It's pretty damn close. I do like the Manticore, but the Manticore might be too late to the party here. Um, I feel like the Manticore is going to probably just get drowned in the spawn and not do its job. If it had come when the Dread Spears were healthy, maybe. But yeah, they're getting they're getting kind of tossed a little bit here. We'll have to see. Dark Riders charging in. That's good buffering for the Manticore. That's going to give terror routes. And we see the Ungors running off the objective. And suddenly the Chaos Spawn stand alone. Dread Spear is getting him. Mance Core doing the play. With the Dark Riders coming in, that changed the paradigm of that analysis there. That is for sure. Repeater Crossbow is trying to take down Harpies. Dark Elves holding on to the objective. They got some uh, Bleak Swords moving up. So Dark Elves going to go for a cap here, which I really like. Although a great response coming in from Sparare. He comes out with Tuscor Chariots, which will do very well against these unsupported infantry pieces. Lord Fled and Lord Fled and Dead is weird now. Yeah, it seems weird, Anticity. I, like, it's, I notice the values are different sometimes. I don't know what the determining factor is. Perhaps it would take a little bit of testing. Hey, that'd be a good video for you to do, man. 
like showing what what's the causation between those things. I'd love to see your, your analysis of that. So Minotaur's great weapons moving up. Trying to get there. They'll be really good against these units. This Manticore is going to get dunked on if it stays in combat. And it's probably going to Rampage soon as well. Manticores do, of course, Rampage. And uh, they get a little bit out of control. Marathi could come in. She's anti-large. It's a little bit dicey. Probably not a good idea. Considering we do have the Centaurs with great weapons piling in. And the Ungor Spearmen have now made it up to the point. So the Beastmen look like they might just take this. Straight up. This is a... Dude, this game is just razor, razor close. This is just a great game. You have the video already? Oh, okay. So he's already done the video. Let's see. So Anticity says, Lord Dead recently is negative 16 for 30 seconds. Uh, Lord Fled is negative 16 for 2 minutes. And Dead is 10. Okay. Anticity with the knowledge. I love it. Uh-oh. Huge pit of shades on the Beastman army. That's a beauty. Probably going to hit the back of those Centigors. Although, is it on point? It's also hitting some of the Ungors. And the Manticore is shattered, so the Terror Route not going to be quite as relevant here in a second. Dreadspear is, of course, very good against most of the Beastman army here. Marathi holding on for dear life. She's just trying her best. Of course, her Enchanting Beauty and the Heart Rend and the Dark Sword, lowering the stats of all these units. And the Dark Elves manage to hold on to the objective, but Marathi could be in danger. The Beastmen see the kill. They're going for it. The Minotaurs are piling in, and the Centigors with Great Opens are around as well. And they get the surround. Marathi is not having a good time. Oh, man. So down she goes, most likely. One last Soul Stealer to roll them all, perhaps. That might save her, but likely not. Marathi's down. So both sides have lost their Lord. That is a major win for Sparare and the Beastmen. A major, major win. The Dark Elves hold on to the objective. And over here, the Dark Elves uh, not quite able to get it. Bleak Sword's getting wrecked. Tuscor Chariots are a great unit. One of the best units on the Beastmen roster, for sure. Very cost-effective, armor-piercing, excellent anti-infantry tool. And they're just giving these spears the business. And, you know, backed up by Ungors, like, supporting against the spears, they should be able to hold on to that point. Now, Raven's Heralds have come back out. Looks like they're going to come try and kill those Tuscor Chariots. The Dark Elves are holding on to the side point. Looking at the current points, the Dark Elves do have a slight point lead right there. But Marathi definitely got hammered. Uh, but I think the Beastmen get this, because they're probably going to route these Dread Spears who only have, you know, five leadership right now. I mean, there's a lot of nasty stuff here. And the Dread Spears, who they hold, they're wavering. You can see the Lord recently having died. It's a pretty substantial penalty on them. And Centaurs throwing axes moving in, and that is going to be the point for the Beastmen. We'll see if the Dark Elves can bring it back. It's 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 going to be hard. They're down by 1,100 value right now, and they still have their Spears fighting. I think the Beastmen might even be able to do a counter push on Objective 1 here for the forces of the Dark Elves. That could certainly happen. And there go the Beastmen. So Ungor have moved up. The objective has been taken. This has been an amazing game between these two players. Very, very evenly matched. Just absolutely back and forth. Absolutely back and forth. But the Beastmen and the Bray Herd have done it. Raven's Heralds shooting in, generating good value against the Minos with Great Opens. I think that's much needed. I also do like the inclusion of the Black Guard. Although Centigore Throwing Axes will really get huge value on them if they're not careful. But the Black Guard are good against most of these units, honestly. If they can get to the point without taking too much damage, get some like Dark Riders or something to intercept these guys. This map actually has capturable Vanguard points as well. So whoever owns Objective 2 actually gets a Vanguard point. I don't know if you guys notice this right here, but you can see they do have, uh, they do have this. And they do have this. So currently, the Beastmen have a new Vanguard point. So the Dark Elves had it before, therefore allowing them to reinforce quickly with Dark Riders and things like that. But right now, it's owned by the Beastmen. Probably more beneficial for them, since most of their roster is Vanguard. And look at the damage those Blackguard have taken by. These Centigore Throwing Axes are so good. Now they're going to be fighting on Gorse, and the Raven's Heralds are just continuing to pick off these Minotaurs and these spawn, generating huge value. But Sparare is getting excellent, excellent work done by uh, taking down these uh, Blackguard with the Throwing Weapons. But we'll see if they get the objective back. In the meantime, Beastmen are pushing up. And this one Tuscor Chariot, dude, has been such a menace. It's generated a 1,000 value against several infantry units and allowed the Beastmen to get up here and, uh, and get the objective, most likely. Dark Riders aren't going to be able to stop this. You know, even basic crappy spears will probably defeat Dark Riders. And here, Dark Rider Peter Crossbow is being hunted by Centigore Throwing Axes, which are actually kind of a good dual-purpose unit. They're pretty good in melee, at least against other skirmish cavalry. And uh, yeah, Beastmen getting a great weapon surround, extra armor piercing against these guys. And now the Minotaurs are coming in, the elite of the Dark Elves being surrounded and beaten down. What a crazy, crazy match between the Bray Herd as well as the Dark Elves. Up at the sky, Raven's Heralds getting popped by Centigore Throwing Axes, an amazing unit who have generated 2,750 value on the Centigore Throwing Weapons. Damn, that's good. Marathi dying was really the turning of the tide. Because Kazrak was gone, Marathi was there, she had magic. Maybe if Marathi had been more conservative and lived, she could have like supported some of these fights and they could have held. But this is probably the end of the rope. I think that Sparare has taken over the game and he will continue on his quest to pass Flying Taco, uh, who is at four wins for today. So ladies and gentlemen, fasten them seatbelts, you're getting more games. 
if the Dark Elves had won, the stream would have been over. But it will now carry on. My wayward sons and daughters here. And uh, there you go. Dark Riders getting in. Attacking the Tuscor Chariots. Triple cap for the Beastmen. Loved this game. It was absolutely amazing. Great play on both sides. Very evenly matched players. Kazrak, of course, being terrible. But the good quality play from Sperare was able to get back in the game here. Always a classic sign that you're kind of running out of steam is when you see mostly Dark Riders on the battlefield, but they're not going to be able to deal with rooted infantry very well. Maybe you're trying to threaten like a bat cap, but not going to be it. GG well played. Outstanding victory. Kazrak won. I clearly the most broken lord in the game as uh, he won the game, clearly, right? Kazrak's, Kazrak might have breached a thousand value. For once, he might have almost paid for himself. Will there be an FFA at the end? I don't know. Maybe. maybe. It's, the stream's going kind of long, so probably not. All right. Yeah, the Heralds are pretty good. Heralds were awesome. They probably got great value. Let's take a look. So Raven's Heralds. Uh, yeah, 1,700. I think they got summoned twice, though. The Shades with Grey Opens getting shut down is brutal. Um, we saw how good the Black Guard were in the Beastman matchup. I think Black Guard could become more meta there, for sure. Kazrak uh, got 1,200 value. So he almost paid for himself. Not quite. And there was even a Giant. Oh, and a Jabber? He had a Giant and a Jabber Slife in reserve, dude. That's crazy. All right, Sperare. He has done it. He is 2-0, and he uh, is pursuing Flying Taco's record. Well played to Logard. Uh, one sec, guys. I'll be right back. All righty. So for the next map, let's see what we want to get. Do we want to do, which one do we have not done today? We've done all, we Graveyard of Altdorf. I don't think we've done that one yet. So let's go ahead and do the Graveyard of Altdorf. It's a very good map. Love this one. It's a little bigger. Has some really fun mobile fights. It's one of my favorite things about this map. Logard, well played. You and Sparare had the Duel of Fates, man. That was some, that was some uh, Anakin, Obi-Wan stuff there. It was a good one. All right, so let's roll the wheel for the old factions. I almost forgot we were doing this. I got so enraptured in that game. So this is for player one. Here it comes. What is it gonna be? This is for player one. Give me the Sons of Sigmar. Oh, the Demons of Chaos. Here comes Bellacor. Demons of Chaos versus... All right, what's it gonna be? The dreaded Demons of Chaos mirror match, huh? The true okay, we had Dark Elves last game, so let's reroll. Let's see what we got. Come on, get in there. What's it gonna be? Oh yes, the Empire versus the Demons of Chaos. All right, so Empire versus Demons of Chaos. So, Sparari's Demons of Chaos, and Pink is gonna be playing the Empire. The Sons of Sigmar are actually really good on this map. War Wagons are the way. Just bring War Wagons. Although against Demons, yeah, I guess they're probably still good. Artillery does struggle a little bit on this map, but you can still bring a Sunmaker to play the side points. Blue Daniel is good for Demons. That makes sense. Yeah, with a huge cost reduction, you get like a cost-effective Zinch Lord. Seems good to me. Yeah, he's not Red Olgor. See, that's the problem. Red Olgor is the true... The true if you're a real Total War player, you're going to bring Red Olgor every time when you get Demons of Chaos. I wonder if we're going to get it. Yes, for the Helden Hammer. Yeah, I'd probably go Wagons here just to kill Bellacor and Demon Princes. Yeah, I probably would. And then uh, there's a lot of choices. You can go Huntsmen. Huntsmen aren't bad. Go arch you can go crossbows, you can go all kinds of stuff, silver bullets. There's there's a ton of ways to play this matchup as the Empire. Heavy cavalry is pretty good here. You gotta watch out for Seekers though. Seekers of Slanesh can uh can outtrade your Empire Cav if you don't get the charges off and stuff, so. Mortars are okay. Not on this map, Mateusz. I think uh I think this map is not a great artillery map, so the Empire's gonna have to play a little differently. But Empires can play so many ways. Empire can play rank and file. You could have like a standard battle line. Spears with shields in the front, flagellants in the secondary, crossbows, gun line in the back with nets, you know, cavalry on the flanks. You can play wagons, mass mobility. You can play artillery defense. Empire's got a lot of ways to play. Oh, Empire's way better than Kislev. Way, way better than Kislev. Oh, yeah. Intensity is correct, though. At the highest competitive level, blue fire is always going to be preferential. 
Because it's just, it's such a broken spell. It's so good. It's like good against everything. Empire is much better than Kislev, yeah. Kislev needs a DLC. when they Because Kislev is going to be really strong when they get a good DLC. Assuming they don't get the Lizardman treatment and get like trash units in their DLC, they'll be very good. They're probably going to get Mother Ostankia, which is the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the Kislev witch that you see in the tooltips. So it'll be like a Baba Yaga type lord, like a witch, which would be really cool. And uh, I don't know what else they would get. Maybe, I don't know what kind of units would come with that with Kislev. That'd be really interesting. Steam tank against demons? Probably not. Cannons aren't that good against demons in general. Unless they, oh, you know what? Demons could go double soul grinder. So maybe having, yeah, but again, this map, the Graveyard of Altdorf is not a good one for that. For future streams, can you turn on live chat replay so the chat is available? It always is, Melonhead. Um, but... The reason why it wasn't available on the eight hour tournament stream is because if the streams are like mega long, it takes YouTube like two or three days to process the uh, to process the chat. So yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be the problem. Probably more bears. <laughs> yeah, Katarine should have an ice chariot. It's so it's that's like her signature. I don't know why they don't. It's probably gonna come with the DLC. Random question: Who's your favorite Primarch? Oh man, I don't know much about the Primarchs. But I play Death Guard, so I'm just going to say Mortarian because he's so... he's. I just... I love the Grim Reaper aesthetic. Like, having this giant, like, angel of death, like, Mortarian with, like, a scythe is so badass to me. That's why I play Death Guard. I saw Mortarian's, like, art, and I was just like, dude, that's, like, the coolest looking thing ever. Like, what Primarch looks cooler than Demon Mortarian? No one. Right? In my opinion. So, um, yeah. So, probably him. Like, I don't know a lot about his character and his lore. I know a little bit, but he just has the coolest aesthetic. Cathay, yeah, Cathay are a good gunline faction. Empire can play gunline, um, for sure. Dwarves, dwarves have like dwarves have a, and coast have really good gunlines too. Deck gunners and hand gunners and bombers is amazing. Dwarves have coilers and thunders, which are very good and durable. It also takes two or three days to process chat. Yeah. Kislev needs big grom. Like, like let me let me show you like, hold on. Uh-huh. I'm trying to... There was, like, some really cool art of Mortarian recently. Let me see if I could find some. Okay. Where are we at? Yeah, that's a cool one. That's really cool. I got my Mortarian model from back in the day. Like, look at look at how cool this is. This is like the, this is one of the first pieces of art I saw and I was like, okay, I'm playing Death Guard. Like, look at, look at how badass this, this, like, he looks. Just this giant, like, Grim Reaper with like, oh, that's so cool. And like, look at these Baroque warriors with just like spikes and like rusted armor, just like these ancient warriors. It's like, the Death Guard aesthetic is just so cool. It's so badass. Ziggy, pierogi for the pierogi god. Yes, thank you for the 20. Sanguinius is cool too, but like, dude, how can you compete with that? He's so cool looking. Just this like angel of, of, of death. It's like, oh, it's like huge Grim Reaper scythe and stuff. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's from the Death Guard Codex, that one, yeah. Yeah, that's from one of the books. Dude, Ziggy, thank you so much for the donation. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, if I play tabletop, oh my God, Imperial... Medley, if you want to play tabletop, Imperial Guard just got updated super hard. Like, they, they, they're they getting a ton of new models. Now would be the entire time. But Imperial Fists are, are really easy to paint now. They, they have a contrast paint for them, which made it really easy. Yeah, but... Uh, Patient says, yeah, but he got slapped by the Emperor Possessed Gilliman. Well, yeah, obviously, the bad guys are going to lose every fight because of plot armor. You know? <laughs> like, they, the bad guys can never truly win because plot armor. And, like, the story needs to continue. If the bad guys achieve their goals, the universe is gone, right? So it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like, so those kind of comparisons. It's more about in tabletop. Like, if you want to measure the strength of the characters in lore, you I say look at their strength on tabletop. Like, in tabletop, Mortarian kicks Gilliman's butt, like, every day of the week. Like, Mortarian will smash Gilliman. And even in lore, like, in the books, Mortarian would definitely destroy Gilliman in combat if it weren't for the em him getting, like, the magical plot armor possession from the Emperor. Yeah, so it's like... How much did your army cost? I don't know off the top of my head. 
probably over the years, my Death Guard army, let's see, I don't know. I bought ev almost everything secondhand. Um, so used models, I would strip the paint and repaint them just to save money. Uh, so probably, I don't know, like five, $600 for my whole army. Uh, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, but that's like, I never have to spend it again, so. So let's look at the stats so far for the season. Hey, you guys want to see some fun stats? Look, Warriors of Chaos still dominating. Guys, so these are the stats for this season. Check it out. Warriors of Chaos is bullshit still. 9-0. So continue to global ban those guys. If you don't global ban Warriors of Chaos, then you're doing something wrong, dude. Like, you got to global ban them unless you just want to play them in sweat. Um, Ogre Kingdoms are 10-3, and three, guys. Ogre Kingdoms are 10-3. and three. Look at that. Who have they? I actually, I beat Ogre Kingdoms yesterday with Bretonia. I, I gave them one of their losses. But um, yeah, how hard is it to strip paint? It's a little bit tedious. You usually put the models in uh, some sort of a solution. You let them sit for a while and then you, uh, a couple days or whatever, and then you get a toothbrush and just scrub them down and then you reprime it and it looks brand new. Yeah. How many points do you have in your army? I have about 4,000 points worth of Death Guard. Yeah. So yeah. Dude, ogres are 10 and three. Look at this. Vampire Coast doing well, Dark Elves good, High Elves, Grand Cathay, pretty standard. Yeah, honestly, a lot of cool stuff. Norska. And the stats are going to be better this time because a lot of people have know how to play the factions now. Empire in the pits, probably. Yeah, look, Empire is 4 and 8. I, I have to start playing in some tournaments to bring Sigmar back to their former glory. Vampire counts 2 and 3 because they don't have healing, obviously. So that'll, that'll change when they get their healing. Corn is 8 and 11, which is weird. Yeah, that's a actually corn is like a forty to fifty percent win rate faction. In the pits, we have the Empire Skaven, which is weird. Uh, Kislev makes sense, and uh, Chaos Demons, obviously. Yeah. Did the game start yet? Are they still building their armies? All right, all right, guys, it's time. We've been waiting. Pink and Sparare, you got to get those armies going. It's been like it's been like fifteen twenty minutes. Let's get this going. You want to talk about forty k plot armor? Gaz got. Taken out by Ragnar Blackmane and and put and put it back on because of wall energy. Oh my god, jeez. <laughs> well, Chaos Demons only have two games. Yeah, they only have two games. There's not too much to think of Demons of Chaos. I'm curious what he's going to bring. Yeah, I do not think Hyles got buffed too hard. I think they're fine. I think Hyles still have plenty of ways to counter them. Yeah, I think they're fine. Hyles needed that. And trust me, once the meta settles down, High Elves will probably be like a 55 to 60% win rate faction, which is fine. As long as they're in that ballpark, it's good. They deserve it, though. I agree. They, the High Elves have been terrible for like five years. High Elves have just been mediocre for five years. They, they deserve to be good for like another... I think High Elves deserve to be a good faction for the rest of Total War Warhammer. <laughs> like straight up. Yeah, Slanesh gets banned nonstop, so you're not going to see them because they're just bullshit. Slanesh is just horseshit. They need to be nerfed, like, so hard. Fulgrim and Magnus are amazing, too. Yeah, they're cool characters. They're, they're fun characters, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, I've read a couple 40k books, but not too many. Let me see if Sparare is trying to hit me up. Is he saying trying to reroll or something? Uh, nope, doesn't look like it. Okay, there we go. It's showtime. It's time. We also need to keep in mind that Unhead Factions are missing a lot. Exactly. So the thing about undead factions is, is when you get, when you get the uh, the healing back, and we we'll start we'll do single faction tournaments with the undead in the game, and once they get healing, and you'll see their win rate skyrocket. Like vampire counts will go back to sixty something percent. Nothing changed with them. Undead are missing their tools. Anticity is one hundred percent correct. So like when they get their healing back, which hopefully will be soon, their their stats are going to skyrocket. Yeah, and seasons go for a while, so there's plenty of time for the stats to kind of buffer and everything. All right, guys. So this game is, let me update the uh, nameplate. Very good. It's Carl Franz Wagon's Regrowth. I like, that. it's a classic combo, it's good. Franz does magic damage with the uh, Galmaraz. So he's he's pretty good at dealing with, you know, demon characters. Although, you know, also, yeah, good. He can kill soul grinders also. I, I, like, for, I like the Franz pick, I don't hate it. So this is the graveyard of Altorf. So Franz is coming to kind of defend uh, Altorf's uh, sacred dead here. Wagons are obviously very good. We had a classic state trooper core. 
And Grand Vomitus, which is the Nurgle Demon Prince. I believe he has access to just Lord, Lord Nurgle? I don't know. Yeah, because he's not like the regular Nurgle Demon Prince that you see on the Nurgle roster. I'm really eager to see like the exploration of uh, Nurgle with the new cost reduced Demon Prince. I feel like he could be good. Did we see a Blood Shrine there? If we did, that could be pretty grim. Corn Bikes. Corn Bikes are underrated, but I don't think they're very good against Empire. I feel like Wagons just kill them. So we'll have to see what's going on. Hopefully there's not going to be any lag. Looks like one player is loading in rather slowly. So hopefully it's just a potato PC and it ain't the end of the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, sounds good. Perfect. Looks outstanding. Green Olgor. It's kind of green Olgor. Nothing beats red Olgor though. He's... How would Red Olgor be against Empire? Let's think about it. Probably vulnerable to wagons. It would force you to spend money on a second caster against Empire, which probably isn't good. Uh, Carl Franz will probably kick his butt too. Or at least trade well evenly into him and then regrowth comes. Red Olgor does have healing though. He's got the uh, he's got the gore feast. So he can heal. Lore of Nurgle is huge. Now there's no need for squishy Festus. I agree, Anticity. Yeah, Festus is good still, but or decent. But he's so squishy. Yeah, Festus has low armor. He's very vulnerable. I, I, Festus was just bullshit broken before. But um, yeah, I think Festus is like a properly balanced character. He's got glaring weaknesses, but if he's left unaddressed, he just has constant AoE healing, constant AoE mortis. Like, it's very good. All right, looks like we're fine. Hopefully it's not laggy. If it is, we might have to just jump out and get someone else in. Because we know it's not um, Sprare, because we played a couple games with, uh, with them, so... It could just be a slow potato computer, but um, Sprari's loading in fine. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems like there's a little bit of lag. I don't know where this uh, individual is connecting from. It's a shame. I really want to see this, but... Okay, looks like it's just loading pains. I think it's just loading pains. So, Franz, magic damage, Galmaraz. What's not to love? We got a lot of state troopers. Spearmen with shields, which I think are a good choice. Even though you don't need a ton of shields against demons, they still have blue. They still have blues, and they also have pinks. And uh, the shields give you 42 melee defense, which lets you hold. Wagons, Earthblood, and Dwellers to kill high-value pieces, and Carl Franz. Now, looking at Green Olgor, it's going to be your boy, Grand Vomitus, the Prince of Bubos. Blightboil against Empire, not a big fan of that. Um, but I do like the Fleshy Abundance and Stream of Corruption. I think those are good spells. We've got Plague Bearers, as well as uh, Flamers in the back. Flamers uh, get wrecked by wagons, because they only have 90 range. So a little bit precarious, Nurglings, as well as the motorcycles moving up, the Blood Shrine. But again, if we have this uh, perpetual lag, we're going to probably just have to jump out because this is a big map and we'll be here for like a good 30 minutes um, if the lag continues. So we'll see. Yeah, it, it's so tricky. Like peer to peer is so weird. Like sometimes it's fine with like, we, like uh, you know, you could be connecting with someone from like the furthest reaches of the world and it's fine. And then you connect with someone in like New Jersey and suddenly it's like just random. Like I, I just, I wish... I wish we could get servers. It's it, that's a big power fantasy. I don't think it'll ever happen, but um, it is something I, I I I dream about at night. I lay in bed and I'm like, oh, dedicated servers and total war competitive. Oh, give it to me. That would be great. Anyways, we'll see how this goes. We'll give it a chance here for a minute. Just fit, sit Festus in the middle. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's where he shines. Now the Nurgle Demon Prince is an anti-infantry character. He has, actually has very low weapon strength. It's only 370, which is like, the, the Nurgle roster Demon Prince is way better. This guy, uh, you know, not going to be amazing here. Franz will just absolutely smash this character. <laughs> Darn you, Nurgle. Well, like, I play with Hadri's a lot, and he, he lives in Jersey, I think, like, out in that part of the world. And, um, and you know, we have, we just sometimes lag. It's weird. And, like, we both have good internet. Then you play with, like, it's just so weird. And then I'll play with players in, like, the furthest reaches of Europe. And, you know, in the East and, uh, and like, you know, I, I played with, like, players from China and I, I don't have connection issues with them. It's so random. It's so random. Like, what's causing this? I guess it's just, like, the peer-to-peer, -peer, like, data being shared and things like that. <laughs> Melonhead, yes, probably. So, moving up, we got War Wagons coming their way. State Troopers are moving. And uh, the Demons shall be moving out with the dreaded Blood Shrines. Ferrari coming out. Wagons just immediately get a punish. So wagons have, I don't know if this is the exact number, but wagons have about half the DPS of a handgunner unit. Like if they're just kind of sitting and shooting, but just like way more durability and staying power and mobility. Handgunners thump pretty hard, but they're so vulnerable. 
like one fury, one stream of corruption in like a hound unit, that unit's gone. Whereas good luck shutting down war wagons. I personally think if you took war wagons away from the empire or heavily nerfed them, I feel like their win rate would be even worse. They're like kind of the glue that holds together competitive empire in my opinion. Without them, you really, really pay the troll toll. So shooting down into the demons, seekers are coming out to rush them and you know, just kind of auto shooting into some of the beasts of Nurgle here, not gonna be great. Seekers, of course, gonna have to get through the spears and state troopers. State troopers at the ready, general. So they're gonna be fighting here. And Franz is looking for that brawl. He's looking to move. So here he comes, attacking into Grand Vomitus. And despite a little bit of lag, still kind of tolerable. We've endured worse. So I think we can stay in this game and we'll see what happens. Galmaraz active. Franz getting cooked though by those, those uh, Flamers of Zeech. Yeah, he's gonna wanna peace out. That's not good. He pops all of his things and just goes for the duel. We also get Screamers coming for him. So this is very ballsy play. And the Jade Wizard, I don't think is nearby, but Franz is still getting an okay trade, but I think he's gonna wanna run. I mean, if the Empire loses Franz, it's probably just game over, right? Like he's he's the Prince and Emperor and he's expensive and there's no reason to lose him here. You have, you have a lot of good positions. Now you can see the Haggard Blood Shrine is getting wrecked. Like that's like such an ideal target for wagons. State Troopers fighting in melee versus the Beasts of Nurgle. Flamers of Zeech doing quite a bit of damage. And we do see the Seekers getting a fleshy abundance on Slanesh Cav is, is pretty cheeky for sure. So there it goes. Seekers on their way across. Beasts of Nurgle being focused by the wagons. And we see our boy Carl Franz running. running. Name a more iconic combo as the meme goes in Franz and Regrowth. They have been best friends since Warhammer 1 and they will continue to be so for a long time. Franz is like that protagonist and, you know, whatever you're into where, you know, he loses, he gets his butt kicked, he gets regrowth, he comes back in the fourth quarter of, the, of every single action movie and gets the victory. That's basically Franz in a nutshell. And that's Franz in lore also. There's so many stories in the lore of like Franz, like fighting an epic battle, losing, but then like the spirit of Sigmar possesses him or he rallies his men and comes back. It's basically just how he is. It's his persona. So Screamer's going after wagons. We have some Empire Knights coming out to intercept these guys. France has landed on the ground, and there's going to be... Is that a Blight Boil? Oh my god. That's actually going to do a shit ton of damage. And as far as the value trading goes, Pink's a little bit up, but remember there's healing. Are we going to see Blight Boil actually do something? Holy shit, look at that. It's going to hit the Swordsman and Spearman. Yeah, they're going to get wrecked. Imagine seeing that pop up next to you. That's horrible. Oh, that Blight Boil was so good. Damn, that was nice. And a Dwellers Below attempt coming out, but it looks like Sparare is going to be able to dodge that, and it was canceled. So now the Empire is being pushed back. Empire Knight's able to intercept those Slaneshi Cav. And Grand Vomitus is a little bit overextended. Franz looking for vengeance. Yeah, Franz is Goku, yes. But Grand Vomitus does actually route the Jade Wizard in the forest here. But Carl Franz has got Galmaraz. He's going at it with the mighty Demon Prince of Nurgle. Now this is Warhammer. This is what we're talking about. This is badass. Franz getting in there. Grand Vomitus definitely going to be on the losing end of this trade, most likely. With his low weapons rank. Seekers of Slanesh chasing the wagons very effectively, though. And Curse of the Slug. So the Demons of Chaos got a very ideal ability to lock down the wagons, but Empire can spawn some Empire Knights most likely. Uh, the Empire players floating 1,500 resources definitely want to get something here. Yep, get some Reichsguard Knights and kill the Seekers of Slanesh. Seekers of Slanesh going to be coming out for pink. They get a big charge in there and are going to be hammering those down. Franz in the meantime, continuing to be his uh, movie protagonist as he continues to battle Grand Vomitus, forcing him back. Galmaraz doing its business as the Flamers of Zinch try and support. Side objectives, let's go and take a look at the objectives. Uh, this is owned by the Empire. Two free company militia should be able to fight off these Seekers, maybe? If they spread out and then shoot and cover. The other side is owned by the Empire. We have some Flagellants and Spearmen. Middle objective owned by the Demons, but Franz is on the hunt, he's pissed. Deathclaw is a really good boy. Like Deathclaw is the best boy. There's a, there's a story about Carl Franz and Lore where I can't remember what he's fighting. It's either the Greenskins or Vampire Counts. And you know, Carl, Fran Carl Franz gets like horribly wounded gets his like knocked off death claw and he's like Carl Franz is basically like mortally wounded on the ground like he's laying there like you know if anybody gets to him he's straight up dead right and then the rest of the empire forces near a Carl Franz like route you know and or, like retreat a little bit and then death claw is like fully surrounded by greenskins or something and uh he def he like defends Carl Franz for like like two or three hours until the empire can fight their way back to the emperor it's like on this like hilltop and like death claws just like protecting the emperor as he's laying on the ground it's like so cool. Um, but yeah, you know, because Carl Franz is only a man. He's not like, you know, some immortal demigod like Sigmar, you know, and uh, yeah, so he, he's, 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 he's got limitations, but it's just cool showing like the bond between Deathclaw and, and Carl. But Franz going in. Grand Vomich is definitely getting smashed up. The Empire is pulling heavily ahead in value. Those war wagons basically kiting back against all the demons of chaos stuff. 
Grand Vomitus is in trouble. And the Sons of Sigmar, just like in the lore, they ride to their emperor. So the Zentler's Reichsguard, which are Franz's kind of specialty, Reichsguard and Greatswords, they move out and they just hammer down these demons. Absolutely hammer down these demons. You can see 2700 there. The Empire wins. Sigmar has won this day. Sorry about the lag in the last game, but it still was an enjoyable game. And the Empire had the side objectives. Vomitus was dying to Franz. That's a pretty competitive Empire build. That was actually very good. So clearly a strong player. I, I like the build. Yeah, this is a good build. The only thing I'm, I don't love is Demogriff Knights. Uh, silver Bullets, I think, is fine. Grenades, like, yeah. Aside, the build was good outside of the Demis, in my opinion. But um, the Demon build had too many, like, weak units. Um, I think the the Corn motorcycle sucks here. The Flamers aren't that good. Um, Beast of Nurgle is actually pretty terrible against the Empire. Grand Vomitus is bad. But still, Sperari made a good game of it, but brought a lot of inefficient units against the Sigmarites. All right. So with that, the, the winner of today's King of the Hill is going to be Flying Taco. He won four games, which was the most. And uh, yeah, that's going to be it. So shout out to Flying Taco for the victory. Thank you to, uh, to Pink. I think Flag was why he surrendered. Well, there was a 4,000 value differential as well. And Franz was healed. It was The game was over. The Empire was going to win. So GG well played to Sperare as well as Pink there. Carl Franz coming in with the steel chair. Sorry, British internet. Oh, that, that was you, HP? Yeah, sorry, sorry. No worries, it's okay. You know, it's not your fault. We know for next time, though. We know for next time. So before you join next time, try and square away your internet or let someone else play just so we don't have to have the lag and whatnot. GG, well played. Appreciate you all. Let me go hang out with the smoking hot wife. And uh, yeah, that's it. We'll do more King of the Hill soon. Yeah, it's a really fun format. And thank you guys. We got three new channel members. You guys are the best. Got some donations. Thank you guys for helping support the channel. And uh, if you guys enjoyed the stream, you could support by dropping a like. It helps out quite a bit. And uh, that's it. You guys take care of yourselves. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to rest. It's been a long one. And I'm going to go hang out with the lady. But until next time. Yeah. Fun time's coming. The maps, Your maps will be ready for next time, Medley. Don't worry. We'll get them going. I might have a single faction tournament in the next few days where I actually play. I'll play I'll play like Empire or something and bring bring friends to the, to the people. Yeah. I think it'll be fun. GG well played. See you guys. Take care. Adios, do vidzenya, dobra notes, and uh, sayonara, oya suminasai. Uh, what other languages do I know? Not too many, honestly. That's 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 the jam. All right, see you guys. Take care.